Dear guests, dear dean, dear professors, dear colleagues, it is an honor and my great pleasure to kindly welcome you to the second Medical Student Journal Club Project Contra on behalf of the whole organizing committee. Before starting with the real talk, I have to thank the ones who made all of this possible, our sponsors, the MSD, the medical faculty, the University of Ljubljana, the students' organization, and all the others. Thank you. When I was wondering what to say in this opening speech, I was thinking about what this Congress really means to me. And I realized it is all about a concept. So to explain this concept, let me begin with a book. I believe that a lot of people here in this room today are quite familiar with that book. I am talking about the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. At a certain point in the book, the author compares the doctor to a gambler. He states that when the doctor has to identify a patient's disease, he bets on the pathology that suits best the patient's signs and symptoms. But since it is a gamble, in certain cases, he loses his bet. And sometimes, unfortunately, there is no time for another bet. Now the question is, how can we prevent that? How can we minimize the number of those lost bets? As I see it, one of the best ways is to improve our knowledge. There are many ways to do it. There are books, lectures, rotations, but they are not enough. Usually they don't teach us that in medicine, in, certain, in many cases, there is not just one ideal way to have things done but there are a lot of different pathways, different diagnostic procedures, different therapeutic options that can lead to the same goal, the patient's well-being. This is why this Congress was conceived, to help us medical students to become one day better doctors, more conscious, more passionate, and the most important thing, open to discussion and prepared to share our knowledge with our colleagues. Because as the Nobel Prize for Literature, George Bernard Shaw said, if you have an apple, you have an apple, do you have an apple? You have an apple, and I have an apple, and we exchange these apples, then you and I will still each have one apple. But if you have an idea, and I have an idea, and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. I think that one of the best ways to expand our knowledge is to share it. And I believe we should start doing this as soon as possible in our careers. Why would that be? Let me answer this question with a final quote. About 700 years ago, Dante Alighieri wrote, you were not formed to live the life of brutes, but to pursue virtue and knowledge. So dear guests, dear dean, dear professors, dear colleagues, let the pursuit of knowledge begin. Thank you. Now I would like to invite our dean, Professor Shuput. Well, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests, uh, for me it's a big honor to have such students. Uh, you know, yesterday there was a big picnic of the medical faculty. Uh, maybe some people have even came just from the picnic to this meeting. And uh, we had a big band playing, which is very unique. And I thought about all the richness of all the activities that our students are pursuing. And I'm especially proud of this event. It brings people from many countries and it talks about one very important thing. Um, gambling is maybe correct, but uh, we should ask ourselves, why do we have to gamble? 
know, to exchange knowledge, and if we believe in knowledge, then we should not gamble. We should just know what's the right thing to do. Uh, but uh, that's extremely difficult, and the way how we study, uh, how we teach, is in many ways better than it has been before. But in some ways, it's also much worse. When I was a student, we had to do practical courses on animals. We did experiments on animals, which is now forbidden. And each group had different results, because life is very rich, too. And you don't get the same reaction every time. Now we have simulators, we have <coughs> computer games, I should say, and you always get the same result. You know what you put in, and then something comes out. And then you learn all the diversity only when you get to the patients, because they are ne never the same. Sometimes it's very clear, but even if we, if we talk about very simple things like appendicitis. I'll tell you one story of uh, a girlfriend of my young researcher. She came to surgery, very simple, it was elective and surgery and uh, everything went fine. But her signs were worse and she had no sign of any disease. Only when her belly became a bit stiff, they started to think about appendicitis. There was no increased temperature, no pain, because had, she had painkillers. So even a simple case can become very complicated. Of course, things like that can be solved too. And uh, now I'll tell something that usually I tell at graduation ceremony about a dean at uh, Harvard Medical Faculty about 50 years ago. He gave a speech and he said, well, you know, we taught you a lot, but half of what we taught you is wrong. Do you think that our faculty is better? Well, he continued, you know, he said, it's not a big problem. The problem is that we don't know which part is wrong. And that's about science and development of medicine. Uh, now we have to ask, why do we study if half of the things are wrong? And I think that the main thing that each faculty should give to the students is to be able to be critical about knowledge, to be able to acquire knowledge all the time, and also to teach what is certainly true, what has been proven for a long time, that is the fact. But a meeting like this is really, really very important because everything has pros and contras. And it's true, sometimes it's gambling, but uh, exchange of knowledge and ideas uh, reduces, reduces this gambling to a very tiny part. Uh, I wish you a very successful meeting, a lot of exchange of ideas, and of course to have a nice stay in Ljubljana. The weather is beautiful, the city is beautiful too, and I'm sure that you'll enjoy your visit. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Urban English for his invited lecture. Um, hi, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Urban and um, much like all of you up to a few weeks ago, I was also a med student. Um, but today I'm here to talk about something to start us off with something much more relaxed than medicine and that is alpinism. Um, can I get the first slide, please? Okay, anyway. Um, I remember um, when I was a kid, I liked to read books about great adventures, be it mountain climbers or, or travelers to exotic countries or um, travelers to exotic countries um, or uh, courageous sailors in faraway corners of the ocean. 
Um, it didn't matter. I was hooked. Uh, it sort of represented an escape from everyday life, from reality. I remember thinking, damn, it would be so nice to be one of those guys when I grow up. But of course, that's impossible. For us normal people, that doesn't happen. We don't, go to, we don't, get, to, we don't get the opportunity to go on expeditions. We don't, we don't show tough, we don't act tough on television and in books. It's just, it's a no. Life doesn't work that way. Um, but I was wrong. In 2012, I joined a mountaineering expedition to remote and poorly charted regions of Alaskan mountains. Uh, it all started a couple of years ago when I joined an alpinism course. You see, my father was an alpinist, so we used to hike and visit mountains ever since I can remember, but not exactly climbing mountains. That came when I joined a local alpinist society and um, at first, just as a mean of getting some experiences, though I must say we soon became really good friends. And when they decided to organize an expedition, to my big surprise, they invited me along. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even believe it at first. When I got the call from the leader of the expedition inviting me along, I, thought it was, I honestly thought it was a mistake. Um, when he called me and said, hey, do you want to join? My initial reaction, surprisingly, was not, yeah, where do I sign? This is what I always wanted, right? Um, instead, I replied, is, um, sure, you dialed the right number? I mean, am I the person you wanted to talk to? But in the end, he didn't need much convincing to do. Um, it was 10 of us on the team, and five of them, five of us, com including myself, were complete newbies. No experience whatsoever, if I'm being honest. Um, and that was kind of an excuse for me. I said to myself, they don't know exactly what they're doing. I sure as hell don't know what I'm doing. So either we all make it or we just all fail. Luckily, the other half, the remaining five, were experienced mountain climbers and skiers, and they helped us greatly with suggestions about equipment and logistics. I cannot emphasize how important that is in a project like this. Because when we were um, following the weather forecast for that region, um, months before departure, on a cold night, it got down to minus 40. And um, that's chilly. That is cold. That is not something you survive in a sleeping bag you used to camp with when you were a Boy Scout. You need proper equipment. Um, and so we went. And um, I remember, all I remember about the transatlantic flight was just, we were so tired, we were getting on and off airplanes, sleeping at the airports in the middle of the day, and eventually managed to drag our asses um, to Alaska. What I do clearly remember, and probably for, will for the rest of my days, is the little red airplane that took us onto the glacier. A uh, glacier nobody has ever set foot on. Um, it sounds pretty cool, you must admit, but it was, uh, it was really difficult and really hard to organize and to achieve. So we hired supposedly the best pilot there is in Alaska, and um, just I remember we just showed him with a finger on the map, we just gave him coordinates and said, look, dude, this is where we want to go, this is where you should take us, right? And um, the guy was looking at the map for a couple of minutes, and then in, in his accent he just said, the Revelation Mountains, you sure guys, you sure you want to go there? We said, yeah, this is what we came for, this is our destination, this is where you should take us. He said, well, I guess, as long as you're paying, you just throw your stuff in. And so we did, it was a ton of, of gear we put into the airplane, and he then flew us across some 200 kilometers of pure white virgin landscape. And we landed on the glacier. The mental picture I certainly will remember for the rest of my days, till the day I die, is the moment he left us alone on that glacier. Uh, all the stupid jokes we were making before about how if the pilot does not return in a month, we just have to draw straws and to see who, whoever pulls the shortest, that's the person we're going to eat first. Um, that's funny now, and that was funny before, but at that moment, that was not funny. When we were looking the airplane going across the mountains, flying, um, flying back, there was a strange vibe in the air. Um, complete silence, apart from the propellers, complete silence. 
uh, probably everybody in his head was, probably we were all screaming, fuck, how did I get myself into this? But it was complete silence for a couple of minutes, and then we got a hold of ourselves, and somebody was screaming, okay, guys, there's work to do, come on, oh, come on. And then we started digging, because we had to dig, we had to dig holes for the tent and trenches for equipment, and um, because the sun was setting behind the ridge, and when the sun does go down in Alaska, it, the temperature drops rapidly. It gets freezing cold in a matter of minutes. Um, and then the digging continued the following day. We had to dig a hole for the toilet, and then we soon realized that we we're pretty active in that um, particular area. So we had to dig another, this time a bigger hole for the toilet. And um, caves, snow caves for food storage, so that the polar bears would not smell the meat. Uh, yeah, we were warned by the Alaskan rangers that uh, polar bears sometimes do wander so, up, so far up the glacier. And uh, believe me, the, least, the last thing you want to have is to have a half a ton creature just step on you and, and crush you to your death when you're already packed in your, in your sleeping bag. Um, you see, polar bears, they're all nice and warm and cuddly on television. Not so much so if you encounter a hungry mama bear after a long winter. So luckily, that did not happen. And um, besides, we were joking before that uh, should a bear really appear on the horizon, it will probably send Valentina, our only female member of the team, first. And that would just give us, the guys, the precious time to just get the hell out of there and save our asses. Um, the time has then come to uh, do things we come there to do, and that is alpinism. Um, the first excursions, the first excursions uh, around base camp gave us the impression we're in paradise, because five meters of fresh snow and pure virgin white landscape nobody has ever walked, skied, or climbed on is how I imagine paradise to look like. Apart from the naked girls and alcohol and everything, but that goes without saying. And um, what's more, the Alaskan Geographical Institute assured us that there were around 30 mountains in our area that have never been climbed. And I think I speak on behalf of the whole group when I say it's the virgin mountaintops where we came for. All in all, we managed to set 12 new climbing routes, uh, do 17 alpinist skiing descents, and perform a couple of speed flying flights. And what's more, conquered 11 new peaks that have not been conquered up to that moment. On four of those, I climbed myself, and together with a climbing mate of mine, managed to be the first ever to step on two of them. Which was kind of my secret personal victory, I can now admit. Um, month before departure, when we were filling the applications for a possible helicopter rescue, because that is the moment when you know, okay, things just got serious, this is it, we're going, guys. Um, I set two goals for myself. Number one, I said I, I must not regret the time, energy, or money I've invested in this project, so we have to really make it a memorable adventure. And secondly, I ought to really try and do my best to conquer a mountain as a first climber so I get to name it. Not, not after myself, not to boost my ego, no, I, I was being smart about it. But to name it after a girl, and then when I come back, there is no way she would not fall for such a heroic act. And um, you have to ask all the members of the team, but as far as I'm concerned, our expedition was a great success. Um, and when I look back on my Alaskan story now, um, I can't help myself from being amazed. Uh, amazed about everything, to be honest. Amazed how we all worked as a tight group and really got that one for all, all for one philosophy nailed to the very last bit and amazed how it all went smooth, how nobody got hurt. Because I was the only medic, so to speak, on the team, and that was by far my biggest fear, somebody getting hurt. But um, all in all, one paper cut. 
One paper cut from reading a book in a tent and a few blisters is all that happened to a group of 10 people spending a month in a godforsaken frozen place at the end of the world hanging off cliffs for 10 hours a day. I still cannot believe it. It's just luck. And apart from that, I was amazed that something that just a few years ago for me has seemed nearly impossible was now so achievable and so real. If some, not, not, because, not because I would be such a great, I would become such a great alpinist in that time. No, I'm pretty sure if you ask my, my, my friends, I'm pretty sure I'm not even a good one. But I enjoy it. And if you enjoy something, you just, eventually it pays off. And um, if somebody had told me a couple of years ago that I would be one of the guys to film a documentary that was later to be screened at various international film festivals, I would, say, I would not have believed it. Um, I do believe it now, because our film, Aurora Polaris, was extremely well accepted in uh, theaters, and um, what amazed me the most, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that because the dean is here, but I'm, I graduated, so it doesn't matter. Um, I didn't have to pay the delay penalties at our, uni uh, our university library, because one of the librarians working there saw the film and she was so impressed. Saved me four euros and 65 cents. Um, well, jokes aside, if, uh, I am to finish uh, this with a message, as I was asked. Um, it should be that if you really want something, something that may seem out of your reach, that should never keep you from trying. Um, if you try, eventually you will succeed. It always turns out so. You, eventually you do succeed. Um, I might have talked about climbing and mountains and skiing and stuff, but underneath what I wanted to say uh, was that if you really want something and you do your absolute best, there is nothing you cannot achieve. You can achieve anything you desire. In my case, I learned that um, even a med student trying to be an alpinist can go on an epic adventure and have the opportunity of a lifetime to be on this really amazing place and get to witness one of the or the most beautiful natural phenomenon there are. Oh no, no, the uh, Northern Lights, this one, the, the Aurora. Okay, thanks. A really excellent introduction. I must say, teamwork also stands uh, if you want to achieve great results in medicine. And as you see on the picture uh, before we go, go live to, to Rostock, uh, maybe just a few words uh, what we're going to see. Maybe not uh, all of you are familiar with the procedure we're, we're going to see live. Uh, we asked Dr. Mrevlie, who is a Slovene cardiologist working now in Rostock, Germany, to present transcatheter aortic valve replacement. As you probably all know, our population is getting older and older, and of course, aortic stenosis is a disease of quite a lot uh, present in, in, in elderly population. Uh, so, of course, we expect to treat more and more people with aortic stenosis. And the classical treatment was, of course, open heart surgery that included opening the chest and of course it's not just aortic stenosis that is usually present in this population you know that COPD is present in elderly people and other diseases so open chest surgery is sometimes too risky in very old people so that's why we now start with 
your treatment with less invasive surgery or even less invasive procedure that you're going to see today, that's transcatheter aortic valve insertion. In this particular lady that you're going to see, they couldn't do it percutaneously via femoral artery, what we tend to do because it's the most minimal invasive procedure. But sometimes if the arteries are too narrow, then we have to go for the transapical approach to insert the aortic valve. And this is what you're going to see. Blush, can we hear you now? Yes, we are uh, Can we maybe connected. go live? Can you hear us? Blush, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Do you hear us, Peter? We have a minute for a technical. <clears throat> Hello? Do we have a connection? During the transmission, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. We'll give you the microphone. We can ask the, the doctor doing the procedure to comment on the case and the procedure he's doing. Peter? Peter, Blush, can you hear now? Can you hear us? So Has any of you witnessed live how this procedure looks like? Okay. Usually it's a procedure that lasts maybe about an hour. Of course, if it's a transapical approach, it's still minimally invasive procedure. That's why the patient has to be uh, uh, sedated and intubated, so you, you need anesthesia. The position of the aortic valve uh, for, the, for the right placement, you need to transesophageal uh, echocardiography, and you can see that the, old, that the whole process is done in, in the uh, catheterization laboratory. You can see the x-ray machine there. Everything, of course, has to be really sterile because it's an artificial material you're, you're putting in. Usually the leaflets are made of biological tissue above Hello? valve uh, with a wired cage that is, that is balloon expandable. Uh, you have actually two types of valves. One, are, one you have to expand with a balloon and the other type is so-called self-expandable valve. When you insert the valve and you just release the trigger, it expands by itself. Can you hear us now? Peter? It looks like we still have some technical problems. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we should give some more time to technicians to solve the audio problem and maybe we should invite the, the next session uh, and the, the two speakers are also going to talk about aortic disease. Uh, yes, I think that we will do it. So uh, the session is still the same, intervention of radiology and cardiology, but maybe we should start with the presentation first and then uh, go to, to Rostock. So I would like to invite Jon Vratanar and no, no, yes. Tomasz Tokarek for the presentation is open, is open surgery for ultra dead. So please. Yeah, we can do it. Of course, 
okay, since it seems that it works, maybe we should change the, <laughs> the stuff one, one more time. Let's, let's go with the live case transmission. Uh, catheterization laboratory, you can see the echocardiography in there, and you can see that there has to be real process done in the artificial material catheterization laboratory. You can see the x ray machine there, and the neurological tissue has to be really sterile because it's valid official material. It looks like technicians are sweating now. Can you hear it now? It looks like we still have some technical problems. Can you hear it now? It looks like we still have some technical problems. Okay, uh, it seems that they have some issues still, so... What? Maybe, maybe we should give some more time to technicians to solve the audio problem. Blash, can we hear you now? Hello, we are live now in Ljubljana. Can we hear you now? Blash, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay, we are live now. Can you maybe, I, I just uh, did an introduction, can, can you maybe tell us a few things what you're going to do and in, uh, of course the, to introduce all the uh, all members of the team and the patient. Okay, so um, greetings to Ljubljana, greetings to Slovenia from the University Medical Center Rostock, Germany. Um, I hope you have on screen our operating room now, which is actually the, the cat lab of the cardiology department. And I would just like to uh, briefly introduce the team doing this study procedure. We have a cardiac surgeon and head consultant, Dr. Kaminski, and then cardiac surgeon, Dr. Weiss, interventional cardiologist and head consultant, Dr. Reders, anesthesiology is being done by Dr. Fletchin and, and assistant Jan. Then we have two surgical nurses, Gabi and Rika, and interventional nurses, Kami and Tarin. And now I would like to um, give the word to Dr. Tim Reders, who will do the procedure uh, on the interventional side, and he will guide you through the procedure, and he will discuss with uh, Dr. Rachel about the study procedure. So please, Tim. Okay, good morning, uh, Liliana. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, the, um, the connections are well, we can hear first you. First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, giving us the chance to participate in your session uh, this morning. Um, today we are treating a 84-year-old um, lady um, who is suffering from a severe aortic stenosis, of course. Um, in addition, uh, she has a severe um, LV dysfunction. Um, in the preparation of this uh, procedure, of course, we did all the pre-diagnostic and uh, including a coronary angiogram where we were able to rule out uh, a severe coronary artery disease. Um, she has calcification um, along her coronaries, but no severe stenosis. Um, of course, this case was discussed um, thoroughly in our TAVI team, which consists, um, of course, of me and an interventional cardiologist and my colleague Alexander Kaminsky, who is the cardiac surgeon and who is um, the head of um, this TAVI team from the surgical side. Um, we, um, uh, since she, the lady is 84, and um, she uh, is also, she has osteoporosis, um, we decided um, to do a TAVI procedure. However, 
there's always this question, uh, should we do it um, percutaneous uh, via the femoral artery, or should we use the uh, transapical approach? And um, due to the fact that um, uh, this lady is suffering also from severe peripheral um, arterial vascular disease, um, we had um, to um, choose the uh, transapical um, approach. Um, in the meantime, while we're, we're talking, um, Alexander is uh, preparing the transapical access, and um, uh, we have already inserted um, uh, two um, um, chests in the right uh, in the right limb, and maybe we can show you um, this one. The gray one here is a, a femoral chest. Um, a, a wire is inserted um, into the vena cava, um, so in case we have an emergency situation, we can have quick access for the venous cannula for extra corporal circulatory assist. And the, the next to that, uh, we have the green shaft, um, an arterial shaft, and we have inserted a uh, so-called pigtail catheter, which I will show you in a second on our screen. Um, with this catheter, we're doing the aortography during the procedure to make sure that um, during the placement of the valve, we are in the perfect position. Now, I would like to switch maybe the cameras um, to give you an idea um, how this um, angiogram looks like. Should we have too much of this load? Yeah, we can see the can screen now. <laughs> okay, now here you see the um, aortography which we just did uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, here you see the probe of the transcutaneous echo which we have all um, on, 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 uh, during the procedure with us. <coughs> here you see the picture catheter and an aorta that obviously shows some severe kinking. Um, and it goes up here, and here you see the so-called pigtail end, um, which is placed in the a-coronary leaflet. This is the a-coronary, this is the right coronary, and here you see the left coronary uh, leaflet. Um, here the right uh, coronary, and here you see also the calcification of the left coronary, but as I said, during the coronary angiogram, um, there was no severe stenosis. Um, the orifice of um, this aortic stenosis was quantified um, around about 0.5 uh, square centimeters, and obviously that is a very severe aortic stenosis. The pressure gradient, we just um, checked that, uh, was uh, the peak gradient 56 and the mean gradient 32. Actually, we would expect a higher gradient, but due to the fact that she has severe LV dysfunction, um, the gradient is uh, lower, as we would expect. This is the gradient on, on echo. Can, here you see the wire. Um, which is placed in the vena cava superior, uh, as I told you before, for rapid access in case we need is the ECC. Okay, um, actually that's what I would like to, to tell you so far. Um, are there any questions so far from your side? Any questions from the audience? Can you maybe please show us the echo? We, we, uh, not the Doppler values, but the LV function, and, uh, so they can see how hypertrophied is the left ventricle. Yeah, just a second, we will try that. Can, uh, can we show them uh, the echo, and we have it here on the screen, and not the gradient, but uh, the, uh, the, the valve, and, and short and long axis? <laughs> You see echo now here, and you can appreciate uh, how hypertrophied the last ventricle walls are. Of course, severe stenosis. Yes, so here you see the long axis. Um, here is the aortic valve. That's the bulbous, then the ascending aorta. This is the left atrium, the left ventricle, and here you see the mitral um, 
mitral valve, that's the anterior, and that's the posterior leaflet. Now we do some uh, color doctor, and you see that there is no severe mitral insufficiency. If there would be a severe mitral insufficiency, you would see a blue jet, blue to yellow jet, going into this left atrium, but there is none. Now here you see the, the short axis of the um, aortic valve, here in the circle, you see really severe calcification along the, um, the cusp of the aortic valve, and I think you can also figure that there's not much horrified left during the movement of the, um, the, uh, the cusp. Thank you. We have now, now we have a question from the audience, please. Uh, hello, my name is yeah. Tomasz Tukarek, I'm a student from Poland. I would like to ask, uh, what is the indication for performing the procedure in transapical approach? Is there any calcification in aorta or something like this? And the second one, how often do you perform the uh, aortic valve replacement by the uh, transapical uh, approach? Okay, the first question. The reason why we did the transapical approach was, I told you before, that um, the lady has also severe peripheral arterial occlusive disease. So we don't have access for the devices via the femoral arteries. Does that answer your question? Uh, how often do you perform the procedure through the uh, apical in compared with femoral access? So, so the question was, how often do we do transapical and how often do we do transfemoral? Ah, okay, um, well, I would say around about, at the moment, one third of the patients are treated um, via the transapical approach and two thirds um, via the um, uh, transfemoral approach. Um, depends, of course, you know, which patient comes in. So we always take this close look on all the aspects to, to make the decision. But I would say that this is a rough estimate at the moment. And uh, the, the one last question. Uh, have, uh, have you noticed any differences in conduction disturbances or arrhythmias of the procedure when you compare femoral and transapical approach? Is there any difference in your technique? You mean notice? regarding like complications or problems that occur? In arrhythmias and uh, conduction disturbances of the procedure. Okay. Um, well, of course, if you do um, uh, uh, transapical or transfemoral um, uh, aortic valve infestation, you can have uh, uh, conduction disturbances because we we use in this case um, we will use a um, Edwards um, valve, which is a valve that needs to be implanted with balloon um, um, inflation. So there will be great pressure on the tissue surrounding the aortic annulus, and um, but uh, you can never really predict um, how, how it will uh, develop. Um, but you have to be aware that uh, you can have severe conduction problems, and that's why uh, the surgeon um, plays also a, a temporary uh, pacemaker epicardial to be ready if these problems develop. Can you maybe explain also how big is the incision uh, done in the chest to see the apex? How big the incision, the size, uh, I would say around about uh, 6 to 7 centimeters. Alexander, how big is the orifice that you just did? Six, six centimeters? Okay, four. Four centimeters. Any other questions? Maybe just to explain other students that are still not very familiar with the, uh, with the uh, TAVI procedure. Uh, because aortic valve lies very near to the AV node after the procedure, 
we sometimes encounter conduction problems with uh, four degree AV block and of course the, the need for a permanent pacemaker implantation. Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the question. I didn't get the question. Um, no, he, was, he just made a comment, I think. Peter? Yes. Any, any more questions? No, not at the moment. So I, I would suggest that uh, maybe we uh, stop the transmission for now and we come back live when we will be placing the valve. Okay, then we'll, we'll go okay. for another presentation and come back after we finish with the, with the presentation. Okay. If, the, if you're going to, to continue with the procedure, you can call us and we can also go live in between. Yes, that's what we will do. So please continue with the meeting, have fun and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so this time for real, please, Thomas and so, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to our discussion about two invasive treatment options for aortic diseases, namely uh, open surgical aortic repair and endovascular aortic repair. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Jon Rotaner, and here is my colleague Thomas Stukart from Hello. Poland. Um, I'm on the side of little crazy, old school, maybe diligent cardiovascular surgeons who want to uh, open every patient to treat him with uh, graft, scalpel, and stitches, you know, that proper way of treatment. However, Thomas is on the side of the more refined, polite cardiologists or radiologists who want to treat every patient by putting a leaky and very expensive endograft through the femoral artery. But uh, before the clash of our opinions, let's first quickly review some of the most important aortic diseases. So aortic diseases can be divided into uh, two main categories, acute and chronic. The most important acute disorders are dissection of the aorta and rupture of the aneurysm. Uh, the most important chronic disease is aneurysm of the aorta, which is the dilatation of the uh, aorta more than 50% of normal size and we can divide them into the aneurysm of abdominal aorta and aneurysm of thoracic aorta. As I uh, said before, uh, the classification of aortic aneurysm is based on the location and they can occur in ascending aorta, aortic arch and descending aorta. All of them are classifi classified as uh, uh, thoracic aorta aneurysms. Uh, this one, which are located below the diaphragm, are called uh, aneurysm of abdominal aorta. So another disease which is worth mentioning is aortic dissection. It occurs when there is a tear in the intima, so the blood uh, flows into the aortic wall, forcing the layers apart. The simplest and the most widely used classification is Stanford classification, which divides aortic dissections into two groups based on whether the ascending aorta is involved. So, as soon as the ascending aorta is involved, we call it type A dissection. Uh, please be careful there, um, please be careful here, because um, there may also be the descending aorta which is involved in type A dissection. On the other hand, type B dissection means that there is only the descending in aorta which is involved, but not the ascending one. There are two more terms which are important because they also dictate type of treatment, complicated and uncomplicated aortic dissection. Obviously complicated means uh, dissection with complications which are listed here. I would like you to notice that uncontrollable arterial hypertension, sizable dil dilation of false lumen and Marfan syndrome, all of those three points increase the risk of uh, dissection rupture, so that's why they are here. Ischemia of vital organs occurs due to uh, spreading of aortic dis dissection upwards and downwards, and when such dissection comes to the one of the aortic branches, the branch itself becomes uh, physically blocked, hence the ischemia. So, some problems? Maybe you can, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the last disease which we will describe is aortic rupture, and it means loss of integrity across the entire thickness of the aorta. So the blood leaks into the thoracic or abdominal cavity. 
the aortic rupture may be the consequence of an aortic aneurysm, dissection, or trauma. Before we continue with description of both treatments, uh, please bear in mind that medical therapy is also used for prevention and treatment of aortic diseases. For instance, antihypertensive drugs are used for uncomplicated IB dissection. So, uh, having said that, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with open surgical aortic repair or OSER. The procedure differs depending on where is the aortic disease. So, if that is in the thoracic part, of course, the median sternotomy is first performed, followed by cardiopulmonary bypass or hypothermic secretory arrest, and succeeded by an excision of that lesion. The surgeon, of course, then replaces it by graft. On the other hand, if we have a lesion in the abdominal part of the aorta, uh, there is no need for bypasses or secretory arrests. So uh, the surgeon just put clamps, clamps uh, on both sides of the uh, aortic lesion, which can be seen on this picture. And after, after that, the uh, surgeon opens the lesion, inserts the graft, and at the end, the graft is wrapped around with the old aneurysm sac. One advantage of such uh, uh, repair is that uh, the surgeon may, may uh, repair during the same operation also the aortic valve regurgitation. That is important because in some diseases, diseases of the ascending aorta, one consequence may also be that the dilation of the aortic annulus, uh, hence the functional aortic valve regurgitation. Let's see how EVER is performed. So endovascular aortic repair is minimally invasive procedure performed with the use of X-ray fluoroscopy. Uh, local anesthesia might be used in this uh, procedure and uh, it involves the uh, placement of expandable stent graft in the aorta by the use of the catheter. A small incision is usually made over the femoral artery and, and I said uh, a few seconds ago the endograft is placed with the use of catheter in the right place. We have few options for endovascular uh, approach. First one is fenestration. It's a connection between the true and false lumen. Uh, actually, it's a hole in the intima uh, of the vascular uh, made by the catheter and which makes the pressure between both sides equal. Uh, it's remain uh, the branches of the artery patent and decrease the rupture uh, of the aneurysm. The second option is the stent grafts, also called covered stents. It's also prevent from rupture of uh, aneurysm. It keeps the branches uh, patent and uh, increase the flow to the periphery and to the vital organs. And the last one is flower diverters uh, modulators, which are multi-layer uh, stents, which cause gradual uh, controlled uh, thrombosis of the aneurysm. Uh, and it's not very well, uh, not very often uh, used method for endovascular approach. So we have presented you two treatment options of aortic diseases. Now we'll show you the indications and advantages for both of them. Let's start with endovascular uh, option. The, first of all, we have to say that a big advantage of endovascular approach is avoidance of aortic cross clamping, extracorporeal circulation, and thoracotomy. All of them are not performed. Uh, what's more, uh, the endovascular approach reduced the incidence of spinal cord ischemia, respiratory failure, and renal insufficiency. Also, with endovascular strategy, uh, there is uh, connected lower blood loss, less stress, and uh, faster recovery of the patient. As I said a few seconds ago, uh, with the endovascular approach, we avoid the car cardiopulmonary bypass. So uh, there is uh, less, less uh, risk of neurocognitive dysfunction, cardiopulmonary dysfunction, renal complications, also uh, bleeding complications and systemic inflammatory response syndrome is less frequently reported when we uh, use endovascular approach. Okay. Uh, they are saying that in 30 seconds we're coming back live because they have some news for us. Okay. So maybe we should, no, you can stay there and we will try to incorporate it, those two. Can you hear us? Peter? Yeah, we can hear it now, Blash. Okay, so uh, guys, sorry for this interruption. But we are at a very interesting stage now, so Tim, please. Yes, OK. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, in the meantime, uh, after preparation of the epical access, um, Alexander 
has uh, done the puncture of the um, uh, left ventricular myocardium. Um, then he inserted a fairly um, uh, soft uh, wire um, into the left chamber. Can you maybe see the screen? Um, then uh, the uh, this soft wire passed the aortic valve. Um, it was the, the tip of the wire was placed down in the descending aorta, and then after that, the we, uh, go to the table. we inserted a um, picture catheter over this um, soft uh, uh, guide wire into the descending aorta. After that, we pulled out the, the soft. Peter, can you can you tell them to switch to the table view? Okay, so we, we can continue. Okay. So I, I will now we have to concentrate a little bit on the above um, implantation. I will tell you later on more details. Right now um, we have a stiff wire um, uh, placed across the um, aortic stenosis in the descending aorta. The chef. Uh, or insertion of the aortic valve has been placed already. You see, um, I'll show you later on on, on the screen. And now uh, Alexander is um, pushing forward the um, aortic valve. Maybe we can switch now to the um, to the monitor. You can see the, the valve here still on the catheter, which is the valve that is going to be expanded on the balloon later. Okay, now. Okay, you can see the screen. And also on echo, you can see the, the aortic valve getting into place still on the catheter. This here is the probe showing you this picture here. And the pigtail lies on the aortic leaflets. So some, some here is the aortic plane. And now multiple uh, angios. Okay, now this is a delicate phase, as you can see, we're really concentrating hard. Um, uh, Alexander has placed the, uh, the valve already um, in the stenotic area. And uh, now we want to verify that we're in a good position. We're doing another, another aortography. The aortic valve has to be really in a nice position because if it's too low, it can drop back to the ventricle. If it's too high, the leakage will be severe. So this is a very delicate part of the TAVI procedure to, to position the valve correctly. That's why you need angiography and TOE, that means transophageal echo, to position it perfectly. Um, yeah. Okay, we have replaced the um, picture catheter. Now you see, now you see also severe insufficiency, but that doesn't bother us at the moment. That's due to the fact that the valve is in there. Now we have seen that we are already in a fairly good position. Now we make everything ready to do the rapid pacing in order to um, induce uh, severe hypotension and to prevent systole. We don't want to have a beating heart in this uh, uh, scenario. The, the heart has to actually stand still, almost. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You have to pace the ventricles with, ex with a high frequency, usually above 160, usually 180 beats per minute to actually almost stop okay. the beating heart, not to, 
to uh, to influence on the aortic valve position before you uh, inflate the balloon. And you'll see here on the ECG, you will see rapid pacing here, uh, and it, the arterial blood pressure dropping to 50. That means hypertension, of course, the inflating of the balloon to expand the valve. Okay. Okay, guys, Luviana, now we, I can explain more in detail. Um, this was now the trivial situation. Um, what we did was, after we had verified the deflated uh, valve in a good position, we did another aortography to make sure that we're really in top position. Then we started the rapid pacing uh, with a frequency of 180 beats per minute, inducing hypotension and almost asystole. Then I started to inflate the balloon to expand the aortic valve. And we made another check, and then I did the full inflation of the balloon for final implantation of the aortic valve. And uh, now we're looking at the hemodynamic situation, which is uh, okay. You should have a systolic pressure of around 100, that's fine. And uh, this rapid pacing uh, is not completely switched off, but now with a frequency of 80 beats per minute. And uh, now we are just checking also in the TEE um, how the valve is working whether we have um, a severe aortic insufficiency, a central insufficiency inside the valve would not be a problem, but a paravalvular insufficiency, that would be, depending on the grade, um, a situation where we would have to decide whether we need another inflation in order to get rid of that aortic insufficiency. Um, we check, uh, uh, to, to, to answer the question, is there a relevant uh, insufficiency, we check in different views in the TEE. So the, the TEE in this procedure is absolutely essential. Um, we cannot um, uh, check uh, this properly with aortography. We have to do it with TEE. And now you see the short axis. Um, now you're switching a little bit, but just before. Um, Alex, um, uh, Frank, can you one more short axis? Then? Okay, and now one more fast axis. Okay. This is the wire in the middle of the valve, still going through okay, the valve. Now you, see, now you see the aortic valve in the middle, you see um, the, the wire um, in the valve, and there's a little insufficiency, but is it more than 10% or is it no? So it's just a very small, almost actually only reflux um, across the valve. And Maybe if the wire is completely out, then this might disappear completely. But so far, actually, we are quite happy with the result uh, we have achieved so far. Yes, congratulations. Uh, very nice position. So now we have to get rid of, of the material inside this lady. Um, now we will um, pull back. Can you go to the, back to the table view? Yeah, okay. 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 Now we are on the table. Um, here you see the the shed up to here, and now Alexander is pulling back the the insertion device of the valve, and I can show you in a second also the this insertion device. Okay. Okay. So, okay, here you see the device. 
Okay, I have to check whether you can see it as well. Yeah, this is the insertion device. This is the tip. The wire is inserted here. Then we push it forward through the shaft into the body. And the, um, the valve was crimped, placed, placed on this balloon. And it's done by our colleagues from the uh, surgical department. Um, it's done just, uh, ahead of the um, actual implantation because the bovine leaflet should not be crimped for a long time. So this is done just before the implantation. Here you have the handle, and here you see the, um, uh, the syringe where I inflate the balloon with. It's filled with fluid, and uh, here you see also a, a pressure uh, manometer, but actually that's not necessary. You just have to inflate full, completely um, the balloon. And besides that, um, for each valve, the volume is defined um, um, uh, exactly how much fluid should be in this whole system. So um, right now we are still having the shaft inside. Um, are we going home? Almost. Almost. So actually, um, are there now any questions from the audience? Any questions in the audience? Is everything clear about the procedure, how it was done, why the wires, why the balloon? Okay, no questions. You explained everything perfectly. Okay. Uh, maybe I can uh, check the... Um Okay, if we don't ha have any questions, then we would like to thank you very much for, uh, for showing the procedure. Uh, thank you, Blush. Thank you, the whole team. Um, Peter? Yeah. I think... Okay, so um, it was a nice procedure. Everything went well. And I hope you will have a good continuation of this interesting medical student journal club pro Contra. And just greetings from Germany. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rachel. Now we can continue and, and maybe also finish okay. the presentation. Actually, it's not the finish yet. It's a few slides more. Okay. Uh, so continue. We will describing the uh, advantages of UR and. Uh, as I mentioned about the avoidance of cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, there is also shorter length of stay in intensive care unit and also there is reduced overall hospital uh, stay when we use endovascular approach. Uh, what is uh, very important, uh, the rate of the transfusions is lower. We, uh, the red blood cells, platelet and fr fresh uh, frozen plasma transfusions are performed uh, less frequently when we use endovascular approach. Uh, there is uh, also uh, no risk of occurrence of hernia, which is very common uh, complication. Uh, the, uh, the surgical department because the combined um, leaflet Okay, so there is also no risk of complications uh, such as hernia, which is very common when we use the open surgery uh, repair. There is also no specific activity restrictions for the patients when they uh, underwent endovascular uh, strategy. It's not working. Okay. Um, probably not the probe, all the glitters is not gold, and there is no exception here. Um, so let's go through, through that huge list of disadvantages of fever. Most common complications happen in vascular access, such as uh, femoral artery, aneurysm dissection, or thromboembolic events. Another common complications are endograft related, endoleak and graft migration being two of the most common here. And so what is an endoleak? Endoleak is defined as a persistent blood flow into the aortic uh, lesion despite the endograft. So that indicates a failure of endograft to exclude that lesion from the circulation. Due to such endograft-related complications, there are more interventions in EVR and there is need for lifelong surveillance. 
um, both of those increase the cost and um, also the enograph itself is very expensive. So overall, EVER is more costly than OSER. Um, I would like you to notice that uh, for EVER to employ its fullest potential, favorable anatomy is needed. So in other words, there, should be, um, there shouldn't be lack of proximal and distant landing zones. And also the uh, sending aorta itself is a, very, is a huge anatomical obstacle for EVER because it's hard to transport the endograph there and also because there are important aortic branches which of course shouldn't be blocked by the endograft. Last but not least, in uh, connected tissue disorders or in hemodynamically unstable patients, the EVER is contraindicated, so the OSER is the only option here. Having mentioned the general pros and cons of both treatments, now let's compare uh, both treatments, uh, how effective they are in different aortic diseases. So let's start with an AAA. Yes, so for endovascular uh, treatment of aortic abdominal aneurysm, uh, there is reported long-term survival, but surprisingly in younger patients below the 17 years old. Uh, also, uh, what is uh, very important, there is lower perioperative mortality up to three years when we use endovascular approach. Uh, but uh, there is no significant differences in quality of life and erectile function when we compare both treatment options. Uh, there is also no significant differences in number of uh, secondary therapeutic procedures and post-repair hospitalization. So please uh, tell something more about open surgery treatment. So the early benefit of um, EVER is decreasing with time, which can be nicely seen on this graph, uh, and this is so-called catch-up phenomenon. So at first, there is significant difference between both procedures, which becomes insignificant a few years after the both procedures. Um, even worse, uh, both trials showed that uh, there occurred secondary ruptures only in EVAR but not in OSAR. Furthermore, uh, there were more interventions and more complications related to aneurysm, um, which can be also nicely seen on this graph, so that difference is increasing with time. Um, all of those three points actually indicate poor late performance of EVAR. So let's see how EVAR is doing in the uh, aneurysm of the thoracic aorta. So for endovascular treatment of uh, this disease, uh, there was reported a better short term with similar mid-term um, outcome, but on the other hand, there is few researchers that they claim that there is no difference in 30 days mortality when we compare endovascular and open surgery treatment options. But what we know for sure that uh, with endovascular approach, there is uh, less frequently performed transfusions, uh, shorter stay in ICU and hospital, and there is uh, a lower risk of chest infections, renal complications, tracheostomy, and inotropic support after the procedure when we use endovascular uh, strategy. Uh, what is very important is that uh, there's a lower risk of death, stroke, and permanent paraplegia when we treat aneurysm of thoracic aorta with treatment uh, option of endovascular. So please tell something optimistic with uh, open surgery group. Are you able? Of course I am. So uh, again, after two years of follow-up, there were no survival advantages with Ivor or OSAR. So here we have another catch-up phenomenon, which is again indicator of poor late performance. Another thing is I would like to stress that um, we were talking about just the descending aorta. Uh, in descending aorta, it's a completely different story. Ivor is, actu is actually useless here due to already mentioned anatomical challenges. So um, OSAR uh, is, is truly outstanding in the um, aneurysms of the ascending aorta. Tomasz, uh, please tell us something about the um, rupture of AAA. So when we treat with endovascular approach, rupture of aortic abdominal aneurysm, we uh, probably may uh, get better outcome uh, with women. Uh, but uh, it's not so sure, not uh, confirmed in all uh, researches. But uh, what is sure that uh, most pa uh, patients are discharged directly to home and there is also shorter stay in ICU and uh, there is similar number of brain interventions. So how is it in open surgery? So I should agree there. Uh, both recent articles show that there is no significant difference in early mortality, severe complications, and cause between both procedures. Um, however, please keep in mind that uh, those studies were comparing just early outcomes, and uh, there are no conclusive long-term results about either yet. So the mortality, complications, and cost may increase with time, as we've seen it in previous slides. So far, Ivor and Oser are quite even here. Tomasz, 
you don't have anything to say about type A dissections, do you? Uh, to be honest with myself, it's uh, difficult to disagree with you. Uh, type A dissection is definitely a weak point of the endovascular approach. Uh, this very challenging uh, procedure, the placement of the stent graft because of the, uh, in the uh, ascending aorta because of the proximity of aortic art branches and coronary arteries. The technique is feasible, but only in the very selected group of the patients. It seems to be uh, associated with favorable results, but only uh, in selected patients. So definitely uh, an open surgery group is winning in this uh, challenge, in this disorder. So please uh, tell something more about this. Yes, that's why I love this part of the presentation the most, because um, also is truly outstanding here when compared to Ivar. I would like also to stress that uh, one trial showed, uh, one trial which was um, comparing Ivar in type A dissection, they, um, they um, realized that there were more extension of dissections, dislodgement of thrombus and aortic valve insufficiency uh, due to manipulations with guide wires or endografts. So these are really severe complications, and that's why the ulcer is gold standard for such, for such lesions. So let's conclude with the, um, with the weakest point of ulcer. Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, from the uh, point of view uh, of uh, endovascular treatment options, complicated type B dissection have favorable results and better outcome when we compare it with open surgical. There is lower in hospital and 30-day mortality. Also, there is improved survival up to five years from the procedure and there is less frequent in hospital complications when we perform the uh, treatment of complicated type B dissection with endovascular strategy. So please say something good about the open surgery if it's so, possible uh, in this case. Yeah, undoubtedly the EVAR is associated with better outcomes when treating complicated type B dissection. Nevertheless, uh, OSER still has, has its role here and uh, that is in patients with connective tissue, dis tissue disorders or in patients who are hemodynamically unstable. So let's sum it all up. Okay, so in conclusions, uh, and the vascular approach is connected with lower early mortality, shorter stay in an intensive care unit, uh, also less complications, and what we know for sure that the role of the vascular treatment is still increasing and become more and more popular. So uh, generally speaking, uh, in OSAR, there are no such strict anatomical predispositions needed as are in EVAR. OSAR is also overall cheaper, uh, there is less in for surveillance and is also more durable. Now let's uh, repeat uh, in which instances the ulcer or EVAR are the treatments of choice. So definitely we have to say that the treatment of aneurysm of descending and abdominal aorta, complicated acute type B dissection and aortic rupture and transection have favorable uh, results and better outcome when we use the EVAR. But, uh, Anyway, how, uh, to be honest, we have to confess that the ulcer is still alive and still necessary. Of course, so ulcer is definitely not dead yet. Quite the opposite, when it comes to the ascending aorta pathology or patients with connective tissue disease or hemodynamic and unstable patients, the ulcer is unmatched. As a rule of thumb, the ulcer, um, the younger patients should undergo ulcer while the older ones should undergo EVAR. Another, um, Generally speaking, uh, ulcer and DIVOR are chosen depending on etiology, location, and comorbidities. So to finally conclude our presentation, in recent years, the combination of both treatments is becoming more and more promising and especially effective for the diseases of uh, an aortic arch. So we call it hybrid operation, and here's one such example. By doing so, one increases the advantages of both procedures, so the procedure itself is less invasive, uh, more durable and effective even in long term. So I'd like to finish by reminding everyone that uh, the proverb, united we stand, divided we fall, also counts in uh, comparison between even and Oser. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. To both of you. Uh, now I would like first to ask Dr. Schiller if he has any comments or anything. No, please just stay here on the stage. Uh, thank you very much for, the, for an excellent presentation. Um, it's um, listening to this and um, seeing you here in the audience, I um, just hope that you all understand that we are here talking about completely different uh, groups of uh, patients. Uh, namely, the, ascending, the, 
both, uh, both colleagues here have done an excellent job, but they, they were faced with an enormous uh, task of comparing all different diseases of different parts of aorta. Uh, it means that it's almost impossible to compare all different types of surgical procedures, endovascular procedures, um, or different types of um, medical treatment. So you have to know that not EVAR or not the open surgical uh, procedure is the best solution for every part of the aorta and for every disease. So they've done this perfectly. They've shown you different types of procedures that are uh, the first line in different settings. Uh, I, was, um, uh, I was afraid they, that they will not mention the, uh, the hybrid procedures. Uh, not only them, but also the, uh, the industry uh, has noticed recently that there is a huge gap. So while we were all arguing whether it's better to do open surgical or EVAR, they came up with an excellent solution. They've shown here a hybrid procedure with you, where you, we have to do the graft separately and then the EVAR procedure is done then, I don't know, a day or a week or month later. But now in recent years, maybe one or two years, you have several grafts uh, like the Evita or the Vascota graft they are already combined. So you can do one procedure, only one procedure with one type of, of combined hybrid graft. So you have the uh, surgical graft for the SNE aorta and the arch of the aorta with all three huge branches that you have to do surgically because otherwise you deserve the patient. And then you have the connection is already done, it's fabricated. So the connection with a stent that you put directly into the thoracic aorta. So that's maybe another thing that's really new right now and it's showing very promising results. It's probably gonna be the best treatment option in, in this new era that we are approaching because as you, as you have seen today, uh, not every part of the aorta needs uh, the same treatment. So why don't we combine them together and do everything at the same time? And in the last two years we can do that. So, but, uh, okay, I would just, another, just one question. You have mentioned uh, the, uh, the stenting of the uh, ascending aorta in the aortic arch. Do you think, is there a, a limitation of put, putting a stent graft in the aortic arch or do you use something else for the aortic arch? Uh, you are asking for endovascular treatment option. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, the, the risk of the putting the stents uh, to the aortic arch is connected with the branches, as you said, which are uh, taking off from the, from the arch. And there is a risk of ischemia to the brain, and uh, it's difficult. It's uh, usually covered. Stent grafts are not used uh, in, in this uh, procedure. We have to use uh, different methods of, uh, like fenestrations, for example, or... Sorry. Uh, so uh, only covered stents are, are not a feasible method. Uh, I, I suppose uh, that it's not enough and it's not uh, favorable results when we use covered stents. What about flow diverters? Are yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, I, I want, yeah, I wanted to, uh, to say that. It's, of course, if you use a covered graft, you'll kill the patient, of course. That's normally, right? Eh? Do you agree with that? Yeah, sure, of course. So they came up with a new idea. They said, Hmm, look what the neurosurgeons are using or the neuroradiologists for the aneurysms of the, uh, of the vessels in the brain. So they said, okay, they're using small stents with multiple layers. So they said, hmm, maybe we can use that. They don't call them stent grafts because they're not 
graft, they're not grafts, they're not stands as well, so they're flow diverters, they're di diverting flow, they're preserving flow through the main branches, and everything else is eventually, through weeks or months, full of thrombosis. So you can use for the arch, you can use flow diverters. It's really expensive, it's a new technique. I don't know if I would be ready right now if they would ask me if, I'm a, if I would go through that procedure because there's not enough evidence. So maybe it's gonna show later on that it's a good technique, but there's a risk. So maybe there is a small thrombus going Hmm, to your carotid artery then, uh, later on in a two years or three comment? years' time. Nobody knows, because they're not so long on the market. So, but it's, it's a, of course, a new technique, not standard, because you, you said you, you wrote stand graphs. They're flow diverters, but let's see. It's a promising new technique, but not really very often used today. But it's also can be... Uh, combined, for example, with uh, protection, uh, like uh, with the surgery of the carotid arteries, with uh, uh, with those uh, things that stops the thrombus to go to the to the brain, like uh, mesh. Yeah. Like yes. Meshes, filters. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. put it uh, like a protection. So it's also, I guess, future for the procedure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It it is. It's just the problem is. Wherever, whenever you put a, a mesh or filter, whatever in your, and uh, actually a flow diverter acts like a, like a mesh into your arterial system, there can be some problem. So uh, let's wait for, the, for, for studies with larger groups of, of patients. But of course, it's a new idea and Probably in in few years' time, it's going to be um, a, a real op option for a lot of patients. Not for all, but for a lot of them. Thank you for the comments. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. I know it's not a, um, a big deal, but what's the cost difference between one and the other procedure? Is that taken into account sometimes or never? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it, basically it comes to the money at the end of the story, right? Um, the, the cost of a, uh, of a graph that we are using goes up to, I don't know, 500 euros, 1,000 euros, and a flow diverter is uh, around 25,000 euros. Something like that. So initial price is uh, it's much cheaper in surgical settings. But then, uh, if you uh, if you look at the whole story, it depends. If you're using extracorporeal circulation for the operation, and then the uh, the time that the patient has to stay in the ICU and uh, follow up and everything, it might sum up eventually sometimes. But looking only at the cost of the material, EVAR is definitely much, much more expensive. It's, uh, there's no doubt about it. But let's wait for the Chinese to make, you know, to produce, uh, to produce the stand graphs and the flow divertis is the prices are gonna drop. <laughs> uh, hello, I have a question uh, considering flow diverters. If you put a flow diverter into the aortic arch, then okay, sure, it will divert flow from the aneurysm, but it will also divert flow from the uh, branches, from the uh, carotid arteries. And uh, no, the, the main idea of flow diverters is, is wherever you have a straight flow going like to the main arches of the uh, main branches of the arch, the flow is preserved. All other regions are full of thrombus. So that's the main idea. I have the same uh, thoughts as you, and a lot of people do have them. Uh, theoretically, it should work. Practically, we haven't seen so many patients yet. Nobody really knows 
Nobody really knows what's going to happen in 10 years with those flow diverters because they're not used for such a long time. Uh, but the idea is wherever you have a laminal flow going directly through the mesh, it should be preserved. And may I have one question which I couldn't find answer during uh, preparing to the presentation. When we have the flow diverters and we want to make the thrombosis and the patients, for example, have uh, our, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and he's using uh, antagonists anti of uh, vitamin K, uh, like acinacumarol or warfarin. Is there any risk that the, the thrombus wouldn't occur with the flow diverters? That's theoretically possible, but however, you have a lot of, of vortexes uh, and stasis of blood in, in the regions which are covered by flow diverters. So eventually, the thrombosis should be happening and thrombus should appear, but probably much later. And you should know that the, the thrombus and the thrombosis of the, for example, of the aneurysm, it doesn't appear automatically in a second. You know, you put the stand in and or the flow diverter and it happens in 10 minutes. It goes for, it can be for weeks or months. So probably in a Coumadin uh, situation, this thrombus formation would be much longer, but eventually it should happen. Uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, how long do patients who underwent uh, endovascular procedure have to stay in hospital, and how long do the patients who were operated on open heart surgery have to stay on the, in the hospital for? I guess physicians should yeah. answer this question. Yeah, it, it, uh, it depends from the type of surgery, of uh, the number of complications that the patient had. Um, it's really a tough question to answer straight away. It's, you can have a patient with a, a good uh, type, type A dissection going out to the hospital in a week after the surgery and uh, a type B dissection that was treated uh, uh, medically, you know, it can, with drugs only, it, there, he can be in the hospital for a month or two months. So, but it can be vice versa as well. If you have it as the section A or ruptured aneurysm of the abdominal aorta with all the complications that follow the surgery, because the surgery is not a big problem, you know. You, you can clamp the, the aorta, you put the graft in, but then the story begins. So those patients, there are, they came to the hospital with a, um, with a profound hypovolemia, cardiogenic shock, high, uh, high lactate, uh, in a really bad situation. So they can, they usually, they do survive operation, but it depends if they survive the treatment afterwards. So if it really goes into a long, long ICU stay, it can be weeks to months. Uh, but then at, at the end of the story, EVARS probably fast track performance versus surgery, that's a bigger. But then again, if you look at the patient population, EVAR is suitable for patients that are not so complex, with better anatomy, healthier, actually healthier patients. So it's not really comparable. They're not comparable groups of, of people that we are talking about. So you have to know that. Uh, any more questions? Hi, I'm Dora from Croatia. I have a question. Uh, regarding endovascular operations, it, it sounds when it's possible to conduct them, then they're like perfect. That it's something you can do be between you know, breakfast and lunch. Uh, however, I'm sure they're also associated with some risks which are rarely uh, mentioned. If you could comment maybe on that from your clinical experience, have you had any uh, serious complications occurring after endovascular operations? Thank you. Actually, I'm not performing because I'm the student. So maybe once again, I will uh, kindly ask the physicians to, to um, answer the question. Yeah, it's, um, of course, endovascular procedures are uh, getting more um, everyday practice, even in really emergent cases. Um, so far, they were probably the treatment of choice in stable patients uh, where everything's uh, much easier. But then, 
uh, of course, you have some, even in normal patients, which are done routinely, you can have some problems. First of all, EVAR is a relatively young, compared to the surgical procedure, a relatively young method. So nobody knows what's going to happen with those stents in 20 years or 30 years. So do, do you want to, if you would have an abdominal aneurysm, would you want today a surgical procedure or a, a EVAR procedure? I mean, it sounds better, EVAR, yeah? yeah? They go through the groin, they put it in, it's okay, but nobody knows what's going to happen with the stent in 30 years. And then the, the endoleaks, you're not going to escape the endoleaks if you're so young as you are, you know. So it, you will probably need a surgical procedure in a few years' time. Um, so that's the first problem. We don't know how they will perform. Then the second thing is if the anatomy is not okay and the anatomy can change during the years, the the neck of the aneurysm can enlarge and the graft, they don't fit anymore. So you have to put a new graft above the old graft. And if this graft doesn't fit in a few years, you have to put another graft and then you, you get out of the aorta because you don't, everything is dilated. Um, so, um, of course, because there's much more EVAR performed in last years, they do it also in uh, emergency cases. And in those cases, you can, of course, because there are more complex patients, you have more uh, complications, especially if you are treating, for example, uh, dissections or ruptured aneurysm of the abdominal aorta. Uh, we had a young, relatively young patient with Marfan syndrome, and because they thought they're going to... Uh, he's going to benefit from EVAR procedure, they did put a stent in, in the uh, descending aorta, and they end up with a tear in the adventitia, because the stent, when it was inflated, it made a tear in the adventitia, so he came to the operating room with a, uh, with a hematothorax on his left side, and eventually he died. Would he die if we wouldn't put a stand graft in, if we wouldn't damage the, the only part of the aorta that was holding, that was the dentitia? Probably, who knows? And then another setting, you are going in, trying to save someone's life with a ruptured uh, AAA. You put a stand in, it doesn't fit, something goes wrong, you have to go to the operating room. There's rupture plus the rupture of the of the aorta done by the stent. You, you have lost another precious hour or two. You have lost another liter of blood. There's, the complications are summing up. So uh, choosing the right patient for the right procedure at the first stage is really important. Um, that's it. OK, thank you. Jan, thank you, Tomasz. Thank you very the much. Time is pushing, so we should conclude this session. Thank you, Dr. Kshela. Thank you to all of you. Uh, now there has been a change in the schedule, so I uh, suggest we have a break now. We meet again at 11 o'clock for the second session. Thank you.
the session two, uh, we have two debates on team medicine nowadays. So I would kindly invite uh, two debaters from the first debate with the title or with the thesis, doctor is not needed in pre-hospital emergency care to start their debate. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dora. This is Maria, my colleague from Zagreb. And before I start, I'd like to say that we're very happy to be here again. Uh, we've been in uh, this Congress last year and we had such a great time, so we decided we must come here and make even better presentations than last year. So now let's have fun uh, discussing whether a doctor is needed or not, as I will argue, <laughs> in pre-hospital emergency care. So pre-hospital, it means before a patient is actually brought to the hospital, to the emergency department or some other department. And uh, of course, emergency care, it, it mostly, uh, we'll mostly talk about, <coughs> hi, Melancha, <laughs> uh, about um, who is uh, a competent provider of pre-hospital emergency care. So as Lockheed, in his, uh, uh, article says, ideally, and he speaks of trauma patients, uh, they should have critical interventions carried out when they need them on the site of the accident uh, by competent providers, and then they should be transferred rapidly to an appropriate hospital. Uh, and now we will discuss who are the competent providers, and I, as the site proposition, will argue that doctor is not actually uh, necessary, always necessary in this pre-hospital care. Which is, of course, a lie. Um, but yeah, I only have one question for you all. If you were an, in an emergency situation, would you rather be treated by a physician or an emergency medicine technician? And I think most of you would, be, would like to be treated by a physician. And uh, Timmerman and his colleagues, obviously, as you can see in this quote, think that uh, the debate on this topic isn't really needed because physicians win. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, be that as it may. Uh, let's discuss why we already do not have an answer to this question. Uh, why we don't have research that proves without doubt that either system using doctors or system using, for example, paramedics or EMTs is uh, better than the other. So first of all, it, it is because it's very difficult to conduct this type of, uh, this type of uh, research. First of all, uh, there, of course, there are some ethical issues. For example, if you, if you think the doctor, doctor is better, would you then deny uh, physician's care to an uh, emergency patient? Uh, and also, since there are countries which employ one or the other system, uh, we, sh we should say that it would be easily comparable which one is better. However, structural differences between those systems make this comparison impossible. Also, there are different policies and legal parameter of duties of paramedics in, for example, Germany or uh, Switzerland or uh, United States or United Kingdom. So even in countries employing the similar system, it's much different. Also, the question of uh, geography or of a certain country or of a certain area and availability of doctors and uh, emergency care also uh, makes this type of research hard to uh, hard to conduct. Also, we must take into consideration the start standard of hospital care and uh, the division of pre-hospital and hospital care because good hospital care might uh, make up for the deficiencies in pre-hospital care or excellent pre-hospital care might influence badly the hospital care because we get worse patients that might not actually survive in hospital so we have a different outcome. Uh, and since it is impossible to divide those two, uh, we, we do not have, uh, we do not have this, this question already definitely answered. So that's why we're going to engage uh, in this debate. Uh, first of all, we would like to uh, describe some approaches that are currently uh, used in pre-hospital emergency care. Okay, so there are two uh, main models. One is Franco-German model, which uh, employs physicians, and which I'm for, and the Anglo-American model, which employs paramedics, which he thinks is better. So uh, the Franco-German model is practiced in most of Europe, and um, in Franco-German model, the ambulances are staffed by physicians. So the physicians are brought uh, straight to the scene, straight to the patient, um, and uh, they begin the treatment on scene. Of course, they bring the patient to the hospital, but uh, they're not in such a rush because they first want to stabilize the patient on scene. Uh, they can start advanced and um, more aggressive treatment, 
and this is called a stay and play uh, approach because uh, they're first staying on scene and they're stabilizing the patient before bringing them to the hospital, which is contrary to the Anglo-American model. Yeah, to the infinitely cooler and much better approach, uh, which is the Anglo-American model, which goes by the uh, titles scoop and run. So get the patient into an ambulance, do the necessary emergent things that you need to do, and then get them quickly to the doctor, to the hospital, when the doctors can be used to their full potential, where the situation is better controlled. And uh, it usually employs uh, specially trained uh, emergency medical technicians or EMTs and paramedics, which are educated to conduct basic advanced or uh, life uh, support care. And uh, uh, they rely heavily on protocols, uh, which are developed especially for these uh, situations. And uh, to move on. Okay, uh, so as you know, time is a very important factor in emergency medicine. Uh, and as I said, uh, physicians use the stay and play uh, technique. So you might think they uh, spend more time on scene and they take longer to take the patient to the hospital. So are they wasting time? Well, they're not. <laughs> and uh, some might consider that this time is even better utilized because, as I said, they can uh, begin advanced and aggressive treatment uh, as soon as they get to the patient. So sooner. Uh, they don't have to wait to get to the hospital to start it. Um, and physicians, uh, as they're more skilled, uh, they take less time to do a procedure than an emergency medical technician or a paramedic m might take. Also, uh, physicians can treat patients on scene. They don't have to bring all the patients to the hospital. They can assess them, and if they treat them on scene, uh, they can create more time for the a and &E departments in uh, hospitals to treat the more serious uh, cases, the, more, uh, the patients in a worse state. Uh, and there is also a problem uh, of uh, when uh, there is a, an unavoidably prolonged pre-hospital time when patients are in remote areas which are difficult to reach with uh, vehicles. So when you can't easily approach the patient with an ambulance um, or with a, even with a helicopter. And uh, of course, physicians will make better use of this time while waiting for transport than, uh, um, than the paramedics would. Uh, and uh, I trust you have all heard of HEMS, which is a Helicopter Emergency Medical Service. And you might be surprised that uh, research showed that the benefit of HEMS isn't in the velocity of transport. It isn't, of course, it's important that patients get to the hospital as soon as possible, but the more important um, factor that influenced the outcome for patients was the presence of the physician in the helicopter who could treat the patient uh, while they were being transported. Um, well, we'll get uh, back to this issue. Uh, first, let me start by comparing, you know, these two approaches. Is it better to, you know, uh, scoop and run or stay and play? Uh, Just stay and, and play. Uh, <laughs> we'll see about that because you probably thought all this was evidence-based, like golden hour, of course. It's intuitive, you know. The golden hour, it, sound, it sounds pretty also. Uh, early endotracheal intubation, on the spot now. Let's intubate them and then go and uh, early IV application of fluid therapy. Yeah, sure, why not? Give them fluid. And uh, application of ALS in uh, every situation that might indi uh, be an indication. However, you might be surprised to know that there are no research that would definitely prove uh, the advantage of, of these concepts uh, in an emergency situation, and uh, which prove beyond uh, doubt that this actually influences uh, the outcome of the patient, their mortality and their morbidity afterwards. So, therefore, I believe that scoop and run is definitely the approach to go. <laughs> well, I mean, you are digging your own grave because you just said that there is no good research. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but um, we all know that uh, there are some aspects of advanced uh, treatment on scene that are important, uh, such as early defibrillation um, and thrombolysis or uh, treating uh, acute myocardial infarction or respiratory distress or um, an epileptic status, of course, you want to treat that as soon as possible and not wait to get to the hospital. Uh, and research definitely showed that um, fluid resuscitation and beginning fluid um, administration on scene uh, can improve uh, outcome in patients. Of course, not all patients need advanced treatment, but that's why you need to assess, assess which, one, uh, which patients need it and which don't, and well, physicians can assess that better. Uh, well, speaking of whether they can assess them better, uh, evidence shows that in uh, 
more than 93% of cases, actually that uh, physician's uh, capabilities, which are much better, as you claim, than uh, paramedics, for example, are not actually needed or would in any case influence the outcome uh, of, the, of the case. So uh, therefore, uh, you should agree that in most of the cases, physician or a doctor is really not needed in pre-hospital emergency care. Okay, well even 7% is something, and if you can save 7% of people, that's great. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, paramedics or emergency medicine t uh, technicians, they train, depending on what country and what level of expertise they have, they train from a few months to two years, and you all know how long physicians train. Uh, how long the medical school is, and then uh, internships and specializations, and well, you know. Uh, so, uh, because uh, the training of emergency medical technicians is a lot shorter, they have to rely on standard operating procedures, they have to follow the guidelines, they can't really stray outside them because they do not have enough expertise and knowledge to do so while physicians can do it, and in certain situations they can decide to act differently than the guidelines would instruct them to do. Um, also, in some situations, which are more advanced patients or patients with uh, more comorbidities or uh, difficult patients such as pediatric, uh, physicians have more knowledge and they have better skills to deal with this kind of problems. Um, and there are some research. Uh, there is some research that shows that um, the skills of paramedics uh, can't match those of the physicians. For example, in intubation, there are more failed attempts of intubation when they are performed by paramedics, and this might be attributed to the fact that most patients who are emergency patients uh, are minor cases, and not all of them. I mean. <laughs> There's a really a small number of them that need intubation, so paramedics don't get a lot of practice in that, so that might be the reason. While doctors get to practice the same skills in hospital as well. Uh, well, staying on the issue of competences, uh, there is plenty of research that shows that even though you know uh, doctors spend more time in training and obviously maybe more more autonomous in uh, making their decisions, that. Uh, in a certain uh, situations, there is no difference in the s outcome of their uh, actions. For example, in the CPR quality and outcome of affecting drugs, uh, of uh, administering drugs, and also in estimating the severity of injuries. And uh, also, uh, while speaking of, uh, for example, intubation, which is a really important skill, uh, let me stress that. Uh, most of those research compares uh, skilled anesthesiologists with paramedics, which of course get much more practice and therefore are more skilled in intubation. However, research shows that physicians which are employed in emergency uh, medical care, uh, they carry out CPR intubations and, uh, uh, for example, uh, chest tubes very rarely. Uh, it may take uh, up to six years before they place a uh, chest tube. So uh, it shows that even if a doctor was permanently employed in uh, emergency care, that his skills would also deteriorate and be quite comparable with those of uh, paramedics. And that's why we think it's better to get them as fast as we can to those very experienced doctors who can actually do that, their job uh, uh, very, very effectively. Yes, bring them to the physicians. <laughs> Um, so, okay, um, I don't know where you found that research, but I found some research uh, that uh, shows that there is a better outcome with patients treated by physicians. So, as you can see here, um, it, uh, the research shows that there is better survival rate in patients treated by physicians, and uh, patients spend less time in the ICU, and you might want to remember that because I'll mention it afterwards, later. Uh, there is also, uh, it also shows that physicians administer uh, more drugs and they uh, give more fluids. As I said, uh, they begin more uh, aggressive treatment. They're not as scared to do it because they know more about it. They have more profound knowledge. Um, and uh, there, there is a better survival of patients with uh, acute myocardial infar infarction if they are treated and respiratory distress if they are treated by physicians. And I know it says here, trust me, I'm a doctor, and I know I'm not a doctor yet, but uh, all this research has been done by doctors, so you can trust them. 
Uh, while this may sound convincing, I would like to remind you that all of these results actually include the hospital care, which uh, happened after pre-hospital emergency care. So therefore, we cannot attribute these results only to the uh, difference in pre-hospital emergency care. Uh, but we still, we still, I still as a proposition in this case, uh, of course acknowledge that doctors uh, are uh, quite capable and uh, uh, competent and in some cases they, their help will truly influence the patient outcome and that's what we want. We want the patients to have the best possible outcome. And that is why many countries uh, are starting to employ modern technologies uh, to make a certain compromise uh, in which uh, uh, the ambulances are staffed with uh, paramedics and uh, EMTs uh, and uh, they have the technology that which uh, telemedically uh, transmits all the important data to the doctor which sits into the dispatch office and uh, can give advice, can give uh, certain allowances to apply certain procedures or drugs and uh, also uh, pre-notify the adm uh, admitting facilities um, and therefore help uh, not only one, but many uh, ambulances uh, from, from one place, which is, uh, of course, uh, helpful not only to paramedics, but also to unexperienced physicians who are often, in my country, I'm, I'm sure in Slovenia it, it's a similar thing, placed in the ambulances and they gain their first medical experience in the ambulance. And also it is uh, especially helpful in rural and remote regions uh, where not uh, every time a quick access to a hospital facility uh, is uh, applicable and this offers a certain economical advantage to all the countries without infinite resources and that is like the whole world. <laughs> or you can just do what Croatia does, underpay doctors. It's also cheaper. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, an important question which I don't like but it is important is money. How much does this all cost and what are the differences? So you probably all think, and that's what we think, although we haven't found any exact data, any exact numbers, that physicians, physician staffed ambulances are more expensive than paramedic staffed ambulances. Um, there, I mean, we don't really, we can't really say, but there is this research that compar uh, compares Birmingham and Bonn. In Birmingham, they use paramedics, and in Bonn, uh, they use physicians. And as you can see here, um, the CPR cost is quite a lot less in Bonn where they employ physicians. And I can't really explain this, but um, there's also a theory I have and I don't have research to support it. Um, if tr patients are treated more efficiently, as I said, they will spend more, uh, less time in ICU. And ICU is a very expensive, I don't know uh, how much exactly, but it is very expensive. So the less time the patients need to sp spend in ICU, the less cost altogether. So the more efficient the treatment, the less cost will be in long term. I know this connects pre-hospital and later hospital medicine, but the cost should be looked at uh, altogether more uh, widely and broadly. <laughs> Um, however, I'm sure that we cannot, uh, based solely on this research, uh, say that uh, employing paramedics is uh, more expensive than employing uh, doctors in pre-hospital care, while especially logic implies that uh, staffing all the ambulances with doctors means also paying for their longer and more expensive education and, of course, bigger salaries. Uh, and. Um, uh, also, I'm sure this, uh, and this economical equation is influenced by much more than simply difference in who stops the ambulance. Also, it compares to economical systems. So, yeah, while this is very interesting, I would like to see more uh, proof of this. Yeah, we just theory. haven't found any exact data. Uh, okay. Oh, so uh, let's think of those emergencies which are not really urgent. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen in the emergency rooms many patients who think something is very urgent to them, but uh, actually does not represent a medical urgency, and they they overcrowd uh, they overcrowd the ER rooms, and sometimes uh, it causes that some more urgent cases are not recognized in time, and uh, actually negatively influences the uh, patient's outcome. Uh, and uh, Maria here uh, tried to accuse paramedics of stuffing the ER rooms with uh, all of those unnecessary uh, patients. However, we can see that some countries, actually, like the UK, uh, have found a way around this problem to, uh, by uh, uh, administering 
by uh, setting up walk-in centers and primary care centers or, and even some centers for minor, minor units uh, which treat specifically this non-urgent and uh, small cases and they're staffed by uh, nurses and paramedics. So you can see that uh, in actually uh, th this might be some kind of a future of non-urgent uh, pre-hospital emergency care uh, without uh, doctors. I agree, this is a really great concept. Uh, but in, even in UK, patients still call the ambulance for really not emergent situations. So I think the general public needs to be a bit more educated on what constitutes an actual emergency and what is a ma minor thing that they can go to a walk-in center to, or something like that. Okay. So uh, in conclusion, <coughs> to quote Al Shaksi, uh, he said that each community should uh, decide on what suits themselves best according to their resources, targets and goals. And of course that the patient outcomes should be the ultimate judging standards on which one is the best. Uh, but I believe that uh, we've shown that speaking of outcomes, uh, that uh, paramedics uh, run system is, uh, as far as research shows, at least as safe and as efficient as the physician-led systems. Uh, it, uh, it is probably uh, also cheaper and uh, that might, uh, especially if we employ uh, some compromises like telemedicine uh, proved to be a better system overall for countries of limited resources. Whoa, 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 <laughs> wait there. I mean, uh, you mentioned telemedicine, so if a doctor's advice is so good, I mean, just imagine how much their actual presence on scene uh, can benefit the patient. Um, I mean, even in USA, which employs Anglo-American model and they use paramedics because they don't want to spend too much money on physicians and they're scared of malpractice suits. Uh, they, even they recognize the need of physicians in emergency medicine and physicians usually volunteer to work in those capacities there, but they still are needed and they are called for. So they are important. Uh, and uh, I mean, I love paramedics. I have recently read a book written by a paramedic uh, and it, it was really great. And I wish I could have been a paramedic. There, there are no paramedics in Croatia, but if there were, maybe I, would, maybe I would have trained to be one because it sounds really great to me at least. Um, but paramedics uh, are uh, skilled to deal with more minor cases and they're not uh, as competent to deal with complicated and more advanced uh, emergency situations as physicians are. So I propose uh, a kind of a truce in, in uh, sort of a two-tier system, which is used in some countries, for example, Switzerland or Portugal, uh, where they employ both emergency physicians and paramedics. So there is a call center and uh, the person talking uh, to, on the phone with the person calling the ambulance will decide whether this, uh, the case is minor and can be treated by a paramedic or it's more serious and uh, should be treated by a physician. Uh, however, also the countries which employ primarily doctors in uh, ambulances also recognize that not always is doctor really needed. So that's why they also st uh, staff nurses, they also have nurses staffed and EMT staffed ambulances. And uh, while uh, being a future doctor, uh, I certainly agree that uh, doctors' competences in, uh, in a number of cases can really make the difference. Uh, I, I still firmly believe that in most cases, uh, paramedics uh, help can, can be enough and can provide uh, the same quality outcome, even though maybe I would feel more, more comfortable if I had a doctor looking after me. Uh, and uh, however, research uh, supports uh, my original thesis. And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, even in, in those minority cases uh, in which doctors really make the difference, it, it really counts and it's, re it's really important to, to us and that's why I agree with this entire system and uh, a kind of a compromise between the, between the two. So not always, but sometimes doctors can be needed in pre-hospital care. <laughs> sometimes they're uh, really, really beneficial <laughs> and crucial. Okay. okay, so to a tier system, high five. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the mentor of the debate, uh, Dr. Uh, Gregor Prosen with us? Okay. Uh, do you have any comments about uh, debate?
girls. Nice we've met. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my comment would be uh, seeing these two bright minds uh, corresponding with them. My comment would be that they have done extraordinary job. In this 30 minutes, you have shown us what the system and um, I dare to say not so bright minds are thinking on the real life podiums and they haven't thought it out the way you have. And they haven't reasoned it out the way you have. It is really, really excellent work that you've done and excellent line of reasoning. It appears truly that if you start from the single position of whether only paramedics or only doctors, there can be, there can be some dichotomy, there can be, there can be, there can be something that can be improved. But ultimately, uh, you might remember two weeks ago, I told you I'll send you a voice reasoning, and I deliberately did not want to send them what I thought because I want them to swim and to think for themselves. And now you have totally blown me away because you echoed my, my thoughts. This is the actual sort of the holy grail two-tier system. The fact is that, as you said, uh, pro-paramedic, the vast majority of patients that we transport don't need specific, uh, specific physician knowledge or rather the skills of paramedics or ENTs are basic enough, good enough. Whether, on the other hand, you appropriately point out that physicians can, can add value, of course, if in um, correct circumstance or, whether, or rather if the need and circumstance is really, uh, is really acknowledged and understood. But then the system has to be organized in a way that it can tailor dispatching any given team to the, and tailor it to the need. So some patients might really not need a physician, and that's okay, and physicians have to be okay with that, and they have to understand that if we staff all pre-hospital crews with physicians, it costs money, and money spent somewhere, resource spent somewhere that is not needed, or rather that is not exploited to its full, full capability, is resource taken away from something else, which might be more crucial. So there is no going around the fact that actually in this two-tier two -tier system, there is a third component, and that is dispatching system, where calls are received, analyzed, and then decision made who goes and who transports the patient based on this history. So yes, in conclusion, I think we do need large number of paramedic staffed ambulances and we also need physician staffed crew backup for those cases that really are sort of beyond everyday skills and knowledge base. And also these physicians have to know where you went back to the experience, who works in pre-hospital arena. These physicians have to be, I would say, cavalry, okay? This cannot be an average intern put away and now you go and do and learn medicine. This cannot be. If we put a doctor in, then we have to put someone who has experiences, who is based in hospital emergency systems, either emergency physicians proper, or in Germany have anesthesia, some critical care physician, because if you have a problem half an hour away from Ljubljana, no one can help you, only you, yourself, your confidence, your skills, and a bit of luck. And you are on your own, and you better know your shit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. 
I concur with the uh, with the opinion, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. But is that possible in a country like Slovenia? Because it's the rural parts are far away from the big medical centers. For example, if you have an emergency that needs a physician's attention, can you send a physician from a hospital? Because probably then in this, in this system, the physicians would be, uh, would be hospital based. So probably it takes so much time to get to the patient, if that's a real rural area, that you have to have a physician in a local community healthcare center. And that is the system we do have, and that's the system that lacks. I mean, it's not, it's not perfect. Yes. How can you say, how can you do that, that you have a physician on site within that 10, 15 minutes? I understand. Well, I think the crux of the problem and the solution of the problem is looking the other way around. It's not the question. The question is not, does a physician or this pathophysiologic state of a, of a, uh, of a um, patient, the question is not, does a patient need a physician or a paramedic? The question is, what does his state of health need? What procedure or what immediate medications? And you have to understand, in critical care, in, in, uh, in uh, dealing with undifferentiated patients, there are algorithmic parts of parts of thought and parts of dealing with it. There are procedures, there's ABCs, there's primary, secondary exam. Things, even inclusion of ultrasound, are al algorithmicized. They are already put in place, predefined, pre-taught. People that conduct these procedures, they have to know about it and they have to be skilled in it. And it's not the matter of who can do it or who legally is allowed to do it, but who is capable to deliver it quickly and appropriately. And now you have to understand, the added value of physician, someone who has gone to medical school for six years, understood Starling and capillary in and out and social medicine and psychiatry. When any decision tree is being spread this is where physician comes in. But in the very beginnings of critical care in pre-hospital arena, in dealing with undifferentiated patient, even in cardiac arrest, things are fairly simple and they are fairly linear. You know? Pads on, check rhythm, defib, two minutes, adrenaline, ta -da -da. There's nothing new. There's no, there's no mystery. There must be no mystery. The added value of physician is to choose between amiodaron or procainamide. You know, this is where your 15 years of training comes in, not in following algorithms. So I would say we need a base where whenever anything happens, the system will be activated and proper safe uh, procedures will be followed. And in meantime, and this takes time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So defibrillation, basic ALS, uh, hemorrhage control. These things are messy. These things need not 15 years of postgraduate understanding. They need skills. They have to be done. And then when we decide between Ringer or normal saline or Voluven, that's high science. And that can be done later on. And thinking of that we would need a physician firsthand outside, we are losing time. We are losing time in simple procedures. Critical care, especially in pre-hospital arena, is about doing basics right. It's not about ringer versus normal saline. This is ICU problem later on in days. But if I, I can only give a liter or two, it doesn't really matter. But it's doing basics right. It's checking airway. It's checking saturation, it's checking sugar, it's doing two lines, two lines correctly, doing a proper physical exam, not missing melanin. Things that are not sexy, but they have to be done. So think about critical care in pre-hospital arena as uh, whenever airplane takes off, 
The standard operating procedures in the airline industry is very systematic, is checklisted. This is what patient needs. No pulse, massage. No oxygen, saturation first. Preparation for airway. And this can be done even without doctors. But for certain skills, and most importantly, for certain decisions, this is where physician comes into play. Another thing, and if you imagine, this is not a question actually in Slovenia. It's a question in Canada, in, maybe in Croatia, I would guess, in some well, a bit when they have to transfer. Australia, where transfer times are hours. This is where then you have to think, do I transfer this patient from Cairns into Perth, 2,000 miles away, to PCI? Or do I give them lytics there? Or do I give them no lytics, because there's no question, or do I transfer this to secondary hospital 500 kilometers away? This is where you need to think, to gather information. But in our transfer times inside, it would be more appropriate and safer that whoever falls down gets proper BLS first, and then we add second layer. And sometimes in our system, we have to be honest, there's discrepancy. There's sometimes we get tertiary care straight away, and sometimes there is a very bad lack of any care. And this is how we have to think when we build the system. First layer, layer of basics first, being laid everywhere, from Lendava to Isula. Whenever it happens, someone comes there, gives you oxygen, starts massage, starts AED. And then doctor will come. And this is very important to understand because training them has to be in this way. And then the simple question of which doctor should be in the ambulance is gone. Doctor that is specialist in critical care. That's it. This cannot be someone who does it for hobby. And this is the problem. In many such systems today, in Slovenia and Croatia, it's done as for a hobby. Someone does it because yeah, it brings some money. You can do it fairly simply. But if it's so simple that you can do it as a hobby, then why paramedic wouldn't do it for half price? Simple as that. OK? I hope you have answered. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions more? Okay. Thank you for excellent debate. That was Maria and Dora from Croatia. Thank you. And now we have a second debate from this session. Um, uh, with this stethoscope has lost its traditional role in modern medicine. Um, I kindly invite two debaters to come. These are uh, Mateusz Zakariuski from uh, Croatia and Alexandra, you know, uh, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh, Poland and Alexandra Ivanovic from, uh -huh, Poland from Poland. Poland. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everybody. Uh, we are students from Poland, Mateusz Zakrzewski and Alexandra Ivanovic. And uh, it's our pleasure to start the debate titled, titled, Which button? The big green one? Oh, this is the pointer. Um, it's my pleasure to start the debate titled Stethoscope has lost its traditional role in modern medicine, supervised by Professor Peter Ratzel. So to start with, to start with, I would like to show you a brief history of auscultation. As you can see in the picture of the incised relief of the wall of Temple of Komombo, there is an image which present, is presenting the medical instruments. So the question which is appearing is, uh, could the tube in the lower left corner of the relief between the capping vessels and shares can be 
uh, used as a hearing device called stethoscope. Many of the medical students were wondering how the auscultation began. So the most popular answer was with Hippocrates. But as we can see, it's not correct. So let's begin our journey through time. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, discussed a procedure for shaking a patient by shoulders and listening the sound evoked by the chest. He also used a method of applying the ear directly to the chest of the patients. Over centuries, method of applying the ear directly to the chest was used. But it was very hard to hear properly if the patient was overweight. This way of auscultation has also some other tricky and convenient sides. There was a problem of embarrassment, what to do if the patient was a young woman. So doctors tried to <coughs> separate themselves from the patient with the tissue. But you can think that the, mm, that the problem, that the thing which, um, that the problem, that the motivation for Lenek, the inventor of the stethoscope, was the improving of the art of medicine. But it was the problem of embarrassment, of placing the ear against the woman, woman's chest. So he tried to do something. And he thought of a followed out plank of wood might do the trick. To his amazement, this device improved acoustically and allowed him to hear the lung and the heart sounds. That was the Lenex stethoscope. His device soon gained rapid popularity across France and the rest of Europe. Over the next several years, inverters tried to improve the Lenex original design by developing the stethoscope out of other materials. Soon it became a st um, symbol of status among European physicians. Those who had a stethoscope made of exotic material, such as ivory in the middle, claimed the top rank um, in the medical social ladder. The next major development in the stethoscope gave a physician Marsh, who theorized that using both ears would improve the auscultation by eliminating outside noise. It was in 1859. Over the next 150 years, the bind hour stethoscope was changing. Steel tubes were replaced with rubber to improve flexibility, and the chest pieces have a bell and a diaphragm. As you could see on the previous slides, that uh, stethoscopes was, uh, were uh, widely used, but nowadays the impact of modern uh, electronic uh, devices tells us that we don't uh, uh, we don't. Uh, have to use this uh, plastic tube anymore. Um, but according to your history, what is the traditional role of stethoscope now? So now we can use the traditional stethoscope to listen to the heart murmurs and irregular heartbeats or the likelihood of the heart failure. Also, you can listen to the lungs. You can see if there is any fluid or if the airway passages are constricted. You can listen to the movement of bowels in the cases of digestive disorders and malfunction in the bowels. You can listen to the flow of the blood. And also, pediatricians use it to hear the heartbeats of the fetuses inside of the pregnant woman. Yes, but there are more advanced uh, pro procedures that uh, we can use. And they are also cheap, and they show us more because we can take a look into uh, for example, x-rays or a CT scan and treat malign tumors before it spreads and identify cracks, infectious um, injuries and um, other identifying bone cancers or just help locating uh, foreign objects in, inside our body, which you cannot do with stethoscope, right? And then CT scan is more developed. X-ray is painless, non-invasive uh, procedure. Um, we can easily detect any pathology of the head. Uh, what's more, um, we can provide um, 
needle biopsies. But you have to remember that X-ray and CT scan has a lot of disadvantages. Both of them are not recommended for pregnant women. X-rays make our blood cells to have higher level of hydrogen peroxide, which could cause cell damage, and also is able to change the base of the DNA, causing a mutation. There is also a high risk of getting a cancer using X-ray and CT scan. Moreover, the dye used in CT is iodine-based and is often a cause of allergy and also can lead to the kidney failure in individuals with diabetes. So, in my opinion, the stethoscope can be used to diagnose heart problems with very accurate results. Okay, but what would you say about ECG or spirometry? ECG is much better um, and than stethoscope for heart diseases. It's non-invasive, safe, inexpensive, and very easy to perform. Um, and the necessary e equipment is widely available even in the rural ar area. Uh, it can detect the chest pain, the discomfort, shortness of breath, weakness, anxiety, abdominal pain, any silent cardiac conditions which you cannot hear in the stethoscope. And spirometry is uh, inexpensive and easy to perform as well as ECG. And um, it can be the key to and identification of many um, pulmonary diseases like COPD or uh, restrictive uh, diseases, asthma. It can be easily used for the monitoring of the treatment. In the practice medicine, ECG and spirometry are not a part of the first line examination. They involve money, time, time of the specialists, and also professional devices. But the stethoscope is a painless, cheap, fast, easy, one specialist professional device, which in good hands specializes in more work than other electrical devices. The simple stethoscope has the great advantage of versatility. So the physician and also the medical students need all around device that is very convenient and easy to use. And also, what is extremely important, they need a device which can be used immediately to check breathing, heart, and other abnormalities in the patient. So the point is that the stethoscope it will not become obsolete anytime soon. The stethoscope is a multifunction equipment which is simply irreplaceable. The word stethoscope has the part scope, which means that the device is uh, looking at something, but, but in fact we are not looking but just hearing. Uh, nowadays we can really see by using handheld ultrasound device. Thanks to this um, device we do, we do not have to he hesitate the time. And um, for the to procedure uh, him for the further examination in the different world, we just can um, come to him and uh, do it the USG on uh, bedside. Moreover, uh, we can see every part of human body, such as joints, bones, bones, and not only hearing the voice of lung and heart. But the one thing stopping the ultrasound device is price. It's hesitating between 8,000 to 10,000. And acoustic stethoscope is something about $25 to $150. Also, the ultrasound device cannot hear wraps of the covering of the heart, um, changing heart murmurs and the hallmark of certain diseases cannot hear lung sounds or the sounds of the intestine. Also, the use of this ultrasound device require extra training to the doctors, means extra time and extra specialists. We, doctors, we have to learn how to interpret the images of the ultrasound, what is not so popular nowadays. Okay, so what do you say about electronic stethoscopes? Nowadays, the Mobile technology has improved our life. Everybody has uh, smartphones. So with the new stethoscopes, you can record the voice and transfer via Bluetooth uh, on the computer. 
then you can send it via email to specialists um, if you are not 100% sure of these diseases. And moreover, you can repeat the record as many times as you want. And during the examination, it's also possible um, to change the volume if you work in a big city hospital and there is very crowded or noisy place. Um, you can also record these sounds and teach students that everybody can listen. Um, that's a very good point. What do you think? Electronic stethoscopes have numerous problems that are commonly associated with typical electronic equipment. One of the most dangerous issues is that they require batteries. Not every doctor will remember to carry batteries in the pocket. Also, the, another problem is of um, electronic stethoscope can be interference from other electronic devices nearby, which are quite popular in the hospital, as we know. Price also is really high. It's $600. Also, in the addition, for those of us who understand the music of cardiovascular sound, the stethoscope will be useful. Do you think... Um the, in the future, people will be able to, to monitor their health with their smartphones. Because um, I saw on the Apple side that you can buy a glucometer or a pulse oximeter, which is plugged into the mobile phone. So there is a possibility to combine a smartphone, smartphone uh, with ECG or sphingomanometer as well. These devices will economize and minimize doctors' time, and maybe in the future we won't need as many doctors as we need today. This description sounds great, but there are some bad sides involving the patient safety. I mean, most physicians will use their own personal smartphones, and they would fast be collecting and storing potentially personality data on their phones. Also, you are dependable on to the network connection and to the electricity because you have to dis uh, the, the smartphones can easily discharge. Also, smartphones are not able to recognize less common diseases. But do you think that smartphone can substitute doctor's overall view of the patient? What about the smartphone and the emergency situation? Also, auscultation is the time when the examiner invades the patient's intimate space and touches patient in a caring but professional manner. Most patients appreciate this time of relationship building in which trust and confidence are established. Patients often forget components of the interview but usually remember an examiner's proper use of touch and careful examination. Okay, just a few words about hygiene. Um, as everybody knows that uh, the main vector of bacteria in hospital are doctor's hand. But the new researches show that uh, stethoscopes tend to be more contaminated than the palms of physician hands. So it's very important because we can transmit uh, bacteria uh, from one patient to another and especially in pulmonary di diseases where and uh, the stethoscopes are mostly used, uh, you can transfer the bacteria which are very opportunistic. Also, there are no official guidelines that tell doctors how often they should clean their stethoscopes. But sterilizing a stethoscope after each patient is recommended, but few doctors do so. Physicians often forget to clean their hands quite frequently, even in the best place. So why it should be different in handheld ultrasound or electronic stethoscope? We have to remember that not only hands, but also stethoscope and clapping of a doctor is contaminated. Recently, the studies didn't demonstrate that patients actually got sick from cross-contamination, but the potential is certain there. I would like to end our debate with the quotation before preparing to improve the world, first look around your own home three times. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, mentor Peter Rachel if he has any comments.
about the debate. Yes, thank you very much. I have a few comments, maybe just uh, to explain why I decided to suggest such, such a topic. Um, once one of the students in the sixth year of training asked me, uh, well, if I understand correctly, if you have an electronic stethoscope, you just put it on the chest and it says aortic stenosis. Uh, of course, uh, at the beginning it's funny, but then at the end, we realize that majority of students and young physicians don't know how to use their stethoscopes. Of course, the explanation is probably because we have better imaging tools to, to discover many diseases. We have chest x-rays that show us, of course, more of the lung pathology than just the stethoscope. We have echocardiography that shows us more in details how the heart functions. But it's in diagnostic, it's, it's probably like in, in medicine altogether. We have Professor Fras here, uh, who is a, a physician uh, specialist in internal medicine and in cardiology, and he will know how it is. If you have a, a physician that, is, that has knowledge in whole internal medicine, majority of patients that come to the hospital are old people that have heart failure, usually there is some inflammation like pneumonia that is causing deterioration of heart failure. They have chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and so on. And if you have a physician that is skilled in treating all these diseases, of course the patient's outcome will be good. If you put such a patient in a very specialized pulmonary department, they will take care of his pneumonia very well. Heart failure Maybe they won't treat it perfectly. Maybe they won't treat diabetes at all. So it's pretty much similar in, in diagnostics in medicine. If you get a patient and you don't have a stethoscope, to exclude pneumothorax, you have to do a chest x-ray. To exclude asthma, you have to do lung function test. If you want to exclude aortic stenosis, you have to do echocardiography. And if you, have to, if you want to, to, to prove that there is bowel movement, you have to do at least uh, abdominal x-ray and probably also ultrasound together. If you do all these procedures, just to examine one patient, it'll take you about an hour or two if you have all the, the diagnostic tools available, of course. But if, you don't, if we don't use stethoscope regularly and if we don't know how to use it, then of course it's a waste of time. If we have it just in the pocket and if you use it once per week, we won't be able to hear the compensation in the lungs. That doesn't mean if you don't hear it that, that, that it isn't there. It's just that our brains are not capable of, of hearing those uh, quiet sounds in the lungs. So uh, in a way, stethoscope is becoming a useless tool, not because it's useless by itself, but because we don't know how to use it and how to use all the, all the, the, the information that stethoscope, stethoscope can give us. And if we always rely on better imaging techniques, then sooner or later we will miss some details that a stethoscope and a physical examination, proper physical examination can give us. That's my opinion. So stethoscope, for my opinion, hasn't lost its role, especially not in general practice in emergency medicine or in critical care. Maybe it's, it, it lost its role in dermatology or in, in, in eye clinics or maybe some, some uh, surgical departments where people or physicians don't use it often and that means that they, they don't know how to use it anymore. But in, in general in medicine it, I think it hasn't lost its, its role. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, hello. Um, so because um, Peter just challenged me, uh, I would not like to be understood as old-fashioned physician because I'm not, and I still feel like you. So I don't feel myself uh, 40 years older, but look, think about having a fully and modern equipped house. How much you depend on electricity or external sources of energy pretty much do you agree 
But when uh, times come that it's not possible to have these external sources, what do you do? During the winter with minus 30 degrees, what do you do? Oh, you take some pieces of wood and you make your fire. Is it so? So don't forget to have a stethoscope every day, not only in your pocket, but please uh, remember what I'm going to say to you. When I came for the first time to the clinic, it was in the early 80s uh, as a student, they taught me that every patient, every day, at the round during, during uh, the day, should be auscultated every day, at least for a few seconds. Do remember. Thank you. Any questions? I have a comment, not a question. Uh, for example, for the uh, stethoscope, stethoscope is not only indicated or used for cardiology, as uh, we have already seen, but also for pneumology. And I think we don't need an overdeveloped uh, stethoscope to see, uh, for, for example, a patient who is coming for uh, an asthma crisis. And uh, we need to check first if he's having murmur or not. And we don't need a developed uh, stethoscope to see, for example, if he needs uh, uh, to be uh, to to make intubation for him to get intubated or not. And also for the follow-up of the patients uh, after giving him the treatment and uh, the beta mimetic or uh, the corticoids, we have to see if uh, he get, if he's getting uh, better or not. And I don't think that. Uh, uh, with uh, this uh, stethoscope, they can evaluate better than the doctor uh, the evolution of uh, his breathing uh, state. So that was my comment about uh, that point. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Okay. Okay. So thank you for the excellent debate. Um, um, Alexander and uh, Anna. So thank you very much for taking your time to listen maybe something what's uh, not very typical or classical for medical uh, classes uh, and um, I'm, I'm happy and actually honored that uh, my young colleagues actually accepted the idea of having, having something, uh, I would say, not so typical for the evidence-based medicine and what your debates actually uh, go for during this meeting. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, a bit about the future and uh, I think most of you actually tackled somehow the issues which I, I'm going to show but maybe you are not uh, so much uh, I would say informed that most of these techniques, uh, technologies uh, and innovations uh, are already in use. Uh, not in routine clinical practice in many cases, but a part as a research tool and in uh, 
some very advanced clinics actually they are already in practice but indeed uh, uh, probably you've asked yourself why the topic of my talk is atypical and um, maybe it's not easy to understand it uh, so I, I, I will ask you who of you read the the uh, work of Douglas Adams, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Okay, so like one third. Uh, I, I have to tell you that uh, during my early times at the university or, yeah, during that times, this was like a cult work. So actually, all the students read this and tried to somehow follow the instructions and the ideas and philosophy of the work. And uh, those of you who read that, you would remember the ultimate answer to everything, which is 42. Anybody has any idea on what 42 means? No, as I said, this is the ultimate answer to everything. So, I would like to recommend to you to, after this meeting, if uh, you would be somehow attracted with the team, go to the web and please uh, put into Google 42, Douglas Adams and uh, whatever, ultimate question, answer, and go through the hits. And I would like to point you to one particular work which is much, much older than Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy, which is Alice in the Wonderland. And connect 42 with Alice in the Wonderland and Hitchhiker's Guide and my talk. And then maybe next year when here will be another meeting, we can debate a bit more. So, speaking about the future, it's not only about the ultimate question to universe or to the question of everything, but indeed uh, of the awareness that it's not just to foresee the future uh, because it's always uh, depending on our interpretation, but really to enable the future. Uh, this uh, quote was uh, written by a famous writer, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, which is more known about the little prince. Probably you've read this too. This is another cult work which we read in late 70s. And uh, put this somehow into the context, the 42 and the ultimate question and answer. Uh, it's really important uh, to know whenever tackle any kind of a problem and because we are uh, physicians, or nearly physicians. So whenever you tackle the patient, please don't forget really to put right question. This is the most important. If you just ask yourself whatever, whether I can perform this or another techniques, this or another investigation, as uh, Peter Achel uh, said before, uh, then, of course, uh, you are not rational and at the end of the day you are not ethical, what we are going to debate in the debate after this talk. So please remember, putting the right question is uh, the major part to having the right answer. So, this Hitchhiker's Guide is uh, published in many editions uh, so, as I said, I'm going to speak a bit on the future of medicine because it was always interesting to me and not only to me, even many centuries ago, uh, famous people asked themselves on what's really useful to do. So, which seeds to use to have uh, really ripe fruits? How to 
deal with uh, students, how to deal with young physicians, then to get the perfect and uh, people who would really give uh, their lives uh, with passion to patients. So, uh, looking into the future, there are many different forces uh, which are going to impact healthcare facilities. Besides uh, some factors which actually um, really very much influence uh, the healthcare in different settings, there are also important changes to healthcare delivery systems. So, I'll speak a bit about philosophical changes to practice of medicine, but what is really attractive to you are innovations, changing techniques, new technologies, and this will be the core. Later at the end, I will uh, reflect a bit uh, the issue of competence based education and training because this is very much related to the ethical part which we are going to discuss together with students. So speaking about the philosophical changes to practice of medicine, I hope that you are aware that the emphasis uh, on elimination of disease rather than cure is really growing. So the future physician is going to be the person who is going to preserve health, not to cure disease. This is very much on our agenda for the future. You face the increased demand for evidence-based medical care, so all the guidelines, recommendations, all your actions in everyday clinical practice actually based on evidence. Is it true? More and more, hopefully. And indeed, uh, there are ethical issues and the communications issues uh, on patients which coming in front of our interest. There are many, many debates and discussions about medical errors, about information to patients, etc. We do face this every day and just now, probably for our students, there is no necessity to remind you on just present case of little Rene boy uh, where the whole, the whole society is debating on how to treat a small child. Speaking about innovations, uh, actually there are many different innovations on the way and somehow already in use from smart drugs, nutraceuticals, new vaccines. As I said before, it could be that we are going to vaccine against every single disease. Do you believe it? Personally, I don't, or probably I'll be retired at that time. Then what we do face and what we actually uh, teach in medical schools and students learn is genomics. And genomics is going to get more and more interest not only genomics in typical way of presentation, but also in uh, other uh, areas of medicine, like creating or artificially producing organs. So there is no need, because you know more than I do, because I know the curve of forgetting. Uh, on uh, genetics, uh, just to remind you, that it's not a very new story, it's quite old already, it's more than 60 years uh, when DNA was discovered. But uh, the techniques by which actually we have an insight into our genetic material actually developed during the past 10 years. And uh, in general, we divide uh, the clinical use techniques into two types. So into single nucleotide polymorphisms mainly and the whole genome sequencing. One very important issue which has very much 
in common with our everyday practice is a clinical challenge on how actually to individualize the treatment. Like to whom uh, of our patients give which drug with hope of success. And we always say that the way to personalize medicine is one of the real challenges for the present physicians and the future ones. So here you have the, the model on how actually we should think in the future. So for some patients, some treatments is of more use than for others. And I'll try to put this into context with two examples. Uh, because I'm coming from uh, cardiology, I will put two examples from uh, very widely used uh, cardiovascular drugs, namely statins and uh, ACE inhibitors. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll ask you whether you knew about these two examples, because they are very, very important for the current practice. Speaking about statins, probably you've heard that Many different studies showed that treating patients with statins, you can reduce the cardiovascular risk so for having new events or having, uh, uh, having uh, repeated events in patients by some 30 to 40 percent. So if the mortality after the heart attack is, I would say, 10 percent on average, by using statins, you can reduce this to 6%. So you can reduce relatively the risk by 40%. But there is still a huge so-called residual risk which stays with these patients. If you stratify uh, or characterize these patients by some genomic techniques, so by studying certain SNAPs, or even whole genome sequencing, you can do this more right or more properly. There are many different uh, articles which were published on this. I will show you just one single nucleotide polymorphism. And it goes for this molecule, which is called kinesin-like protein 6, which is very much related to the risk of coronary heart disease. And if you do have the variant of 719 on the position 719 of the, this, do, uh, this uh, uh, gene, tryptophan versus arginine, so if you have arginine on this place, then you are at higher risk. And it's, it's known. So this was discovered already 20 years ago. And it's very much known that by in many different studies uh, where they tested this, uh, it was confirmed. But it, it was not known until uh, recently that by having this variant of gene, you can get much more profit of the treatment by statins than if you don't. For example, in the study care, so here is the absolute risk reduction by how, how, how many percent the risk uh, is decreased by treatment with pravastatin, you can see that the difference is significant, so highly significant. Carriers of this risk allele received significant benefit of treatment. Then it was the same shown in study voscops. The difference was even greater. Uh, and uh, by having this in mind, uh, you can think, look, if I do treat non-carrier with the statin, I do not get any profit. So is it worth to treat it? No, it's not. But do we do this in clinical practice? No. We just treat everybody. Because this is in the interest of pharmaceutical industry to treat everybody in population with certain drug. And out of this, you can, of course, calculate some very important uh, numbers. 
probably you've heard about the number needed to treat, which means the number of patients uh, which you have to treat to prevent one event or one death. And it's significantly different for those who carry this variant uh, comparing with those who don't carry. It, it was the same shown uh, for, for other studies, uh, like in study PROSPER, just as an example. And even in case of the study where we used two different drugs, so one more potent and one less potent, a Torva statin versus Prava statin, it was shown that the benefit by using the drug in those who carry this variant is significant. In those who don't, there is no difference because the treatment is not needed. So who of you was aware of this? Nobody. Okay. So, one zero for me. Uh, now let's go on to another example I said for ACE inhibitors. You've heard that nearly every patient, every cardiac patient, should have prescribed ACE inhibitor. Is it true? So statins, ACE inhibitors, aspirin, and beta blockers, these are four basic drugs for cardiac patients. So ACE inhibitors. There was one project, one sub-study of the one big study called Euro Europe or Europa with perindopril, where they studied also genotypes. And this, what I'm going to show uh, are the results which I received from Professor Simons from Rotterdam, because in this forum, they were, they were not published yet. Take your judgment why they were not published, or what is probably the reason why they were not published. So the basics for this is that uh, there are different alleles in different receptors involved in the action in pharmacodynamics of ACE inhibitors. So mostly the AT1 receptors and bradykinin receptors are involved. And not to go too much into theory, you have either favorable or unfavorable unfavorable alleles in this sense. And uh, they, again, stratified patients according to these different alleles. And what they showed, what they found, they found that in 74% of patients where we have either no one or two unfavorable alleles, the therapy worked. But of course, with different level of success. So you see in those patients who had two unfavorable alleles, it was borderline significance of, of, uh, of benefit. But in one quarter, at least one quarter of patients, therapy didn't work, even worse. Therapy was harmful. Did you know this? No. So what this means, what we can conclude out of these two examples, that in the near future, we are going to assess the risk of patients not only by having this or another risk factor, but also by having this or another genetic variant, not only as a matter of risk, but also as a matter of somehow foreseen, uh, foreseen uh, reaction on different treatments, not only pharmacolo pharmacological. The same was shown for clopidogrel. This is anti-aggregatory, anti-platelet treatment, which is another type of classical treatment for coronary patients. So again, by having different variants, in this case of, of, uh, of cytochrome P450 in, uh, in the liver, the reaction, so this means the availability of the active type of a drug is much different in those who don't have this variant. 
So let's be aware from philosophical point of view that every one of us actually carries the certain genotype, but there are many different factors which can influence that this genotype or this geno genetic risk will be actually seen in full manifestation. So whether we are going to, to develop the fully manifested disease or whether we are going to react on certain type of drugs. So this is first part. Uh, what is the ultimate uh, question? Uh, what is the ultimate answer? And if we do know the question, so the question is how best to treat our patient or how better to treat our patients. Every day we have to strive for better treatment. Now we can go to, to second step, which, which has something in common with sophistication because we, we are not going to speak only on survival or on inquiry, so what we would like to know, but we should speak a bit on sophistication. So if you read this, uh, because you quickly read, I'm, I'm sure, uh, this can be applied to really very trivial activities. There is no need to speak about the higher activities or medicine but even for everyday activities, when we ask ourselves how actually to perform our primary, uh, uh, primary issues, you can use some kind of sophistication. Let's be aware. Speaking about the medicine in future, indeed, we are going to go towards personalized medicine. As I, as, I, as I actually announced. But what is personalized medicine? Is personalized medicine only genetics, genomics, pharmacogenetics? Or is personalized medicine uh, actually practiced by some of us already today? It is, probably. We are going to discuss this with students. That's why I said it could be that what we would like to have in the future, it's the way back to the future. Because how actually first physicians act? Do you remember Hippocratic Oath? Can you imagine how physicians in old times actually worked? Do you know how old Chinese paid their doctors? Who knows? Do you know? Do you promise me to remember this for the rest of your life? Chinese paid their doctors uh, according to the number of people who were healthy. So they received their whole annual salary if nobody actually get ill. Can you imagine this? So if you preserve the health of your population, you, you are going to be paid fully. So it's much opposite than what we face today. So physicians actually would like to repeat investigations, treatments, because they are paid per service. More you do with your hands, this is valued, you are paid. We should change this philosophy in the future. So think about it. Let's go on. Speaking about genes, and with this I will, I will actually uh, 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 finish this part. In the future, indeed, I foresee this, that we are going to have our personal card with the whole genome sequenced. And you are going to put this into the computer, and the computer will act according to the expert system there and there will be no need to think about all these studies but the expert system will tell you which treatment in which dose 
is probably the best for your patient. But do remember that there is a high residual risk. Even with the best treatment, we cannot preserve health which is distorted. So think about, think about preservation of health. Why? Not only because of us doctors, but also because of patients. Because having different issues related to gene sequencing actually put on debate in the society, it's probably not the case that we are going to face these personal cards in two, three or five years, despite this would be possible. And personally, I hope that we as a society are going to be strong enough somehow to resist this. On the other hand, you see, you probably know about this case, sudden cardiac death. If this player would know about his risk, genetic risk, it could be that he would not die. So we should always weigh benefits and harms on this. Of course, uh, there are some attempts to uh, actually practice already gene therapy. There was one very well known where they, they somehow exchanged the gene for LDL receptor in the liver for familiar hypercholesterolemia, but this treatment failed. So gene therapy at the moment is not something what we do practice wherever. Another very interesting new technology is tissue engineering. You've heard about this? But for very simple, uh, uh, simple stuff like cells, etc., maybe bone. <laughs> what I'm going to show you is uh, one recent technique which actually is uh, very, very promising. I hope that the video will work. Uh, so here is the example on how they actually produce in the lab the vessels. Oh, sorry. How can I do? Okay. Can somebody help me? Okay. Yes. Who is doing this? So you see that uh, <clears throat> after, after they produce the vessel with the cells printed on the scaffold, they somehow condition this. This is very simple technology. They use uh, such simple printer, and they already use it to produce artificial heart. So you see after a few hours of having these cells printed, the heart can be produced. And here is another example. It's biological valve. It's not, it's not uh, the valve from animals, but it is produced from human cells. And you see how it functions in the laboratory. So in the near future, we are going to use engineered tissues. So this is something what, what, what's really challenging. But don't forget our first aim and first mission is to preserve health, not to cure. So, of course, there are uh, many innovations on which we do read this uh, <clears throat> during these times. Some of those um, actually we used already uh, in our practice, as I said. As for example, uh, smaller and smaller pacemakers. And you see, uh, probably in 2015, we are going to use leadless pacemaker, external pacemaker. And just to show you how small it is, it is, of course, American dime. You know that 10 cents, this is very, very small 
small coin. So such pacemakers we are going to implant. Even at the moment we are very advanced with that. Uh, so I can show you also some innovations in the field of interventional cardiology like different types of drug eluting stents where uh, current technology is dealing with uh, sophisticated methods on putting drugs on the surface of such stents. Uh, but probably it's not so much interesting to you. Maybe you've heard about the catheter-based techniques to treat hypertension. These techniques were very much promising because uh, the first results actually show that nearly every patient with essential hypertension can be treated by ablation of this nervous system uh, which is around in the sheet of the uh, renal artery but and these studies actually showed very promising results you see <clears throat> uh, the, the change of blood pressure which is really significant. But new studies, so studies with longer follow-up, actually are not anymore so much promising. So these techniques probably won't work really for all patients. Yes, for some, but not for all. Of course, we have to uh, tackle somehow changing technology uh, also in uh, delivery systems like telemedicine, like robotic medicine, uh, probably some of you will be involved in this. But uh, what I would like to show you is that technology can help us also on remote control of patients. And this is more and more in use because for patients, <clears throat> this is much better than to come every, every other week maybe for control uh, to the outpatient's clinics or to the clinics. So we can somehow foresee the physician of the future as the one uh, speaking uh, to the patient through Skype or whatever, through mobile phone. This is really possible. And again, coming back to Douglas Adams, in his work, Mostly Harmless, actually he tackled the, the future role of computers. And in medicine, this is very much applicable. So to summarize, on the future of medicine, what we are going to face are really major and significant changes. So I hope that at least for a part, I'll be part of it. And uh, this is what uh, I had to tell you. I think that uh, the second part I will skip because we are all hungry and my two young colleagues will tell most of what was in my second part. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this really, really interesting lecture. You gave us a lot of points that uh, we'll definitely think about. Um, I suggest that we start with the next lecture, next debate. Striving for biomedical excellence. Are we paying a price of ethics, communication, and humanity of medicine? I would invite pro speaker Maria Ionowska from the medical faculty Skopje Macedonia and the contra speaker David Verhovitz from the medical faculty, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues, dear professors. I'm Maria. My name is David. And today we're going to present our topic, as Alexander already said before. Uh, this topic is mainly about ethics, humanity, and communication of medicine. So from, if we go to the beginning, we, need to, we needed to make like a framework for our topic because it is really, really wide and really abstract. So we decided to go to the word professionalism, since professionalism 
um, as we thought of it, encompasses all the three aspects in our, uh, in our title, which is ethics, humanity, and communication of the doctor towards the patient. And on the other hand, professionalism also means the clinical and theoretical, theoretical expertise, uh, which of course are, I mean, from my side, they mean the basis for the biomedical um, excellence, the biomedical development. And if we look at medicine, it has been seen as a profession for centuries. And historically, we had a lot of oaths and codes of ethics that were prescribed for, for the uh, medical physicians. Uh, and we, we maybe in the past, or maybe we just didn't have data, we never really saw the breaches of these uh, codes and uh, oaths. But recently, we can see maybe the real breaches or just perceived breaches of professionalism in medicine and of the ethics in medicine. So, nowadays, you know, this is economically development society. So, we see everything through money, through economy. And yes, if we go to a shop, the seller represents his product fairly and us as buyers, of course, we know everything about the product before buy it. But is that so in medicine? When a patient comes to us, comes to a doctor, the doctor is really specialized and has highly knowledge of what he does and has skills. But what about the patient? The patient does not know anything. So he's just the vulnerable. He trusts the physician and he trusts that the physician is acting in, is in his behalf. So for the patient, the doctor is like God that he has to listen. <coughs> When we asked individual, individuals what is professionalism, they just didn't know the definition. They just said, well, I know it when I see it. So they gave us descriptions of what professionalism is rather than a specific definitions. But these guys here in black ties, the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American College of Physicians, and the Federation of Internal Medicine has, have three ethic principles and ten commitments and attributes of professionalism. So which are those? These fundamental principles um, have something in common, and that's the welfare of the patient, the patient's autonomy, and the social ju uh, justice. And about the doctors, which are professional responsibilities of a doctor. Those are professional competence, when, which I'm sure you'll all agree. When we go to medical faculty, one of the first things we learn is that we have to be competent. But also, we have to have some other qualities, which is honesty with the patient, confidential, maintaining appropriate relations with our patients, and every day, every day improve it, improving, improving quality of care, the assess of care, and commitment to knowledge, learning all the time. Yes, but if we go to the basis, we found a framework made by Arnold and Stern, uh, the framework, framework of professionalism. So as we can see, the general basis of basis of professionalism are the clinical, clinical competences. And then we can see uh, it goes forward to communication skills, to ethical and legal understanding. And then uh, on the top, professionalism is supported by the four pillars, excellence, humanism, uh, accountability, and altruism. But I have to emphasize that the basis is the clinical competence. Mm, we shall see about that. Okay, so uh, this is my friend Marco. Marco is just one of the best surgeons in the hospital. So he loves performing surgery and he bounces into the hospital every day with a huge smile on his face. He's full of energy, he's just in love with his profession and he's really good at what he does. But when it comes to communicating with patients, that's just another story. Um, he just doesn't know how to get on with patients. He doesn't know how to communicate. He thinks that patients are like doctors and that they understand everything. So he once told an ex-marine diabetic patient without explaining anything, uh, okay, sir, I have to cut your leg now. 
and I, I'm sure you can all imagine what was the reaction of the patient then. So, it's very important, very important for us like medical professions to know how to emphasize those other things rather than uh, clinical expertise. What is important is for us to be confident, to be empathetic, like show some love to patients, to be human, to be personal, to be direct to patients, to be very thorough at what are we going to do, what is the, prof the procedure that we should undertake, and to be respectful. Yes, but on the other hand, we also have some expectations from the medical professional uh, society that expects us as maybe, uh, maybe now students, future physicians, uh, that we're of course altruistic, but we also need to be knowledgeable, skillful and dutiful because that is what the primary goal of, the primary basis of uh, a medical physician's knowledge is. Yes, but you can be knowledgeable as much as you want. If you don't know how to communicate with the patient, you, m you may misdiagnose many things. Do you know how many patients are misdiagnosed or just some diseases are not seen because lack of communication? So that's why professionalism is so important because professionalism is always associated with improved medical outcomes, better patient satisfaction, if my buddy Marco was really better with the patient, the patient would trust him. There would be more adherence with treatments. There will be more likelihood than the patient will stay with the same physician. There will be less patient complaints, less patient litigation. And on the other, on the other hand, unprofessional behavior is associated with only adverse medical outcomes, which are adverse events, more costs, more burn out in the hospital, more depression among uh, medical students, among doctors as well. So less employee morale and less productivity, less nurse satisfaction and less communication, less teamwork and efficiency. Uh, no, before this slide, I have a question for you. So what do you think? Do people, are people born with empathy or can empathy be learned? Who is for the first? Who thinks that people, some people are just born with empathy and some are just not? Please raise your hand. Okay, just one. <laughs> just one thinks that either you have this empathy or you don't, that's it. Okay, and who thinks that empathy can be learned? Wow, I'm surprised and delighted. Okay, so. Dr. Rice in Boston University um, uh, saw that people believe that either you are born with empathy or not. And then that's why she decided to uh, let a study and see that empathy can be taught and you can improve. So she decided to create a training. She, t uh, she took to uh, 100 doctors and they were evaluated by patients on daily basis work out. After that, 50 of the doctors went under training. This training was for recognizing nonverbal cues and facial expressions in patients. And the other 50 doctors were not trained at all. So what happened two months later? I guess you know. In those 50 doctors that were trained, there was significant improvement in their empathetic behavior. They interrupted patients less. They had more, more eye contact with the patients and they were able to man maintain every situation with a patient. So when p patients became angry, frustrated, or upset, they could diminish that situation straight away. And those 50 doctors that did not, go, did not uh, went the training, they were actually very worse at em empathizing with patients. Well, yes, I can see your point, but on the other hand, I also have a research, actually two researches. Uh, the first one uh, was published in the journal Neural Image, and it says that uh, the emotional, um, emotional regulation skills are critical for physicians since too much empathy, empathy affects the delivery of quality medical care. Uh, that means that the doctors, basically from the beginning, um, they've been repeatedly exposure to the suffering of others um, 
and uh, of course the suffering of others if they wouldn't adapt to it. It causes distress, it causes compassion fatigue, it causes burnout, which in turn all causes negative outcomes for the doctor and for the patient. And of course it leads to poor quality healthcare and to increased risk of medical errors. So we need to downregulate our empathy response. I'm not saying that there should be no empathy, that is not my point. I'm just saying that we need to downregulate down uh, our empathy response um, because then we can free up our cognitive resources to actually uh, complete the clinical tasks, which, which is what we have to do with the patient. Because we cannot do both things simultaneously 100%. We need to have this regulation to be you know, clinically a good doctor, to have good theoretical background, and to not be too involved with the patient. And on the other hand, I have another study uh, um, from a journal which uh, looked uh, for changes in the uh, brain blood flow by using fMRI. Uh, this research was made, the fMRI, fMRI was made on the doctors, and the doctors were, while being, uh, while being watched, they, uh, they were uh, watching the painful needle sticking to, uh, to the patients and the results were that the phys physicians did not show the early um, empathy response uh, that actually doctors are so good at empathy suppression that there was no early response to worry about since as the previous uh, journal also stated being too focused on the patient's pain being too connected to uh, him by empathy leads to ineffectiveness of the, of the doctor. So we need to, we need to suppress this uh, mindset uh, that we have to be always 100% humane, always 100% um, uh, empathic to our patient because as we said, it frees up um, information processing resources if we don't you know, clog our minds only with the emotional uh, aspect of the patient. So as I said before, um, we need to avoid emotional attachments because if we get too close to the patient, it causes problems. As we, as we saw in the uh, previous debate by our colleagues, for example, getting too close as a doctor, as a doctor's head to a patient, a woman patient's chest also causes problems. And it's the same in this in instance. We need to, we need to uh, not get as emotionally involved towards the patient because it leads us to making rash decisions uh, regarding the patient's treatment, which of course increases errors and of course increases hazards to the patient. So, as I understood, you imply that clinical expertise is really the most important thing, but that's it why is the we basis. go. Okay, that's why we go to medical faculty, so we become really good at our clinical knowledge. But you, you were the one that said that uh, with time, doctors tend to be less and less empathetic. So what about communication skills? What about humanity? What about showing some good love to the patient? Sometimes patients just need to be talked to. They need to be tackled. They, they need humanity. So. That is why professionalism can be really taught, can be learned. We, we can find role models outside the formal curriculum. We should just look in our clinics at the doctors that are really good with communicating patients in hospital hallways, in call rooms, in patient rooms. So we all know that we, if we learn something, if we attempt to master clinical topic, uh, they, uh, if we will master that subject if we undergo assessment after that because you know that we don't respect what is expected but we respect what is inspected we when we learn something for a test then we do learn it like it should be learned so that's why professionalism has to be taught and has to be learned because professionalism it cannot occur alone by chain by chance and Patients expect professionalism. On the other hand, medical professional societies expect it. It's associated with improved medical outcomes. 
it diminishes adverse medical outcomes, and that's why it should be assessed, can be taught, can be learned. Okay, yeah. I would like to say for our conclusion, um, I have a little, uh, a little quote from Dr. William Mayo that stated, as we grow in learning, we more justly appreciate our dependence upon each other and that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. Of course, I agree with this quote. That's why I would have to end this debate by also bowing down to Maria and her research and her proposal. Um, of course, I agree that we need, to, we need to be humane towards the patient. We need to have communication skills. We need to be empathetic. We need to be ethical since, you know, that all together with the clinical competences, with the theoretical knowledge of a physician leads to better, better uh, biochemical excellence, biomedical excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David and Maria. That was really great lecture. I mean, even though we're five minutes late, I think we still can have a few questions. So first, do we have question from the public? Yeah, please, Professor Fras. So, uh, I would just like to add as a moderator of this uh, Proet Contra, which is not really Proet Contra, because it was shown that uh, there are only different angles of uh, view or different aspects of this issue. Uh, I would just like to point that it is more and more present in both theory and practice of medical education and training, uh, the competence-based education and training, which means that basically uh, competence actually consists of three different issues. The first one, of course, knowledge, which is very, very much emphasized during medical school. From first year to the last less, because in the second part of medical, undergraduate medical school, there is more and more emphasis on skills. But to be honest, how much skills actually we gain during undergraduate medical studies? Do we? Or we just gather information, we are just informed. But still, after graduation, we have a, a, a title. We are doctors of medicine. What actually we know practically? Do we know much? No, in, indeed, because the medicine is, is so, so comprehensive, so huge, we have to train ourselves after the graduation, during postgraduate training. And there, there is more and more emphasis on skills, on apprenticeship model. So, and putting knowledge and skills together gives us a doctor who is skillful of operating patients, but telling the patient, look, I will have to cut your leg because it's, it's, it's useless. There is more and more uh, evidence that the third part of the competence, the full competence, is there, and this is what our two colleagues actually presented to you with the, I would say, on a kind of a conflict model, pro et contra. It's professionalism, and professionalism encompasses not only um, humanity, and uh, emotions and, uh, you know, positive feelings about the patient, but uh, it consists of postgraduate education. Because postgraduate education, it is not only to get more knowledge, it's also to get more skills for communication. And the greatest part of major uh, major cases in court coming from our clinics are related to miscommunication. So we have to be aware that in the era of growth of communication, so patients are flooded with uh, uh, internet information, we 
have to be able to communicate. And this is the core skill of professionalism. So um, this is one part, and of course, what I, what I didn't uh, mention so much is the, is the way of how uh, a physician or specialist, after all these years of education and training, can actually cope with these huge problems. Every day, if we would be aware of the comprehensiveness of every case, please trust me, we are not going to tackle any single patients anymore. So we have to forget, but we have to uh, have a skill on how to cope with problems. Probably you know some of your colleagues who were perfect in getting knowledge. I can, I can list you five of my colleagues during my studies who actually resigned from the study in the fourth or fifth year because it was not possible to be perfect anymore, to know everything what is written in the book. So we have to be aware of that and to know that medicine is not only book, so the knowledge, uh, not only the skill of being a good surgeon, but also to know uh, some other, other, other practical uh, skills. And the communication, remember, is the first one. J th those of you who, who don't study so much that you read also newspapers and watch TV from Slovenia, you are aware that the major cases during the last five years in Slovenia, which were in public, on court already, actually all were related to bad communication. So thank you. Well, I don't want to spare your free time during the lunch. lunch. So I would just say again, thank, uh, thank you, Professor Fras, thank you, David, and thank you, Maria. Both uh, lectures were really great. Um, before I give you one hour break, please, in your bags, you'll find the note to vote for the best uh, debate partner of the day. So please, during the day, put your vo vote and put it in a box over there. At the end of the first day, we'll uh, see who, uh, who, who get uh, the biggest number of the votes. And secondly, you'll find also the paper um, uh, with a question uh, for uh, Merck Manuel, and this is reserved for uh, passive participants. So uh, check if you can uh, answer it and put your paper in the box next to the white one. I'll see you at 2 p.m. Thank you very much.
kind introduction. Uh, let's start this postprandial session with uh, our inflammatory markers debate. Infectious diseases are still clinging at the top 10 leading causes of death worldwide. Uh, there are many diagnostic approaches to this type of disease, diseases and um, from taking patients' history to physical examination, sero serological tests, um, and genetic methods, for example. And besides all of them, one of the earliest diagnostic tools available today is uh, our inflammatory markers. We'll elaborate our debate around this topic. So to ease you into it, uh, let's first refresh the basics of inflammation, um, infectious, a body's response to infection. Okay, so what do we know about inflammation? Inflammation is a part of a complex biological response of vascular tissues to harmful stimuli, such as infections, pathogens, or dead cells. It is actually a protective mechanism trying to remove these harmful stimuli and to initiate the healing process. It is not a synonym for infection, even though the two are often correlated, the former usually being the result of the latter. The fact is that the words ending in the suffix itis are informally often described as referring to inflammation. Inflammation is a stereotyped response and is therefore a part of innate immunity as compared to adaptive immunity, which is specific for each pathogen. So it can be classified either as acute or chronic. Acute is the initial response of body to harmful stimuli and is in it achieved by increased movement of uh, plasma and leukocytes from the blood to the injured tissue. On the other hand, however, we have chronic, which, is, uh, which leads to a progressive shift in type of cells already present in the, at the site of inflammation and uh, is characterized by simultaneous destruction and healing of the tissue. There are five signs that clinically um, characterize the acute inflammation. First one is dolor, which means pain. Second one is calor, which means heat. Third one is rubor, which means redness. Fourth one is tumor, which means swelling. And the fifth one is functiolaisa, which means loss of function. The first four signs were described by Silsus 30 years before Christ. Um, and the fifth one was added by Virchow in the 19th century. All of these signs are apparent when acute inflammation occurs on the surface of the body, but not all of them will be apparent when it occurs on internal organs. Yeah, and hidden from the naked eye of an even more skillful physician, there are tiny cells and molecules together referred as inflammatory markers. These extra protein are often released from the site of inflammation and can be readily detected in the bloodstream. So detecting uh, these markers has two main functions. First is to detect acute inflammation and the second to be a marker of a treatment response. These markers include C-reactive protein, ESR, plasma viscosity, procalcitonin, and several other acute phase protein, uh, but let's focus only on the ones uh, used most commonly in our practice. So C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, and ESR. ESR, or erythrocyte sedimentation rate, is a non-specific and non-sensitive uh, uh, marker of inflammation. It was used long before other inflammatory markers were dis uh, discovered, and so nowadays uh, it's been used more just like uh, to be added to uh, those other more up-to-date um, markers of inflammation. Uh, however, some researchers still show that uh, ESR could be um, when measured simultaneously with uh, other uh, markers, still a quite potential and meaningful um, biomarker for the, the disease differentiation, including uh, infectious diseases. Okay, let me just stop you right there. What about anemia? Anemia is a common condition which globally affects almost 25% of the worldwide population. We all know that measuring ESR is in decline. However, because it is a non-specific and non-sensitive method, which is always increased in patients with anemia. However, it is still a main diagnostic tool in rural areas. That's why we cannot diagnose a patient with infectious disease when there is a concomitant anemia present. 
So yeah, I give you that, you're right. But fortunately, we have other markers that are independent, or, or um, I mean, they present themselves, themselves independently of blood malfunction, such as C-reactive protein, for example. This annular pentametric protein, seen on the picture, um, is found in blood plasma, is produced by liver, and is it is synthesized uh, in response to uh, factors that are present uh, during an inflammatory state. The normal values are below 10 milligrams per liter and milligram, milligrams per liter and rise to ab uh, about 40 in pregnancy and viral infection to about 200 in active inflammation or bacterial infection and above 200 in severe bacterial infection and burns. I do agree that CRP is a good diagnostic tool. However, I have to immediately point out one of its downsides. It can only be detected in 24 hours after the initiation of the inflammation, and because of that, we risk missing the appropriate time to start with the therapy. Again, you're right, but let me continue with the next, more recent uh, marker, procalcitonin. This is a peptide uh, or a precursor of hormone calcitonin, later being involved in calcium homostasis. Um, it, what's important is that this is the first marker of inflammation and can be raised, uh, detected in the bloodstream only three hours after the first, uh, when the pathogen entered the organism. Otherwise, it's, non it's below the levels of detection in the healthy individuals. Okay, so we all probably agree that inflammation markers are a priceless and are a priceless help when diagnosing infectious diseases. However, there are some situations when we cannot rely on them. I will focus on some of these situations, starting with systemic autoimmune diseases. Systemic autoimmune diseases are prone to infection, particularly under immunosuppression. Sometimes it is hard to differentiate whether is it the infection causing the markers of inflammation to elevate or is it the underlying disease. The guidelines, guidelines suggest the use of procal, procalcitonin. However, we all know that we never start uh, our diagnostic procedure by measuring procalcitonin in primary healthcare. We usually measure C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and leuco leukocytes, which are all elevated in uh, underlying systemic autoimmune diseases. So we are wondering whether is it the systemic infection or the increased activity of the underlying disease. If a patient, a patient comes to your practice, for instance, and he has a low active autoimmune disease transferring to a highly active one with a concomitant viral infection present. Of course, laboratory um, measurements speak on behalf of bacterial infection, and we start with the antibiotic therapy. When you sh in fact, we should be treating the underlying auto highly active autoimmune disease. That's why I think that the approach should be multifactorial, which is often not so, and the patients do not get the appropriate treatment because of it. Yeah, now we are, t we are talking about outpatient clinic environment and uh, hospitalized patients with chronic diseases. So there are, in these cases, there are um, other diagnostic approaches, uh, such as previous medical records of a patient and so on. But intensive care units, however, are one completely different story. They're relying co only on the laboratory tests uh, are, is crucial. So, for example, in septic patient or a patient suspected of sepsis, which, which is a severe inf infection leading to organ, organ dysfunction and has a mortality rate ranging from 15 to 60 percent, these odds are something you don't want to mess with, and as a doctor, uh, you need precise parameters to base your further decisions on it. Um, yeah, so early measuring of inflammatory markers in this case is currently the best option we have um, right now. Okay, but despite great advancements in the understanding of the pathophysiology and in new therapeutic approaches, the mortality of sepsis still remains unacceptably high. That's why I think the adequate laboratory measurements are crucial. Speaking of the ICU, I will tell something about severe trauma. I will focus on head injuries, blunt trauma, burns, and major operations following severe trauma. In all of these situations, the markers of inflammation are elevated, and we do not know whether it is just a normal post-traumatic non-inflammatory response or is it an infection. 
guidelines suggest the use of procalcitonin. However, there is an early and transient release of procalcitonin into the bloodstream following severe trauma. CRP is even less specific, and all the inflammation markers are always elevated in the first three days following severe trauma. Yes, as, as you mentioned, um, the conventional protocol remains of, uh, in measuring C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, and uh, leukocytes. But several studies show that although these uh, markers might not be specific, uh, might not be so sensitive, uh, specific on their own, uh, the, the diagnosis could be more accurate if we added uh, additional markers to measurements, uh, such as interleukin-1, uh, I mean 6 and 8, and uh, for example, LPS binding protein. So there exists some additional maneuvering space yet to be explored. Okay, so I want to mention another very common condition in the ICU. It's acute kidney failure. Acute kidney failure is diagnosed in almost 20% of the patient with moderate sepsis and in 50% of patients with septic shock when the blood cultures are positive. If the blood cultures are positive, we do know that acute kidney failure occurred to, due to an infection, but infection is only one of the reasons for renal failure. Some others are sudden and serious drop in the blood flow to the kidneys, some intoxications, and some blockages where, which prevents the urine from flowing out. In all of these cases, inflammatory markers are elevated and we do not know whether it is a normal body's response going through a certain shock or is it an infection, which in the worst case scenario could lead to death. Above all, I would like to mention another very possible differential. It's liver metastasis. The liver, through its ability to filter venous drainage from intra-abdominal viscera, is the most common site of distant metastasis for solid tumors, such as lung cancers, breast cancers, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and several others. There is all, always an elevation in the serum procalcitonin present, which is as high as a representative value of sepsis or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So yeah, as we've seen, Eva could go on with all the exceptions forever, but now the, uh, the caption of our debate needs to stand the trial. Are inflammatory markers really that important for, diag for the diagnosis of a true infectious disease? So the sensitivity and the specificity of these markers is quite far from 100% when diagnosing uh, infections, and there are numerous non-infectious differentials that we might uh, sometimes to, uh, that we might forget, that we might forget to take into account. Okay, but then again, as Matthias said, inflammatory markers are our only weapon when dealing with, di with infectious diseases at the moment. They are irreplaceable in intensive care unit where delaying with antimicrobial therapy in a septic patient could have disastrous consequences. And maybe just one final thought for the end. We're all armed with knowledge, but does our knowledge suffice? The gray zones that we have presented to you are obvious of how quickly the mistakes can be made. That's why we have to see each and every patient as a whole. As a whole. We have to think out of the box in order to be a better doctor and to give our patients the best care we can. Thank you. Thank you. So this has been a very interesting subject and I do believe that there must be some questions or at least some comments in the public. Hmm? No? Well, they told a lot. So then thank you very much for everything and we go on. Now, at this point, we would like to invite uh, Professor Logar to have a comment on the debate or maybe her personal opinion what, uh, on the topic stands. Thank you very much. Thank you both for the presentation. I would just like to summarize that it is not the inflammatory markers we are treating, but we are treating a patient. So we can have a patient with a, a purulent meningitis, bacterial meningitis, who has a very low inflammatory marker who, and, came to your, and comes to your office, uh, but he's severely ill. On the other side, we can have a patient 
who has a very high inflammatory markers, but has have some other conditions. So you have to take into account that the patient is the most important, the numbers are not so important. Uh, so Eva and Mattia already told you about some uh, circum circumstances when you have uh, very high numbers, and there is one exception when you have a very low CRP. This is a patient, these are the patients with the alcoholic uh, liver cirrhosis and other kinds of cirrhosis. Then you can not uh, uh, calculate and have to, uh, have to uh, perform the procalcitonin because the CRP will be very low. Uh, so you have to take a lot of things into account when you are making a diagnosis. And another good thing with the uh, uh, inflammatory markers uh, is that you can use them to um, be sure if you are treating your patient right. When they are dropping, then you are on the right side. When they are on the rise, no matter which one of the methods are you using, then you have to think twice what is wrong. Is the patient really having have an infection? And then if the treatment is uh, okay. That's from my side. Thank you very much. So if we continue on the second debate on the session of infectious diseases, we will uh, talk about if uh, in HIP infected patients early treatment with CD4 count uh, under 500 is really better than deferred treatment when CD4 count drops under 350. I would like to welcome Martin Trykowski from faculty, medical faculty, Cyril and Methodius University in Skopje and for contra side, Veronica Viziak from Medical Faculty, University of Ljubljana, and their mentor, Professor Janes Tomajic. So, let's begin. Um, the introduction was done already. So, what we will be talking today about. First of all, we know that HIV is a virus that affects numerous cells, but um, one that it, that it affects are CD8 cells, but for this debate, the cells that are important are CD, CD4 cells. It also affects different cells in the body, one of them being, let's say, glial cells in the brain. Effects of HIV are, as I already mentioned, on the immune system, but also on the other organ systems in the body, let's say a brain or um, nervous system, circulatory system, uh, kidneys, etc. Today we should focus also on the opportunistic infections. Here on the y-axis you see the CD4 count and on the x-axis you see years following infection. For this debate today it is important that we all realize that we are talking about patients that have CD4 count between 350 and 500 and these are all asymptomatic patients. Now opportunistic infections in those patients occur uh, at the lower levels of CD4 uh, 250. So we have various methods of therapy available today. The pillar being the antiretroviral therapy. We have numerous groups of antiretroviral therapy. But what is important also for this debate is, and we'll be using it quite a lot, is the acronym HART, which means highly active antiretroviral treatment or without H and A, it's simply ART, but the thing, uh, it, the drugs are the same. Then we have prevention um, therapy, which are antibiotics against opportunistic infections, let's say, and then some pioneering methods, which are not currently in the, um, in the use, but we have some vaccines available as a method of prevention of HIV infections, and the phase one clinical trials have been successfully completed in Canada. So, when to start treatment at the level of CD4 500 or 350? 
Let us start with the most important stuff about medicine, and that apparently is economics, right? So, as the old saying goes, you have to spend money in order to make money. But in reality, what I'm proposing here is not really spending money, rather a smart redistribution of the resources we already have. In fact, a combined analysis of 12 mathematical models for four countries over the course of 20 years, so this is from this moment into the future, 20 years from now, show that earlier treatment is very cost effective in low and middle income settings. Take for example South Africa. You, if you start early treatment, you end up saving almost $1,700 per person. This is disability adjusted life uh, years, which is averted. Or then um, Zambia, uh, you end up saving $750 per person. Or then again, India, you end up saving $250 per person. Or, um, hmm, and this was Vietnam, yeah, $290 per person. And you can notice that this, uh, yeah, this cost expensive vary between countries because medical expenses vary between each country. But in the end, if you spend some money now, you end up saving money later. So let me just ask you, Martin, who financed those studies? Uh, sorry? Who financed those studies? Oh, uh, I don't know. There I were don't know. seven different pharmaceutical companies, one of them being GlaxoSmith and Klein, which was about a week ago accused of corruption in China. Hmm. Well, be that as it may, come on. I cannot overly emphasize the fact that this is a mathematical model, which means that no matter how many times you're going to reproduce the data, you're always going to end up with the same results because mathematics never lies. Come on. And when I'm talking about resource redistribution, it, also, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to just find some money and we're not just talking about economics here, come on. We're also talking about attacking this issue from multiple angles and eventually treating it uh, in the way it should, um, like a key fitted in a right keyhole, you know? Take it for example. We need to stop addressing this issue as something monstrous or disease, uh, a monstrous disease or some devious disease, come on. And we need to start acting as a community and stand foot strong, smartly, efficiently use the capacities we already have. Like, for example, from human capacities, we can use trained um, non-physician clinicians, midwives or nurses that can initiate treatment, maintain the treatment, and then can even dispense the treatment between regular clinical visits. This means that we have trained personnel that costs less than a medical specialist in the field, yet provides as optimal care with no difference in mortality of whatsoever as a medical specialist would do. This is already been implemented in South Africa, Swaziland, Ethiopia, Malawi, Uganda, Kenya, etc. Come on. And in some countries, we do have another problem. We have patients that are in hiding because uh, they're being marginalized or they're being prosecuted for who they are or what they do. This means that we have to reevaluate the laws that criminalize homosexuality, HIV exposure and all transmission, drug use, and sex work in order to improve access to healthcare services and protect the human rights. So Martin gave you a lovely representation of how much daily we would benefit in a couple of countries, but let's look further. So what is important? is also the prevalence of HIV and as you can see is one of the highest being in the sub-Saharan Africa, for example in countries like South Africa and Zambia. The same you can notice for gross national income per capita or GNI per capita, but the adjective here is no longer high but low. These countries have one of the lowest GNI in the world. So if we look further on how much does the average cost how much is the average treatment cost? So estimated cost per person is per month $1,000 and according to the current guidelines per lifetime is $380,000. Now imagine the upscale in costs if we implement the Martins, gui the Martins guidelines. But how can we ask of countries that have already such a low GNI to 
to invest in something that it's not really all that different as we will show to you. And here we're not only talking about the prices of the treatment, but also to educate the people, to educate the medical staff and the personnel. And so that we won't only talk about Africa, can you imagine the additional financial burden instantaneously added to our recession economy? We have not been able to complete the much needed ER for 10 years, but we could afford 1,000 euros per patient per month. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, uh, but can you remind me once again, how much does it cost if you don't treat them? I don't know. It's also right there on the slide. Would you be so kind to show me? Yeah, please. It's big zero. Oh, come on, Martin, that's ridiculous. I mean, of course, at the, at the beginning, if you don't give them heart, you invest nothing, you spend nothing. But at the end, as the disease progresses and we have chronic uh, infectious disease patients with age, opportunistic infections and uh, co-infections, comorbidities, we end up spending much, much more. Great, great of you that you mentioned other comorbidities related to HIV because after all this time we can finally agree that AIDS related illnesses are no longer a primary threat. In fact, now we have HIV associated illnesses and complications that have emerged and they now are a priority, which means that people uh, being HIV positive is not longer a state. It should be rather considered a chronic disease that for many patients will last for decades. And here we are talking about HIV-associated kidney disease. Okay. Yeah. But <laughs> so kidney disease, neurocognitive impairment, HPV-associated cancers, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. And these are all considered to be preventable when earlier treatment is initiated. And this has been supported by WHO and European AIDS Clinical Society guidelines. And this is the key to early treatment. And also, early treatment in seemingly healthy patients will also prevent other comorbidities and co-infections. People living with HIV are at increased risk of developing a range of cardiovascular diseases, chronic lung diseases, diabetes, and some types of cancer. We have a 2011 study from Malavia on long-term antiretroviral treatment that proved beneficial in preventing cardiovascular diseases. So, which in turn proves that an effective and early antiretroviral treatment, people will be living with HIV longer. And another 2011 study showed that antiretroviral treatment reduces substantially sexual transmission in HIV serodiscordant couples, and these are couples when what the, one of the partners is HIV positive and the other is HIV negative. So when treatment is initiated earlier, there is a 96% of reduction in the number of linked HIV transmissions as compared with delayed treatment. Okay, so let me ask you, Martin, do we have any other possibilities for preventing, preventing transmission? Well, of course, you can use condoms, but condoms are, when used properly and regularly, are only 95% uh, effective, which is 1% less than the 96% with uh, early treatment. So besides the condoms, we also have pre-exposure prophylaxis, True. which is effective in over more than 90%, which is basically almost, almost as yeah. your idea. 6% less. Okay, and then we also have um, circumcision, which reduces the rate of transmission of infectious diseases by 60%. Absolutely, you're correct. And, but still, the current recommendations show that in order to reduce the transmission or the risk of transmission, uh, to the negative partner, treatment has to be provided to all the partners infected with HIV, regardless of the CD4 levels. And also, this is uh, also implied for HIV-positive pregnant patients, that early treatment does not only reduce the risk of sexual transmission, but we also avoid a major shipwreck, and that's the vertical transmission. So by providing this early treatment, we also prevent infected babies. And Plus, earlier treatment will uh, delay the disease progression in the pregnant patients. We also, have, there is available so-called earlier than early treatment. That means that um, earlier than early is uh, implemented for children under the age of two, regardless of the CD4 levels. So, uh, there was this case a year ago where uh, antiretroviral drugs were uh, administered to an HIV-positive baby just four hours after it was born, and now we have an H, um, HIV negative nine months old child. I mean, if we're willing to use these drugs on our future, aka children, why, why wouldn't it be safe to use on adults as well? 
I'll tell you just in a second, but before I would also like to stress that the current guidelines also demand the treatment of pregnant women, so this is no change at all. So why not treat uh, adults as children? We should talk about compliance. According to a study done in HIV positive patient group, they found that adherence is extremely poor. 95% of adherence, which is considered effective, was achieved only by 34% of the patients that were taking three pills per day, which is basically a regular heart treatment. Now, of course, different factors affect, uh, affect adherence, and HIV treatment is one of those having the lowest adherence due to lifelong therapy of several pills per day, as also the profile of patients and the environment in which they live. And so why is adherence so important? Because if we do not achieve it, it could lead to unneeded high costs and resistance to heart. So if we ask ourselves, what is the true purpose of heart? The meaning of heart lies within the viral load suppression. That means the viral copies below the level of 50. This is considered to be the level below which the drug resistance mutations uh, do not occur. Um, also in the art naive patients, that means the HIV positive patients that have not started with art therapy, we also have the prevalence of drug resistance already being between 6 and 16 percent. This is a test question, remember. Um, patients on art, so who do not achieve this treatment goal or who experience biological rebound often develop resistance to one or more components of their treatment regime. And it's estimated that nearly 25% of those receiving art are not biologically suppressed. So many patients with detectable viral loads are not adherent to the treatment and it's generally believed that selection of drug resistance mutations occurs when patients um, do not have the HIV RNA levels persistently suppressed, so that means below the level of detection. But do know that poor adherence is not simply just a matter of taking drugs or skipping, uh, skipping to take one. It can also be the result of interruption or intermittent access to the therapy. So let's, let's, if we imagine that we have patients who has CD4, let's say around 450, and he, um, he's not compliant for any reason whatsoever in his numerous years of therapy, and so he, de he develops one resistance after another. Um, so when his CD4 count drops significantly, we will have no effective heart to offer him, which would significantly improve his survival. Objection, Your Honor. <laughs> 20 minutes, Martin, not half an hour. All these problems Veronica mentioned have been long debunked by several studies uh, that show that there is no significant difference in the likelihood of virological suppression, the risk of virological failure, or viral rebound when treatment is initiated at higher or lower levels. This means that since the viral rebound is bound to happen and the, virological, uh, the viral rebound and virological failure is happens as often in early as in referred treatment, they're bound to happen one way or another due to mechanisms we still don't fully comprehend yet, but definitely not due to earlier treatment. Furthermore, earlier treatment provides a decreased risk of progression to AIDS or death. And in some settings, many people living with HIV who are lost to follow up in the first months after initiating treatment have died. And the same principle goes to HIV positive patients with CD4 levels above 350 who are denied treatment by the old uh, guidelines since they are considered healthy. In fact, why diagnose someone if you, have, if you have no intention of treating them at this point? S data from Sub-Saharan Africa show that 54% of those who are not yet eligible for uh, treatment were lost to follow up before becoming eligible. And we have no idea what happened with them, whether or not they are still alive. But more importantly, they are potentially spreading the disease in the environment. By initiating early treatment, 
you keep a close eye on every patient and you don't allow any of them to slip out of existence. Yeah, I do agree. We do have a problem with patients sticking up with the treatment or adherence, as we say it. But when pre people are properly educated on the matter, have the right counseling and support, and have the right motivation, such as this drug will help you, or your partner, or your child will stay healthy, they properly follow treatment. In fact, 79% of adherence was achieved in participants from early treatment group compared to 74% of those of the delayed treatment group. A possible solution for promoting adherence in modern society could also be sending mobile text SMS as a reminding tool or something. Okay, so how would you assure proper adherence, drug distribution, etc.? So I guess you would just give them the cell phones just after they walked like, let's say, 10 miles to, to go to the water with which to take the pill with. And also you would just make them come to the testing to some well-known place with a bunch of people, well, no worries about the stigma. So, you're still thinking about an early treatment. That's just it. It's just thinking. We have absolutely no randomized trial that would prove the beneficial start at 500 instead of 350, and that is why we stick to it in Europe. Uh, all the studies that were done compared only the groups between 350 to 500 and another group of 500 to the uh, level of CD4 to 200, which is the level of numerous health hazards, as we all know. I presume that no sane-minded person would go and change the guidelines without a firm study, a randomized study, that is. And also, as I mentioned before, numerous researchers were supported by what, Martin? GlaxoSmithKline? Uh, pharmaceutical companies, but if you can reproduce the data, it can be supported by whomever you want, come on. But it's still bias. <laughs> so, second of all, we should also uh, remind ourselves that pills are not candies, and they have unwanted side effects. And the HIV by itself is a chronic disease that affects cardiovascular system, brains, etc. There is also reported of higher incidence of cardiovascular events in patients which a with HIV on art, and there are also increase in metabolic disorders, uh, decreased bone density, renal failure, etc. So they also discovered that uh, there is increased prevalence of 24% in children with peripheral neuropathy who are receiving heart treatment. One might argue that this is simply because of the HIV infection itself, but the Tanzania study showed when they were comparing all HIV positive patients who were taking either art or weren't given any therapy. And they were um, studying the side effects on them and what they found is that only uh, the higher incidence of hearing impairment occur only in the group who was HIV positive and was taking art. So, yeah, when uh, we have the typical... Sorry, but uh, we, now we know that some of the side effects uh, that were previously attributed to other drugs uh, have, in fact, predisposing risk factors. Take it, for example, hepatotoxicity, which has underlying hepatic disease or hepatitis B or C uh, infection, or tubular renal dysfunction and Fanconi syndrome that have uh, predisposing risk factors like body mass so, index below 18.5 or untreated diabetes, untreated hypertension. Let me just add a remark here. When we are deciding to do the study or when we study the side effects, we, of course, test the patients if they have Fanconi syndrome or any underlying disorder or uh, so we can exclude them so we can study just the side effects. I'm just saying here that it's totally possible in the future to find out that some of the side effects that we are currently attributing to some of the drugs are in fact due to other predisposing factors. So when we have a patient, let's say, that has a CD4, again, around 550, and when we give them all the information about the side effects in the drug interaction, um, the rates of transmission, etc., we ultimately have to leave the decision-making to them. And according to the guidelines, when they are given all the information, they will choose the deferred treatment. Yeah, well, 
to make a summary of this whole mess we made here, uh, we still don't have any strong grounds on any of the uh, of these two sites since no randomized trials have been done yet. There is a tendency to start treatment earlier, but uh, these two studies, Start and Tempranor, are bound to finish up by the end of 2015. So hopefully, eventually, we'll get the data. We'll know for sure. But. Uh, there, you can't deny the clear benefits in preventing HIV-associated conditions, other co-infections, comorbidities, and reduction of transmission. But on the other hand, you have to know that this treatment is not the only way, way of preventing HIV transmissions and comorbidities. And some countries have already started this tr CD4 uh, treatment at 500, like uh, United States of America or Canada or Australia and other countries like European countries, I think it was France and African countries like South Africa are contemplating making the necessary changes but haven't implemented it yet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you both for this very energetic presentation. I think we all enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> would invite you to share your comments or ask questions that might have arise during the presentation. Okay, hi. Uh, if we shouldn't start treating asymptomatic patients as soon as possible, then why wait till 350? Why not wait even longer? Because this, as in the studies, it was shown that this is the last safe boundary that we have the number of CD4 350. But the trend is going upwards because if we start treating later, then we cannot increase the CD4 count as much as we would like to. If I answered your the, question. Yeah. The old guidelines, I think it was from 2006, stated that uh, treatment should be initiated below, uh, at CD4 levels below 200. And eventually it turned out to be a very bad idea, then they increased it to 350. And now we're having this debate, but at this moment, people are actually considering starting treatment earlier, even at uh, CD4 levels above 500. Yeah, I would agree with you. For example, you don't start treating diabetic patient when he has blood glucose 20 millimolars, even though he's asymptomatic. You start treating him when the blood glucose is just by this much over the uh, top uh, limit. Limit, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so maybe the professor would comment on this? On this? <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Veronica and Martin. This was really outstanding, excellent. Uh, so concerning why 350, that was the question. I think uh, it's uh, just, it's an uh, uh, absurd of the borders, you know. Uh, with the data, uh, there's uh, 350. So we don't have data. Uh, what about 400? What about 500? And now it's going to work, start trial. Start trial will, will answer the questions, what's between 350 and what is above, uh, uh, what's between 300, 350 and 500 and what is above five, uh, 500. So uh, when it's rational to start treatment. If, may, may I have a few more words? Do you have time? Yes. yes. Okay. So I think they are both were very good, great. Excellent, highly active uh, debate was this. And uh, I think there are two views. And one view is epidemiological view and the other is personal patient's view. So epidemiological, we don't have good prevention. So primary prevention is not working. It's very simple, but it doesn't work. So there's also a combination prevention and one of them is test and treat. And the other one is treatment for prevention. So test as much as possible and early treatment. And this is very important. They mentioned that treatment is the best prevention. That means it's better than are other ways of prevention. So it's the best that you don't infect, of course. And maybe you heard the last uh, week CDC offer, uh, officially uh, offers pre-exposure for uh, prophylaxis 
so that there will be no infection. So we are geared to be no infection, but when infection is, then test and treat early. So cons considering uh, uh, epidemiological view, I would say I am pro. I would say early treatment is, is, uh, is uh, effective. But concerning patients' view, there are more problems, and they mentioned uh, all of them. So why uh, eat medications every day? There are adverse effects, and they are also uh, expensive. Uh, if uh, the we have no data. And Europe, you know, is conservative. Europe guidelines, European AIDS Clinical Society guidelines are below 350. If, it, if we would look to DHHC guidelines or uh, EAS guidelines, uh, they would start uh, treatment earlier. But Europe, you know, they are on data. So we are waiting for this data. On the other side, on the other hand, with the patient's view, are comorbidities. Because we know even if we don't treat a patient, there's a chronic, uh, there's a replication and there is a chronic inflammation. And when there's a chronic inflammation in the body, there are early accelerated atherosclerosis, there are comorbidities, comorbidities as you mentioned, uh, uh, kidneys, etc. So even we, if we treat a patient, there are comorbidities. What is the, the picture if we don't treat them? So, uh, it's still a debate, uh, a personal view, uh, a patient's view, when to start. And there are many, many places uh, in the planet when they start at once. So, let's say in San Francisco, Vancouver, uh, also in France, they start to treat everybody. Yeah, of course, the patient must, be, uh, must agree because the treatment is, uh, is not easy. And they also observed that the, the newcomers, the, the epidemic decreased even in IV drug users. So our, our approach is uh, that we, we start to treat uh, much earlier as we did before. And uh, of course, we treat if there is a discordant partner, partners, we treat if there is comorbidities, if there is co-infection, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So uh, out of 500 uh, HIV AIDS patients in Slovenia, we treat 460 or even a little more. Uh, but uh, once again, you were excellent. I listened to such debates in international uh, conferences, but they were the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I will suggest a break of around 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We meet again at 15 and 15.
session five of our Congress. I would like to welcome our uh, colleagues uh, for the pro side, Tina Cake, for the contra side, Clara Tostovarsnik. And as you can see, the title is Patients with Kidney Disease Diseases Should Ingest Large Amounts of Fluids. So the session five is about nephrology. I would also like to uh, invite their mentor, um, Dr. Skoberne, to sit here with us. And at the end, he, he will maybe try to combine the whole debate and give some questions. Okay, thank you, please. Okay, thank you. So any healthcare provider who works with patients has at some point discussed the importance of prevention and management of kidney diseases. What should an expert recommend for the management and prevention of kidney diseases? Certainly, early recognition and control of hypertension, diabetes, and avoidance of nephrotoxic agents. One may also discuss the importance of maintaining a healthy weight for exercise and diet, given that majority of kidney diseases is also due uh, to nutritional factors. Uh, but, however, many individuals are seeking advice uh, on prevention of kidney disease, meaning <clears throat> what kind of water intake is needed to flush out toxins um, and uh, request specific guidelines uh, for water intake. The urban meat of eight glasses of water daily originates from the U.S. Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council in 1945, which recommended a water intake of 2.5 liters daily. However, um, the fluid intake and good hydration has been suggested to provide multiple benefits in different aspects of health and well-being, including weight loss, cognitive function, and disease progression. Associations have not been yet supported by strong scientific evidence. So our thesis is that patients with kidney diseases should ingest large amounts of fluids. Uh, we concentrated on most prevalent kidney afflictions, and as large amount literature generally refers of ingestion of more than three liters daily. Uh, as fluids, we assumed water, except if stressed otherwise. Uh, let's say a few words about kidneys. Kidneys are a paired organ placed retroperitoneally. Their function is to filter the blood. They excrete waste, control body fluid status, and regulate a balance of electrolytes. Glomerular filtration is responsible for a popular process of detoxification. Every day occurs ultrafiltration of 170 to 180 liters of water and unbound small molecular weight components of the blood. However, the amount of water excreted in urine is not determined by glomerular filtration only, but also by reabsorption and secretion. In the proximal tubal, approximately 60 to 80 percent of filtered water and uh, sodium along with potassium, bicarbonate, uh, glucose and amino acids are absorbed. Fine-tuning of salt and water balance is achieved in the, proximal in the distal tumors and collecting those under the influence of aldosterone, an antidiuretic hormone also called vasopressin. As plasma osmolality increases, which is represented here by this picture, Special neurons in the, la in the organum vasculosum in the lamina terminalis in the brains are activated, and this stimulates the release of vasopressin <coughs> from the hypothalamus. Uh, vasopressin then in increases the permeability of water in the collecting ducts by inserting water channels, so called aquaporins, into the luminal tubular membrane, and water excretion is stopped. Uh, is, uh, so water is reabsorbed. When the effect of vasopressin wears off, uh, these water channels are removed from the, cell uh, from the cell membrane back to the cell cytoplasm, and water reabsorption is stopped, which is represented here by this picture, and urine volume is increased. Firstly, we are going to discuss the importance of water intake or high water intake in prevention of urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections are very prevalent. The global incidence is approximately 250 million cases per year. Several factors might explain the potential role of prevention 
uh, meaning of uh, prevention by high water intake. Uh, firstly, diluting effect of increased water intake, uh, diluting effect, so effectively reduces the contaminating bacteria and virulence factors in our urine. Then it's flushing effect that the that occurs with each void. It washes out the epithelia and cleans the, the urine of all the contaminating bacteria. Then is the shrinking effect, which also happens with each void. So bladder, uh, bladder surface is decreased, and uh, this effectively decreases also the area on which bacteria can thrive. Uh, and urine osmolarity and acidity, which is increased with smaller uh, water intake, uh, is causing epithelial stress, and that's why indirectly, well, causing uh, potential urine tract infection. So we absolutely should listen to our grandmother's advice and uh, regarding prevention of urinary kidney infection and drink a lot and lots of tea. But other studies show no effect of high fluid intake and frequency of wording on incidence of urinary tract infection. In fact, there is evidence that high urine osmolality during night acts as a protective factor against growth of some E. coli strains. Furthermore, most of those studies were low-quality observational studies. Um, given the facts, we cannot conclude that people should ingest high amount of fluid to prevent UTIs. Okay, might be true, might not. So let's discuss uh, further with, um, well, what fluid intake might prevent uh, or uh, might harm uh, in uh, chronic kidney disease progression. Uh, increasing evidence is linking uh, fluid intake vasopressin suppression and osmotic control with chronic kidney disease progression. Studies in animal models suggest that water restriction is associated with higher vasopressin levels, which, uh, which leads to um, faster renal decline or uh, progression of renal uh, kidney disease. Uh, also was, uh, this was also observed in polycystic kidney disease, one, one option, <laughs> one possible etiology of chronic kidney disease. Well, um, high levels of vasopressin were, uh, were associated with uh, greater cyst growth because vasopressin indirectly stimulates uh, cell proliferation and fluid secretion. So, increasing uh, cyst growth. So many studies have approached um, the effect of increased fluid intake in, pro in progression of chronic kidney disease. Uh, here on the graph I have, uh, here on the slide I have the graph of one study. This is Austrian Plischke et al. study. It uh, was a retrospective analysis of 273 patients with chronic kidney disease stages 1 to 4. Uh, and um, higher urine osmolarities, see by this, the, oh, sorry, this up, uh, this curve, were associated with uh, greater risk of dialysis initiation, so greater progression of chronic kidney disease. Uh, either increasing fluid intake or uh, decreasing the intake of osmolites could achieve uh, a reduction of urine osmolarity. So it follows that patients with greater fluid intake were at a smaller risk of dialysis initiation. Question whether it is safe for patients with chronic kidney disease to increase their fluid intake approached pilot randomized control trial by uh, Clark et al., which indicated that, um, that uh, adults with stage 3 kidney disease could successfully and safely increase their daily fluid intake for up to 0.7 liters daily to their usual, uh, dish, uh, to their usual uh, amount of fluid. So what we see here on the graph is the daily fluid, uh, the daily urine volume, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so here, the daily urine exceeded three liters, which is quite a substantial amount also for people with normal kidney function. So what follows is that, in summary, greater fluid intake did not cause any harm. Uh, and further, I have yet another study. This is Nagao et al. study uh, of uh, rats with polycystic kidney disease. What we see, it's obvious. We see kidney sections here a and C are kidney sections of control group, and sections B and D are group with high water intake. 
and we see less cystic spaces here in B and D group. The same is represented below with a graph showing that <coughs> um, we see 60 to 50 percent decree of cystic spaces uh, in group with high water intake. So, one must conclude, therefore, that it might be possible to use physiologic approach in, um, in management of chronic kidney disease simply by increasing daily fluid intake early in the course of chronic kidney disease. Well, let's take a few steps back. Did you hear a word animals? You're right, you did, because most of those studies were studies in animals. Yeah, but not all. <laughs> most of them. However, there um, is no prospective study of the effect of high fluid intake on the progression of kidney disease in humans. However, there are retrospective studies showing that high fluid intake is not beneficial. In fact, there is evidence that it can even cause harm. Just for a better understanding, a chronic kidney disease is divided into five stages accordingly to glomerular filtration rate. The study of Hebert et al. published in 2003, which included patients with polycystic kidney disease and patients with audit, um, found that there is a significant association between mean 24-hour urine volume and glomerular filtration rate decline. As seen here on the graph, the higher the mean 24-hour urine volume, the greater GFR decline. The study also found that there is a significant association between urine osmolality and GFR decline. As also seen here, the lower the urine osmolality, the greater GFR decline. High urine osmolality or low urine, um, high urine volume or low urine osmolality causes uh, faster disease progression due to nephron damage. There is also a vice versa hypothesis that faster disease progression increases urine volume and decreases urine osmolality by causing um, greater tubular injury or indirectly by increased thirst. However, there is no evidence for the latter. The thirst mechanism and ADH release have been found to be normal in patients with chronic kidney disease. The other explanation why high urine causes faster disease progression is higher volume and high pressure in the tubules. Those stretch forces then can induce fibrogenic mechanisms. Furthermore, the study of Sai et al. published this year, which included patients with chronic kidney disease stages 4 to 5, showed that fluid overload um, is significantly associati associated with initiation of renal replacement therapy and rapid GFR decline. Patients with the highest fluid overload have more than a threefold increased risk for renal replacement therapy and rapid GFR decline. There is also a relationship with the survival. Patients in the third tertile have a significantly lower survival than those in the first one. So the higher the fluid overload, the faster GFR decline. Fluid overload has an independent influence on arterial and endothelial level, causing arterial stiffness, atherosclerosis, left ventricular hypertrophy. High fluid status also increases renal efferent pressure, decreases renal blood flow, and finally causes progression of GFR decline. Interaction between fluid overload and arterial stiffness may be one of the major causes of the renal disease progression in patients with chronic kidney disease. So, until better evidence is available, patients with chronic kidney disease should let their thirst guide their water intake. Okay. However, we will continue with our debate. So, what is the, uh, what is the uh, beneficial effect on um, higher fluid intake in urolithiasis? Uh, urolithiasis is very um, prevalent, ranging somewhere between 4 to 9% uh, in Europe. Increasing water intake might be beneficial by diluting urine, uh, therefore preventing hypersaturation of, uh, with respect to stone-forming salts, uh, and by increasing urine flow, therefore uh, decreasing contact time with uh, potential adsorptive surfaces. So increased fluid intake is an ultimate, uh, ultimate treatment of prevention of recurrent, uh, uh, recurrent stone formation. 
Systemic review of randomized control uh, trials found that high water intake lowered long-term risk of urolithiasis uh, recurrence by approximately 60%. Uh, it has worked for me as well. I had urolithiasis five years ago. I increased my daily fluid intake and haven't had any problems since. So believe me, it does work. Poor Tina. Anyway, you are right <laughs> about this one. However, we should clearly define which kidney disease we are talking about. Because there is a really big difference about fluid intake if a patient has urolithiasis, actually, or maybe it has a chronic kidney disease. Well... Okay, and then we will continue with, um, with also one urban myth, maybe, so that kidney needs uh, a moist environment to work well. Well, kidneys may function more efficiently with an abundant supply of water. Uh, high fluid intake increases the clearance of sodium, urea, and osmose. If the kidneys are made to economize on um, water and produce a highly concentrated urine to maintain plasma osmolality, uh, they may incur greater metabolic demand. So after 34 decades, there seems to be an apparent shrinkage in uh, the glomeri and um, uh, proximal convoluted tubules. Glomerular filtration rate and renal plasma uh, flow decreased to approximately 50% of normal by the age of 90. Many studies support that uh, higher fluid intake leads to smaller renal decline and may reduce the likelihood of having chronic kidney disease. Here I have the graph of uh, Clark et al. study that evaluated um, the relationship between uh, fluid uh, urine volume and uh, renal decline, which was measured by a glomerular filtration rate, uh, over six years. Uh, in prospective study with 2,148 uh, adults with normal kidney function. What we see here is smallest risk for uh, any kind of renal decline, rapid or mild to moderate, for a group with higher volume of urine, that means higher fluid intake. So, also at this point, I must say that greater fluid intake must be encouraged strongly. Well, kidneys need a surprisingly small amount of water to work well. Daily, they need to excrete 800 milliosmos of waste. The normal range of a healthy kidney is from 50 to 1,200 milliosmos per kilo. It follows that normal kidney needs a urine output of um, 670 milliliters to excrete 800 milliosmos. So the kidney with a 50% reduction of concentrating ability needs a urine output of 1,340 milliliters to excrete 800 milliosmos. Daily fluid balance consists of water intake through eating, um, drinking, and water reproducing metabolism, and water loss with urine, skin, airways, and stool. So to conclude, a healthy person with a healthy kidneys need only uh, 470 milliliters of water intake to maintain fluid balance. The patient with a 50% reduction in concentrating ability therefore requires only a liter more than a liter of water to maintain fluid status. Anyhow, uh, what have we deduced? What is it? To drink or not to drink? Well, recommendations are still persisting. So for total daily fluid intake, European Food Safety Authority is recommending 2.5 liters for man and 2.0 liters for woman. However, the healthy person with the healthy kidneys requires a daily fluid intake of only 470 milliliters to maintain fluid balance. Well, increasing diarrhea has a diluting, shrinking um, effect on uh, bladder and contaminating bacteria, therefore effectively reduce the recurrence rate of urinary tract infections. And increased intake of water early in the course of chronic kidney disease of all etiologies may slow down the rate of disease progression. But fluid overload causes faster renal disease progression in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and is associated with initiation of renal replacement therapy and rapid GFR decline. So, patients with chronic kidney disease stages 4 to 5 should generally let their thirst guide their fluid intake. 
Yeah, and I also have to stress what against that high water intake prevents stone formation and lowers long-term risk of urinalteasis. So, I was all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to thank both sides for this nice presentation. And um, the mentor, Dr. Shiko Berne, would you like to give us your comment on this topic? Yes, well, I think that both of you have argued the point brilliantly. I think you have literally left no stone unturned, so you've uh, gained a complete picture of this area, I believe. Um, I can only round this up by saying that there are certain diseases where drinking more fluid than, than the amount that you would by thirst alone is beneficial. That is kidney stones. There is absolutely no doubt that that is successful therapy. Probably urinary tract infection as well. Uh, chronic kidney disease per se as a whole group of diseases, this is however somewhat questionable. And you have shown very well as well that drinking too much fluids can actually be bad for you as well, uh, especially because patients with kidney diseases tend to have heart problems as well. And if you have heart failure and if you really drink a lot, it might actually be, be a bad idea. What you haven't touched uh, is healthy people, not so much because of course the, the, the topic was kidney diseases, but if you read magazines, you get uh, the feeling that healthy people should drink more than based on what they would based on thirst alone. And there's absolutely no evidence that that is beneficial in any way. Uh, basically, the thirst mechanism is a very well-controlled mechanism. And if one were to drink the amount that one would drink just by thirst alone, one should be OK, especially if uh, he or she doesn't have kidney disease. So maybe if the audience has any more questions or something they would like to ask, I might invite them to do so. There is somebody there holding her hand. And there's the microphone. Uh, hi. I have a question for Clara or your mentor. Uh, I don't, uh, do you know exactly? You said fluid overload can damage the kidney. So what would be the fluid overload? How much volume would this be? Because you said uh, for 50% damaged kidney, a uh, liter and a half of fluid was enough. But what is fluid overload? And the studies were almost uh, more than 10% uh, fluid overload that is uh, beneficial uh, that is required for the body. Uh, fluid overload, I believe, here is defined by the amount of uh, fluid in the body, yes, not yeah. the amount you're drinking. So too Thank much you. fluid in the body. Uh, hi. Uh, isn't it true if you drink a lot of water, then the kidneys will lose its ability to con concentrate urine? So basically, the, the kidneys will steadily decline in their function. Yes, that is a possibility. Although you would probably have to drink a, an insane amount of water for a very long time. No, but it is, it is feasible. You're right. So this might be the mechanism why her studies show that if you drink more or if you're urine volume is bigger, you might have a faster progression of kidney disease. Although you have the other part of the coin where if you have kidney disease and diseased tubules because of the kidney disease, then you are not able to concentrate urine in the first place. So the fact that you're drinking more and peeing more actually shows that your kidneys are more damaged to begin with. And of course, you'll progress faster. So you don't always know what is, you know, uh, the, what is the situation. So uh, being, being, eu -volemic, be, being eu volemic, as we say, so having, having a body fluid amount that is just right, of course, is a good idea. You don't want to be hypovolemic for a long time if you're a kidney disease patient. But if, you dr if you're hypovolemic, you're thirsty. And if you're thirsty and you drink, you should be fine. The question is that if, if you're drinking two liters a day, would it be better if you drank four? That's, that's the question. And the answer is, who knows? Maybe, maybe some people with kidney disease, maybe some not. It's not clear. 
Maybe not drinking water, but drinking some sort of uh, uh, isoosmolar fluid would be better. Well, the problem with isoosmolar fluids is the, the amount of water that you lose by perspiration and by breathing, there is, there is, surprisingly, there is very little salt in sweat. So you're actually losing more water than salt. And if you, if you strictly drink isotonic fluids, you would be ingesting not enough of water because the amount of water that you're losing is not isotonic. If you, if you combined all the water lost by breathing, sweat, in kidney, the osmolality wouldn't be isosmotic. So if you only drank isosmotic fluid, you would be drinking too much salt. That's, that's, that's what happens if you drink uh, seawater. You're drinking isotonic fluid, actually, in, in a way. All right, so I think we need to move on, uh, yes, probably, yeah. Okay, so we are proceeding with our second debate here. Um, first, I would like to uh, invite Mentor to uh, come and join us here on stage, uh, Professor Radas Lokveder. And um, the topic is um, early start of dialysis in patients with chronic kidney failure is crucial. And for, for pro side, um, here we have Alesha Orsag and for contra side, Tina Zupancic, both from medical faculty in Ljubljana. Um, hello, everybody. So we would like to continue with nephrology. Uh, my name is Alesha, and my contra partner is Tina. And we will discuss whether early start of dialysis in patients with chronic kidney disease is crucial. So, what is chronic kidney disease? It's a progressive loss of renal function over a period of months or a year. Actually, it's a very huge medical problem because it affects about 5 to 10 percent of the world's population. Most of the people actually do not have any severe symptoms until their renal function is advanced. If the symptoms appear, Patients can feel uh, nausea, they can vomit, they can have dry, itching skin, or they can actually have no urine output. So the only treatment for the end-stage renal disease is dialysis or transplantation. We see that uh, there has been increased number of dialysis. Actually, about 60% of people uh, with end-stage renal disease are on dialysis. In the past, there was actually dialysis preserved just for the patient who had minimal renal function. But nowadays, we see that more than 50% of the patients who had dialysis are early starters. So the aim of the early start of dialysis is to provide better quality and quantity of life and to lower mortality and morbidity. Before we go on, uh, I would like just to remind you what dialysis is. Uh, so we, you can see here that we have two options, hemodialysis here and peritoneal dialysis here. The procedure is pretty much the same. Uh, we want to remove the waste substances and uh, fluid from the body. Here in hemodialysis, we need special access, ave fistula, and then the blood goes to dialyzer. This is actually uh, artificial kidney uh, and removes urea and creatinine. And then this clean blood goes back to the patient. Here in peritoneal dialysis, the procedure is pretty much the same, only that we use a patient's peritoneum as a semi-permeable membrane. So um, as I mentioned before, because of the aim to provide um, better life and um, better quality and quantity of life, there has been some recommendations when to start dialysis. So in 2002, they said that estimated glomerular filtration rate should be from 8 to 10. In 2006, the American and European clinical practice um, recommended that estimated glomerular filtration should be below 15. Now I'll show you uh, this trend of um, the early start. This graph was actually made for the US. 
we, oops, we can see uh, here in 1996, the most of the patients were late starters. So the estimated glomerular filtration rate was below 10. But uh, we can see here in 2008, there has been uh, actually a shift towards the early start. The number of patients has actually doubled with the early start of dialysis. Um, so um, this trend of an early start was based on conventional wisdom because they said there is actually a benefit of dialytic clearance. So dialytic and endogenous renal function are comparable and they actually affect um, the patient's mortality and morbidity. So we can see that uh, lower estimated glomerular filtration is related to lower plasma albumin and other protein wasting energy. Uh, this can be because of the um, decreased protein intakes that follows uremia, or because of the increased degradation of protein and amino acid because of metabolic acidosis. So the benefit of the early start is to, to correct the metabolic acidosis, malnutrition, and actually decreases um, catabolism of muscles. So patients have better um, dietary intake and also better appetite. Um, also, there has been um, made some studies, observational and interventional studies, that show better survival with more preserved renal function. So if we start dialysis early, patients have more preserved renal function, and this is connected with reduces interdialytic weight gain. Uh, patients have lower erythropoietin requirements and also better nutritional status, as I mentioned before. So overall, they have better outcomes. Thank you, Alesha, for a great introduction and presenting uh, your pro reason. Uh, however, is early start of dialysis really related to better survival? I based uh, this question on just recently published uh, studies. This is the first one. It is so-called the ideal study and was, in fact, the first randomized and controlled trial uh, comparing early versus late initiation of dialysis. This study was published in 2010. Uh, in this study, 828 patients from 32 dialysis centers in Australia and New Zealand participated, and this study clearly showed that early start of dialysis is not related with better survival whatsoever. And once again, I would like to remind you that this was a controlled and randomized uh, study, and as Alesha mentioned, studies in the past were observational studies. To continue, uh, another study I based uh, my first uh, contra reason is, uh, was a Swedish uh, study carried out on more than 10,000 patients, and this study also showed no survival benefit whatsoever. And even though these studies have just recently been published in 2010, they have already come into practice, and these are the new guidelines from Canadian Society of Nephrology released in uh, January this year, where they state that it's better to delay whenever that is possible. So you might wonder, what is the reason for so great differences between, uh, regard, uh, between dealing the survival? So, the studies that Alesha mentioned and studies supporting the early start actually made a statistical or methodological an error, if you want. And this error is the lead time bias. I'll explain this shortly in this picture. So here we have a chronic, oh, sorry. <laughs> so here we have a chronic kidney disease stage five patients divided into two groups, early start and late start group. And here is the end of the study. Of course, the early start group started dialysing earlier and, they were and the group was observed for this period of time, of course, till the end of the study. On the other side, the late start group started dialysing later and the uh, they were also observed to the same point till the end, uh, till the st study ended. So you see, the late start group was actually observed for a shorter period of time. And because of this, we give the impression that the early start group 
uh, has a better survival. But however, it is only an oppression, a result is distorted because as both, both groups should be observed for the same period of time. And it is important to know that this lead time bias is an important factor when evaluating the effectiveness of specific tests. To continue, uh, studies supporting early start of dialysis used creatinine clearance uh, as, a measure, uh, as a measuring uh, renal function. And however, it is well known fact that creatinine clearance underestimates the exact renal function. And because of this underestimation, the early start group was in fact, if I can say, the late start group, and of course, benefited from this so-called early start more than they would in fact so a studies that I showed you before use a much better tool. It is the estimated glomerular filtration rate. In this equation, uh, six or four parameters uh, are in calculated. These parameters are gender, age, creatinine clearance, um, and age. Yes, creatinine clearance uh, and age. And in some cases, uh, even um, blood uh, urea nitrogen and level of albumin. So, Estimated glomerular filtration, filtration rate is a much better approach. But I have to stop you here, Tina, because actually estimated glomerular filtration rate um, overestimates renal function, especially if person are, have extreme body mass or too low or too high, or their age is about 75 or 18, or they also have any amputations. Yes, Alesha, I cannot argue with that. And in this field of how to measure renal function, there are still some questions to be answered. Well, to continue with the, with the, in the aspect of renal function, I would also like to stress out the re residual renal function, whatsoever it, it may be, it is extremely important in, um, in um, dealing with a better status of anemia, because as we know, anemia is developed in chronic kidney disease, and with some preserved function, this anemia is slowly progresses. Uh, residual renal function is also important for better uh, body volume control. Uh, it is also helps to control uh, uh, proper blood uh, pressure. And as we know, uh, blood pressure is an important risk factor for comorbidities and mortalities in chronic kidney disease patients. And uh, it also helps to maintain proper levels of phosphorus, an important trigger for vascular classification and a process of atherosclerosis, yet another extremely important problem for comorbidities and mortalities. Yes, as I mentioned before, if we preserve more renal function, it is better if we start the, with the early start because we can uh, use special membranes and also AC inhibitors <laughs> And we, we can see that if we preserve more renal function, we can also, uh, we have also better nutritional status. However, you are, even though you're right, however, there are studies also revealing that more than 50% of this extremely important residual function declines within six months on dialysis. So yes, you're true, there are some ways. However, we should also uh, keep uh, the, the residual renal function. Yes, and to continue, uh, even though dialysis is a life-saving procedure, there are, we, we, we must also be aware of some complications that are related, especially at the start of dialysis. So, and these complications are um, uh, most frequently showed as the complications uh, uh, regarding cardiovascular system, especially uh, there is a higher prevalence of non-coronary artery disease-related transient myocardial ischemia. There is higher prevalence of myocardial and stunning. There is worsening of underlying systolic heart failure and ventricular arrhythmias. And what is extremely important to remember that early start of dialysis is related uh, with the twice the rate of sudden cardiac death. But I have to correct you here, Tina. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the, ideal, the ideal study that you mentioned before actually did not um, preserved any, uh, did not show any differences between early starts and uh, late starts in the frequency of these complications. Yes, it is true. However, it is extremely important to be aware of those complications and to think it is really worth the risk of um, when, because there are some complications and if we start earlier, we have the opportunity to delay with the uh, start of these complications. 
And another thing, another thing I find extremely important is the quality of life. Unfortunately, the, unfortunately, there are studies revealing that quality of life of the patients that are faced with dialysis uh, tend, to del, uh, tend to fall within time on dialysis. Those patients have, uh, have higher prevalence of sleep, uh, sleep disorders, especially sleep apnea. They have sexual dysfunction. Women have problems getting pregnant. Uh, those patients suffer from muscular and bone pain, which are consequences of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, there is a higher rate of anxiety and depression. And what, it is extremely important to know that depression doubles the likelihood of sudden death. So the quality of those patients is extremely low. And another thing that is worth mentioning is that most of the patients who are faced to, to, to take the uh, hemodialysis must retire. And this is related with lower income, and this also affects their families. I completely agree with you, Tina, but actually we should not hesitate with dialysis in a patient with more comorbidities and other uh, cardiovascular diseases. Well, to continue with my contra uh, reasons, and even though the money shouldn't be a problem, I just want to give you an insight. Um, a one year of dialysis costs between 30 and 40,000 euros, and if we delay with dialysis, at the same time, we also, uh, we also decide that we, uh, there's also benefit, other beneficial reasons. We also save some money, and this is extremely important because as in any country, the money is always a problem. And my final statement is that even though there are nationally wide accepted guidelines supporting that dialysis should start in any case whenever there is estimated glomerular filtration rate below five, there hasn't been any study supporting this whatsoever. So, and on the other hand, there are many reports about patients who are completely without any symptoms, even though they have estimated glomerular filtration rate below five. So the question here is simple. Why treat somebody who doesn't have any symptoms? And as a future doctors, it is important to realize that we are treating the patients, not the laboratory results. Of course, but you have to be actually careful because there are some uh, absolute indications when to start dialysis, the early starts. For example, like uremic pericarditis, coagulopathy, gastroenteropathy with nausea, uh, encephalopathy with increasing confusion, volume overload, resistant hyperkalemia, unexplained weight loss, and hypertension that is unresponsive to dialytic therapy. Diuretic therapy. Yes, uh, absolute indications are, of course, uh, reasons that cannot be uh, avoided. So, in this short amount of time, we hope we manage to highlight the main problems regarding um, initiation of dialysis, and here are some of the most important conclusions. So, in recent years, new and better designed studies showed better survival and functional status and higher quality of life with late starts. Estimated glomerular filtration rate may not be the right tool to determine it when to start the dialysis. So in the future, we need new methods. And starting dialysis early, just on an estimated of renal function, does not necessarily ensure benefit. Many patients are asymptomatic, even with estimated glomerular filtration below five, but there are certain situations when early start is necessary and life-saving procedure. Uh, and in the international equal study intends to address this issue. It's actually, a plot was started in um, January 2012, but they haven't uh, established uh, results yet. So we want to conclude our um, team with a quote from a, special, uh, from a most famous doctor, Martin H. Fisher. Diagnosis is not the end, but the beginning of practice. Thank you, Alesha and Tina, for this very thorough debate. Uh, and now I would like to pass the microphone to the professor, if he has any comments. Okay, thank you very much. Really, I must congratulate you. You did a terrific job. This is a very difficult task even for serious nephrologists, not the students. And uh, when uh, they approached me, I 
uh, help them with the literature, then I left them alone. And when they <laughs> met the second time, and when they prepared the, uh, the uh, draft of the, the, uh, their lecture, I was surprised and astonished because <laughs> they picked up the main problems and what you saw today is, was really a remarkable job. So you, you can't see this also in the main nephrology congresses. Uh, and uh, what they picked up is really today's reality. So if you, you understood well, today current practice is that we should wait until very late or the uh, symptoms appear. So we shouldn't rely on the number. Our young doctors uh, still rely on the numbers. So if the EGF uh, approach to 10, they will start dialysis without any doubt. Me, as a very experienced doctor, I wait. I have patients, now I have a patient uh, which she has, she's a, a woman of more than 60 years old, she has EGFR of three meals per, per minute for two years. She had IV fustula, she is now visiting my outpatient clinic every second, every two weeks. But she's okay. She, she has normal blood pressure. She has a creatinine around 900. Uh, Ura 30. She has normal, uh, she has no anemia because she is taking uh, erythropoietin. Uh, she, she has no acetosis, no problems, no signs of uremia. And why? to put her on dialysis. And uh, she's okay. I said, uh, can we wait for two weeks more? She said, of course. So I, when we are, she is visiting me every two weeks. And I have many patients. And uh, in remarks of the uh, recommendations of uh, Canadian society, uh, there is a remark of those patients with uh, EGFR less than five, what to do with them if they are asymptomatic. If to put them on dialysis, we don't know. This is a practice of, uh, uh, this is a decision of the doctors alone. So you have to watch them carefully, uh, very, very, uh, uh, very carefully, and um, every week, maybe every second week. And uh, this is uh, the current practice of, uh, many centers today. And, um, but there are also very important uh, problems, as they said also. How to measure EGFR? Today we, have, we don't have uh, reliable methods. Uh, how to measure residual renal function and so on. I hope that in the next future we will get answers because a lot of uh, work is going on today and maybe in the next couple of years we will get uh, new results. So now the uh, questions from the floor. Please. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, primarily hemodialysis, but actually both, as usually it continues after you cannot do per peritoneal dialysis anymore. So uh, from your experience, f since it seems that complications will necessarily develop after some time, how long, uh, what is the longest time you've had patients on dialysis um, and that they were okay? No, not stopping because of uh, transplantation, but... Um, so for how long they can live? Yeah, on the, just so on dialysis. The longest, the, uh, the, long, the, the oldest patients now is 40 years old. So they can live very long, but uh, as you know, the, the, uh, exp uh, the uh, survival time on dialysis is not like uh, the healthy people. So the, expect the life expectancy is much, much shorter than in healthy people. So in the elderly is even less than the patients, uh, with, is the patients with cancer. So uh, with the pa uh, when you are 
uh, starting uh, dialysis treatment, your life expectancy is short, of course. But you can live very long if you, uh, if you follow, uh, follow some uh, recommendations and if you, you are not, uh, 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 you have no other comorbidities like uh, serious heart disease if you are not diabetic and so on. But you can live quite long. But uh, if you start, uh, for example, at 20 years old, you will not be 70 years old, for sure. I even if you are be transplanted. Any more questions from the audience? No? Okay, then I would like to uh, thank the professor for his remarks and to my colleagues again. And this concludes session five of our Congress. Thank you. So, so we'll have a 15 minute break and then we continue with the session five endocrinology.
for last. Uh, and I am opening the session number five, endocrinology. First debate is calcium supplements for patients with osteoporosis are harmful and should not be used. Uh, I would like to invite the speakers. On the pro side, we have Nija Zhorz, Medical Faculty, University of Ljubljana. On the contra side, we have Simon Rekanovic, Medical Faculty, University of Ljubljana. Mentor is Associate Professor Tomasz Kocjan. Hello. So, as said, yes, we are Nira and Hello. Simon. Uh, so, first, for the basics, let us just look first at the bone mass. So, bone mass with age decreases. And it is so that in women, it decreases more than in men. One important thing is that to notice in the graph, marked with number two, is that at the age of menopause in women, it drops drastically. Both men and the woman with age, marked with number three, in later life, bone mass decreases at a certain, to a certain point, we can call it the critical point, when, let's simplify that, it enters a point that is a fracture zone. Uh, osteoporosis is clinically silent at first, but uh, as bone mass reduces, um, the bone becomes fragile and osteoporotic fractures start to occur. Uh, the most common sites for fractures are wrist, uh, humerus, vertebra and hip. Uh, and by the age of 50, every second woman and every fifth man suffers from an osteoporotic fracture. Uh, this is a table uh, showing burden of disability caused by osteoporosis uh, comparing to burden of disability caused by different types of cancer. And we can see how uh, disabling osteoporosis is. Uh, this is partly due to uh, um, early mortality oh, sorry, uh, and the high prevalence of the disease. So to understand the importance in calcium, which is in the title, we have to understand the actual composition of bone. And calcium represents 39% of all the bones. And why is that also important is because calcium is in bones, 99% of all calcium in the body. That is approximately one kilogram of calcium. And calcium is also the mineral that is the most represented in the body. So when they saw this, when they figured that out, they thought, how can we treat people with osteoporosis, which have decreased bone mass? Well, actually, you can supplement calcium, right? And so calcium is a standard strategy, usually combined with vitamin D. So what are the calcium supplements used? Those are calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. Uh, what's the difference between them is the elemental calcium content they possess. In the calcium carbonate, that is, for example, 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate gives us 400 milligrams of actual calcium. So that means that it has a 40% elemental calcium content. And another comment to know is that calcium carbonate should be taken with meals since acidity improves the actual absorption. Well, that does not imply for calcium citrate. Uh, but how effective are calcium supplements in treating osteoporosis? Uh, uh, all anti-osteoporotic agents, uh, their uh, effectiveness is measured in uh, their ability to prevent fractures. And uh, this is a meta-analysis of uh, several randomized controlled trials. Um, the participants have been divided uh, according to their residential status. Some of them uh, lived in the community, were active uh, adults, and some were institutionalized. And uh, this uh, meta-analysis uh, showed that uh, calcium is slightly effective in institutionalized people, but uh, ineffective in community living active individuals. Uh, so, every medicine has its side effects, and uh, calcium, calcium is no exception. Uh, it causes gastrointestinal symptoms, and it also elevates risk for developing nephroleutiasis for about 17%. Uh, 
lately, uh, questions have been raised about uh, the safety of calcium supplements and uh, their effect on car cardiovascular system. So we finally come to the fun part. And how actually this um, whole farce uh, about the calcium began? Well, it was by publishing this article in 2002 by Reed. They, in a small study, they tried to prove that calcium supplements might be beneficial. And they did that by comparing two groups, one on calcium supplements and one placebo group. And after two, six, and 12 months, so one after a year, they proved that there was a significant difference in increase in HDL cholesterol. So that was beneficial, right? Yeah, although this study was a really small one, it only had about 200 participants. So I'll show you another study. Uh, this one was made by Boland. Uh, this is a study uh, where uh, they divided the participants into two groups. One of them received calcium treatment and the other one placebo. Uh, and they studied the risk uh, for developing myocardial infarction. And as we see at the beginning of the study, for the first uh, 30 months, um, the risk was approximately the same for both groups. But after 30 months, uh, the risk for developing myocardial infarction increased in the group treated with calcium. And the proposed mechanism to explain this would be that uh, for the first 30 months, this was an initial uh, latent phase uh, in which vascular damage occurred, which later um, resulted in myocardial infarction. So, uh, could it be possible that calcium supplements, believed to be beneficial, believed to be harmless, could they actually be killing us? Uh, Boland and his colleagues, of course, uh, published two other uh, meta-analyses that um, showed the same as the first one, that calcium supplements do in fact increase the risk of uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, so this is um, a graph showing exactly this. These are um, the trials and uh, we see that um, uh, groups treated with calcium developed a higher, in, uh, a higher incidence of myocardial infarction. Uh, how could this be? What could be the mechanism behind it? Um, it is believed that calcium supplements um, cause an acute rise in uh, levels of calcium in the, ser the serum. So, um, and this is believed to cause uh, calcification of vessels. Uh, it is believed to accelerate atherosclerosis, uh, to uh, destabilize plaques, atherosclerotical plaques, and it is also believed to cause arrhythmias, uh, alter coagulation, and cause arterial stiffness. As I've already mentioned, this is only believed to be the uh, consequence of bolus doses of calcium. So uh, dietary, doses of, do, uh, dietary calcium is uh, be not believed to have this, ef this effect. This seems legit, so what, how now to say that calcium is good if so much contra-arguments are here or pro for the statement? Well, actually, I had a thought and about thinking how, 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 and then I thought of a, of a pig. Well, actually, a, a cute, cuddly, small swine. But how could that help me? Well, not me, but the actual scientist who came up with this idea had a good idea, and his first idea was that all this meta-analysis that Nija already said uh, were, well, kind of, you know, that cherry-picking and that on. With meta-analysis, you can, you can choose the data you want. You don't necessarily need the proper data, so you can adjust them to your liking. And therefore, Philips and colleagues designed a clinic of, pardon, a laboratory swine study and that's uh, how they did it. Well, they used a calcium carbonate and high dietary calcium, and they proved that the swine developed no cardiovascular events or any increased risk over the whole laboratory experiment. That was a controlled environment and no risk happened. So this raises doubt about calcium supplementation increasing any risk or whatsoever. Um, well, Simon, um yeah, I agree that 
meta-analysis might not be the best tool, but still, uh, I showed you graphs, I showed you studies, and all you showed me was a pig. Well, it was a nice pig. <laughs> okay, so I'll do it like Neja did, and go on with the proper studies. So first, Lewis and colleagues, a well-renounced um, scientist, did a study. Uh, participating 1,500 elderly women, recruited in 98, devised into placebo and calcium group. What they did, sorry, what they did is they came up with this table, which is frightening even for me, so I'll make it simple, like that. What they did, this study was well designed, so both groups were quite equal in the risk factors they possess for cardiovascular events like smoking, blood pressure, etc. We won't go on for all of them. But what is important, so no group had an increase in risk already from the beginning of the study. And what they showed was actually very on my side. So after the end of the study, um, the analysis showed that there is no risk, no increased risk for cardiovascular events or risk for cardiovascular diseases. And even more, of that, that was shocking. They proved there, there might be an evidence that calcium could decrease the risk for cardiovascular diseases. Now, if that isn't a good answer, I don't know. And even more, the United States, Prentice, did a study called a Women's Health Initiative, which included approximately 40,000 women, plus minus one, um, which concluded that hip fractures decreased using calcium, not um, significantly, though. Uh, but what is important, no increase in cardiovascular events, heart disease, and myocardial infarctation. That is important, and that is some good data. I can tell you that. If you can't believe that, then I can say, well, like said the Rolling Stones, you can get no satisfaction. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'll show you another study. Uh, this is a study uh, that shows that um, the risk uh, of developing a cardiovascular event is uh, proportional to the severity of osteoporosis. As we see on the left side, uh, women with lower uh, bone, min uh, bone mineral density have a higher uh, um, have a higher uh, incidence of myocardial infarction comparing to women with higher mineral bone density. Uh, on the right side, uh, we see that osteoporotic women with, who have already suffered from a vertebral fracture also have a higher um, risk for developing cardiovascular event than women who have never had a, a vertebral fracture. Um, for, uh, the risk is three times higher. So, could this mean that osteoporosis uh, by itself increases risk for cardiovascular events? Uh, this is another study uh, in which they measured uh, bone mineral density and uh, calcium in coronary arteries and, and in abdominal aorta. That is an index for uh, measurement of atherosclerosis and bone mineral density, an index for measuring the severity of osteoporosis. And what they've discovered is that uh, with uh, decreasing bone mineral density, uh, this calcium score in vessels increases. So they thought that maybe these two processes, atherosclerosis and osteoporosis, could be linked. Because we know that osteoporosis is, um, is dependent on uh, bone remodeling. And what they found out was that the, both processes, bone remodeling and uh, atherosclerosis, uh, um, take place in an enclosed cavity. They both start to become clinically evident somewhere around the sixth decade. They both progress with years, with aging. So they thought that these two processes might be linked. But what could link them? With aging, uh, oxidative stress and inflammation increases. So these are the potential candidates. Besides all this intellectual fighting, which of course is fun and interesting, 
we want to give you some information to take home and that is actually important. And first of all is what the actual calcium, recommended calcium intake is. We have some risk groups we look at more closely. They are marked with red square, quite obvious. And those are males and females above 50 years. The recommended dose of calcium, uh, I'm sorry, the recommended dietary intake is from 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. But what is more important in this slide is in the lower right corner, the webpage, Institute of Medicine. Because what? A medical student or a medical doctor can never know enough. So you have to know where to look. And Institute of Medicine is a good webpage to know where to look for calcium and calcium intake and recommendation and so on. But for another more practical um, example is a simple calculation of dietary calcium intake per day. So if we go through it, just you can calculate for yourself for today. First, multiply each deciliter of milk or yogurt by 120, then weight of cheese in decagrams with 100. That makes a lot if you ate like half a kilo of cheese. And other foods give us 250 milligrams for women and 350 milligrams for men. So add all together and you get an approximation of elemental dietary calcium intake for that day. So once again, to summarize, women above 50 and men above 70 should have a daily intake for about 200, well, uh, sorry, 1,200 milligrams of calcium and above that, approximately 1,000 milligrams. And one important thing is that most of calcium comes from milk and milk products. That is the important thing to take home. So now for the conclusions. No definite conclusions can be drawn, sorry. Um, so this epic battle of the best will continue until further independent confirmation comes and shows us this in-depth look in what actually goes on with this calcium. Uh, because the key point in understanding and the preceding investigation and understanding of the whole calcium debate will be the explanation because current explanation is not entirely plausible. Uh, well, sorry, haven't finished yet. Uh, yeah, so we finally agree uh, on something. Uh, just another practical advice. What a clinician should do is uh, that he or she should promote uh, their patients, their friends, their family, uh, to try and get enough, uh, uh, as much calcium as they can from their diet and not from the supplements. And one other thing uh, connected with this one is that they should reserve supplements for those who are unwilling, unable to uh, achieve the dietary, uh, the recommended dietary intake just with dietary calcium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you bo both for a lovely and interesting debate. Now I would like to um, invite Associate Professor Tomasz Kosian to join me for discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, so what should I do actually? <laughs> uh, probably congratulate both. It was excellent, it was, uh, at least for me, it was very interesting. And I sincerely hope there are some interesting questions. What's your intake of calcium? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a question. Okay. Are there many cases of hypercalcemia because of calcium supplements? Because you know that someone take it like candies, like you know, oh calcium. Yeah. <laughs> if if the metabolism of calcium is normal, you know, then calcium supplements are not able to increase calcium above the upper limit of normal. So this is usually not the case to increase serum calcium. The problem with calcium supplements is that these uh, calcium supplements probably 
cause a slight increase of calcium in the reference range, you know, so this is actually supposed to be a problem, that this slight increase of calcium, uh, which doesn't happen with uh, dietary calcium, uh, actually causes uh, the progression of atherosclerosis. This is the theory of this, for instance, of Neja. <laughs> so, the main point is that we should promote dietary calcium and reserve supplementary calcium, calcium supplements only for those who are not able or unwilling to, to take uh, to, to, to actually to, uh, to, to eat enough dietary calcium. This is the, the, the main message of, of, our, of our talk. I have a question. Yes? Uh, are cal calcium supplements often prescribed in Slovenia? Your personal view? Yes. Um, everywhere, after all these studies, actually the prescribing and also the, the sales of calcium supplements declined, actually. In the U.S., uh, you, probably, uh, you, you should probably say some data on this, uh, how big is this market actually? You know, this is a huge market, so Simon, you can provide some numbers, please. Uh, well, I can actually say that uh, the actual percentage of the usage of calcium supplements is not the prescribed one, but the sole one, that in the United States, men and women, up to 70% of actual population took calcium supplements and about 40% took them regularly on a daily basis. So this huge market actually declined. By this data, per year, about approximately 5% decline has been noticed, and the same, or probably even more, is the case in Slovenia. Because in Slovenia, you know, we are very disciplined and we everything take very serious, so probably our market for calcium declined even further. Uh, just to know, there is only one uh, preparation of calcium, it is calcium carbonate, which is available on prescription. Everything else is uh, over the counter, it should be paid. So, but definitely the prescribing of calcium went down considerably, I think. Yeah. Uh, hi. Does the higher intake of calcium lead to higher incidence of calcium oxalate kidney stones or is it more oxalate dependent? This is also debatable. You saw the data that uh, with calcium supplement, supplements the increase in kidney stones is around 17%. So this is uh, actually the conclusion of this WHI study, Women's Health Initiative, which is actually the hugest study which also directs all this data in this meta-analysis. Meta um, there are different theories. Some even claim that actually calcium supplements decrease the incidence of kidney stones because they act as binders for ox oxalate, you know, so <laughs> this is also debatable. Uh, we don't know, but probably there is slight increase for kidney stones with calcium supplements. There is, but if, not, not a huge one. If I may say, uh, the pig didn't get the stones. <laughs> Just to add to this, um, we actually never prescribe calcium supplements to a person who has kidney stones. So this is contraindicated. We recommend only dietary calcium and we usually recommend these persons to take magnesium because magnesium, you know, it's also beneficial for bones and it also decreases the crystallization of uh, calcium oxalate crystals in urine. So we have double benefit with magnesium. I have one question about vitamin D3. Uh, I read a few uh, some time ago uh, an article that claims that even people from Australia are not able to produce enough uh, vitamin D3 in the skin. Uh, so people from countries like Poland are definitely not able to. <laughs> so what about the um, supplementation of vitamin D3, uh, even if we keep in mind that it has uh, properties uh, protective, for example, from uh, cancers? So could you comment? Of course. Thank you for this question. This is, of course, topic for next year <laughs> Journal Club Congress, because this is a huge, you know, huge thing. Uh, it is hard to, to, to realize that calcium and especially vitamin D get so much, you know, attention these days. 
So what, what is actually the, the thing with vitamin D3? This is also a big debate, you know, because these reference ranges, as you mentioned, that actually nobody is able to have normal vitamin D3. So I can ask you, what is then normal if nobody is normal, you know? So you, you never know what is actually normal. There is also a big debate. We have some, you know, some followers of vitamin D3, which uh, d these followers, they actually believe that vitamin D3 is a so-called panacea. You know what is panacea? Panacea is drug for everything. So this is, of course, not existent, you know. So there is a huge amount of data on vitamin D3 and on vitamin D3 supplementation, but for the time being, for now, you know, we don't have RCT data who, uh, we, which actually prove that vitamin D3 is beneficial for, for instance, for cancer, for uh, diabetes, for cardiovascular disease. We don't have such data. We have some data that vitamin D3 is beneficial for elderly people who have problems with skeleton, with muscles. We have definite proof that vitamin D3 is beneficial in such situations. But there are some very, very large ongoing studies on vitamin D3 versus placebo. 2,000 units of vitamin D3 versus placebo on, I don't know, 16,000 uh, participants. Uh, this, this study, this is called VITAL, this study will uh, actually end in 2016 and we will probably have this data on these heart endpoints, cardiovascular disease, diabetes and uh, cancer. No, no, you should go to play tennis, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay we'll have another question. Yeah. We have time for one. There is a battle. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask if there are any contraindications for calcium supplements. Yes, of course. Uh, as we mentioned before, nephrolithiasis or kidney stones is one of them. And of course, uh, all these problems with indig indigestion and constipation, uh, everything will, will get much worse, you know, with calcium supplements. And we don't insist if, if patients have problems like this, okay? And of course, all these states with, I don't know, for instance, primary hyperparathyroidism, of course, all these uh, conditions with deranged calcium metabolism are, of course, not... Uh, these patients are not candidates for, for calcium supplements, sarcoidosis and all these the reasons for hypercalcemia. Okay. So, of course, so probably also chronic kidney patients wouldn't be recommended to take calcium supplements. Chronic kidney patients? Yes. Okay, this is another very good point, you know, because you know that chronic kidney patients actually take uh, calcium phosphate binders. And there is also for nasia site, there are some studies that these calcium phosphate binders actually increase cardiovascular risk. So this is probably pro. So we have some data that probably you should prefer in these patients who already have, you know, very high cardiovascular risk, you should prefer some other types of phosphate binders, non-calcium, okay? So thank you very much for your questions and thank you very much again, once again, for the invitation. Uh, so thank you again for the debate and the discussion. We shall proceed with pancreas transplantation is the best way of treating diabetes mellitus type 1. On the pro side, we have Tina Kurent, Medical Faculty, University of Ljubljana. On the contra side, we have Slobodan Maricic, Medical Faculty, University of Novi Sad, Serbia. The mentor is Miha Petric. So let's start. Uh, is pancreas transplantation really the best way of treating diabetes mellitus type 1? Well, it can be for some patients, and it's the only treatment that actually cures the diabetes and enables a normal glycemic state. Yeah, okay, but it's really hard to find a transplant, and it's not that easy. Also, in the same way, uh, in the same time, pancreas transplantation is not life-preserving transplantation as some other transplantations are, most of them. 
Okay, but if we manage to find a donor, uh, we could avoid all the secondary complications or the ser serious se secondary complications of diabetes. Yeah, but what about the risk of immunosuppression? Well, since diabetic nephropathy can lead to kidney failure and these patients are candidates for kidney transplantation, they would need immunosuppressive treatment anyway. Uh, so for them, we wouldn't really put them under a higher risk. Okay, I would still say that uh, success rates are quite low for this type of transplantation. Okay, so let's start. Uh, diabetes is a metabolic disorder in which a patient has an abnormal level of blood glucose. Uh, we have two different reasons for that. In type 1 diabetes, the reason is lack of insulin due to immune uh, destruction of the gland, while in type 2, um, the main cause is peripheral insulin uh, resistance. Because we have these two different pathophysiological mechanisms, the treatment differs as well in both types. Um, we treat type 1 with uh, insulin, either with insulin injections, uh, in the case of uh, intensive treatment with insulin pump, and the newest treatment is with transplantation of pancreas. Um, diabetes type 2 is a slowly progressing disease, so we can also treat it gradually. We can start with diet and exercise, um, then continue with oral therapy, and in the end with insulin injections. Okay, what's uh, pancreas transplantation? Uh, pancreas transplantation is a final treatment, a final, mod final modality of treatment of uh, diabetes type 1 in some patients, especially with the ones that have already uh, their kidneys damaged, their kidney function damaged. So how did it start? Like in 1966, Kelly and Lilai did the first transplant. Since then, 27,000 trans pancreas transplants were done worldwide. Uh, well, in Slovenia, there were eight pancreas transplantations done since 2009 when they started. Uh, they were all simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplantations. Six of the grafts are still uh, functioning and uh, patients are insulin independent. Okay, we have some types of this transplantation. As I already said, simultaneous pancreas kidney transplantation is the one that we use uh, most and that it's shown to be the best, uh, the best type. Uh, in this type, we do uh, pancreas and kidney, uh, kidney transplantation the same operating procedure. There, uh, the short word is SPK for this one. We'll use it later on. PAK is a sequential pancreas after kidney transplantation where pancreas is transplanted a few months or years after kidney is transplanted into recipient. And some patients that have still their uh, kidneys functioning normally are uh, beneficial for pancreas transplantation alone. There are also different varieties how to do this transplantation. Exocrine function can be derived by enteric or bladder drainage. We show, uh, in this picture, we have uh, uh, shown enteric drainage, and this one is more physiological and shown to be a bit better. On the other side, we have bladder drainage that is better for taking biopsies in, in cases of uh, graft rejection. What about the exocrine function? It's derived by systemic or portal venous drainage, and also we can transplant the whole organ or just do a partial transplantation, which means that we'll transplant just body and tail, and that's a case where we're taking a part of pancreas from the live donor, usually a family, family member. So if we compare the newest treatment with the older one, uh, transplantation is the only treatment that cures diabetes and enables a prolonged normal glycemic state. Uh, the main goal of treating diabetic patients is normalizing their glycemic level. Um, as we can see on this slide, um, the, if we compare patients treated with intensive um, uh, treatment, which is insulin pump, they have a 2% lower uh, glycolyzed hemoglobin than the one treated just with insulin injections. However, in pancreas transplantation, it's even more effective and maintains glycolyzed hemoglobin in normal level under 6%. Um, with the older treatment with insulin, we should also take into account the risk of hypoglycemia and hypoglycemic coma. Okay, we have some contraindications or say limitations by the recipient and donor both. 
what kind of recipient is not good for this, uh, this, uh, this transplantation? Patients that have malignant infections are generally, uh, are, are generally contraindicated for this operation. Psychosocial issues should be taken in account. For example, patients who are drug users or alcohol uh, or abuse alcohol wouldn't be good for this. Cardiovascular limitations, I would say they are uh, the most important ones because we already know that diabetes in these final stages where we are, where we are, when we are doing transplantation already made some serious damage on, on the cardiovascular system. So this one, I would say, is the most important one. And obesity is shown to be a risk factor. What are the limitations by the donor? We'll say that graft utilization varies from zero to more than 70% in some different regions due to strict policies when and when we can't use uh, pancreas from a donor. Uh, we already mentioned social factors, malignancy, infectious diseases that are the same for recipient. Age could be a contraindication if we have a young patient, for example, then we have a small, uh, small organ. If you have old patients already, some damage on the pancreas could be done and like pancreas couldn't be good. Cause of that, the best patients are the ones that uh, died by uh, cerebral trauma and the young patients also. Pancreatic edema uh, due to uh, excessive resuscitation, fatty degeneration due to obesity are also contraindications. Called ischemia time will show on this graph that it, uh, that's, uh, leak rate increases at the, as the preservation time in hours increases. So we'll see here that if we keep the organ up to 23 to 30, uh, 25 to 30 hours, this leak rate goes up to 70 percent. Um, so it's very well known that high blood glucose uh, causes some damage to organs and tissues. So if we start with kidney, um, Diabetic nephropathy can lead to kidney failure. Uh, two of the major early lesions uh, with diabetic patients are thickening of glomerular basement membrane and mesangial expansion. Uh, a study over 10 years showed that, um, that uh, basement membrane thinned and mesangial volume decreased, as we can see on these two slides. But here the membrane and the volume of mesangial fraction. Um, so we can conclude that uh, when pancreas graft induces normal glycemic state, the renal lesions are not just preventable, but also reversible. Yeah, but what about immunosuppressive drugs that can cause like serious damage to organs, can be nephrotoxic, what about them? So we should take this account also, not just the positive sides on, uh, on the renal activity. That's true. So can we continue uh, for, um, to the diabetic retinopathy that is one of the main reasons for uh, blindness in developed countries? Studies showed some uh, decrease in macular edema, while on the other side, um, they didn't show much effect of normal glycemic state on pro proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And beside that, we already have a very sufficient, uh, effective treatment for this with uh, laser photocoagulation. Yeah, but corticosteroids also used as immunosuppressives can cause a cataract formation and also increase the risk of ocular infections, so this should be taken into account. Yeah, and because of all these, uh, ophthalmologists, ophthalmologists concluded that retinopathy shouldn't be a big factor when deciding for uh, transplantation as a treatment. Um, diabetes and high uh, blood glucose causes quite some damage to cardiovascular system as well. If we concentrate on atherosclerotic and diastolic function, uh, studies showed some improvement. Um, but if we concentrate on hypertension, studies suggested that it has a significant impact on hypertension. First graph is showing us um, the percentage of normotensive patient before transplantation was done and afterwards in uh, the black um, column compared with the white one, which are uh, patients that only had their kidney transplanted. So we can see the difference. And the other one is showing us the number of antihypertensive medications needed per, per, per person before transplantation and afterwards. Uh, again, the control group was the patients that only had their kidney transplanted. Um, for the end, let's talk about the damage diabetes does to the nerves. Um, 
a 10 years follow-up study clearly demonstrated that peripheral nerve function improved in patients after achieving normal glycemic state after successful pancreas transplantation. On this slide, uh, the gray area is, are the transplanted patients compared to the control group. Uh, the positive side shows us how much the nerve function improved and the negative how much it has worsened over the years. Uh, we can compare uh, motoric and sensory conduction through the nerve. And the last one is showing us um, difference in cardiovascular autonomic um, test. So the other autonomic uh, nerve that gets affected by diabetes is vagal nerve that causes gastro gastroparesis in um, diabetic patients. It's like they have it up to 60%. Um, the slow, uh, it slowers the emptying of um, stomach, which uh, enables um, metabolic control. Like it's harder to achieve afterwards. Um, but all these uh, significantly improved after normal glycemic state was um, achieved. Graft failure rate in pancreas transplantation goes up to 7%, which is quite high compared, for example, with kidney transplantation, where, where it's just 2.5%. Well, but this rate is not even that high if we compare it to liver transplantations, where um, the graft failure is 10 to up to 15%. And as you already said, it's not a life-preserving operation. So when the graft fails, it's still um, the it's not that life-threatening the situation. We do the pancreatomy and we put the patient back on insulin treatment. Yeah, also we here we showed that in the years from 90s until 2010, uh, risk for graft failure went down in one, three, and five, five and 10 years follow-up. So we see that it declines in all of them. Also, uh, post uh, uh, complications, post transplant complications are mostly metabolic. Uh, one of them is persistent hyperglycemia. In these cases, uh, we have either a graft rejection or it is due to late graft activation. Also, some immunosuppressives as calcineurin inhibitors and uh, glucocorticoids can cause hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia is other state on the other side, and it's usually caused by uh, systemic vein drainage as one of the modalities how we do the transportation. In this case, we don't have that normal physiological uh, way where the insulin goes through liver and it's absorbed, but it goes directly to the bloodstream, causes hyperinsulinemia, and due to that, hypoglycemia. Uh, graft thrombosis is number one cause uh, of, uh, of complications and of uh, graft failure. Incidence is from 5 to 11.6%, depending from the technique. For SPK, as we said, simultaneous pancreas kidney transportation, it is 5%. It's the lowest one. That's one of the reasons why this one is preferred. Uh, it's irreversible, and it leads to graft loss. In these cases, we need to, de uh, need to do graft pancreatectomy as soon as possible to avoid the risk of uh, pancreatitis, pancreatic necrosis, sepsis on one side, and on the other side, deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Other complications are intra-abdominal infections that have incidence of 15% and graft loss rate of 0.6 to 2%. 30% uh, of them are due to leaks. And these leaks is shown to, uh, that we have less leaks in enteric drain than in bladder drain graft. Graft loss from leaks is less than 1%. Pancreatitis is mentioned here as a risk factor for these other complications more than it is a risk factor on his own to cause a graft failure. If we compare annual mortality rate, we can see that it is two to up to four times lower in patients um, after simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplantation compared with the ones that only had their kidney transplanted. On the other hand, surviving rate over 10 years doesn't show much difference between the same two groups, but we should take into account the benefit SPK patients have from working pancreas. Um, patients treated with dialysis have a low surviving rate of 46%. Uh, graft rejection is systemic recognition by the host immune system of antigenic differences between host and graft. It goes through five stages in which these first five are irreversible by immunosuppressors while 
the last one, graft destruction is irreversible and we do the graft microtectomy in these cases. Risk factors to, for this to occur are poor HLA matching, cytomegaloviral infection, recipient age less than 45 years because they have better immunity. Uh, systemic vein drainage showed to have three times more uh, risk of rejection to happen. Also, pre patients are in risk. And enteric drainage and pancreas retransplant showed to be risk factors just for PTA and PAK, which is pancreas transplantation alone and pancreas after kidney transplantation. We show here the incidence of the first rejection episode in the patient. So we'll see that after 12 uh, months or one year, like for PTA patients, uh, incidence of the first rejection episode is 25%, is uh, 22%, sorry. Here, 70% and 15% for, uh, is incident for SPK patients, which showed to be the best ones. Also, uh, this is a graft rejection loss rates from irreversible rejection, and for PTA and PK patients, they showed to be really high compared with all the other transplantations. And the pancreas, pancreas graft loss rates for SPK patients is almost the same as kidney graft loss for the patients that only have their kidney transplanted. So that's a ben benefit. Um, patient after successful pancreas transplantation said that they are much more satisfied with their life and health. They have higher levels of energy and vitality and they're feeling more in control and independent as before. Immunosuppressive therapy can cause infections that we already know. Bacterial infections that are mostly caused by it are intra-abdominal pneumonia, urinary infections, and bacteremic episodes. Some of them with a great inc a greater incidence, some of them with a great mortality rate and less incidence. Bacterial infections that we need to mention are acetylmegaloviral infection and epstein -Bi viral uh, virus infections that are uh, the ones that are, uh, that are uh, the most. Frequent, we have also fungal infections, candida albicans infection, of course, the most uh, frequent one. And when we speak about parasites, there are uh, toxoplasma gondii that can cause uh, the brain abscess in these cases, and pneumocystis carini that can cause pneumonia. Also, uh, it's estimated by some studies that 50% of all malignancies in transplanted patients are related to immunosuppressed state. Most of these malignancies are PTLD, which means post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Other ones that happen uh, the most are skin cancers, especially squamous cell carcinoma. Other ones are pretty much rare. Also side effects that we already mentioned about immunosuppressive therapy are nephrotoxicity and cataract formation, also hyperglycemia. Additional ones are poor wound healing by serolimus or ga and gastrointestinal toxicity by mycophenolate mufetil. So for the end, let's talk about the money. Um, one of the studies comparing expected cost per quality adjusted year concluded um, that simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplantation would be the most cost effective one. Yeah, but still a price of 125,000 in the first year and 7,000 each year is still a big amount of money to be paid for this kind of treatment. So if we conclude the main, main things we said today, um, transplantation of pancreas is the only treatment that can cure diabetes, enables prolonged normal glycemia, which can help us to avoid all the serious secondary complications of diabetes and even reverse some of already existing ones. The only thing missing are the guidelines that would suggest or help us uh, choose the right patients that would benefit the most from this transplantation. On the other side, as we already mentioned, it's not life preserving unless the most other transplantations and we should consider either to put our patients on the risk of immunosuppressive treatment and, operational, and operation or not. Also, if this becomes a standard procedure, it will be really hard to find all this donor tissue, and success rates should be, uh, should be quite higher with, uh, with the normal costs, like achievable costs. So, thank you. Thank you both for uh, a lovely
lovely and interesting debate. So I see that your mentor is already coming for a discussion. Would you elaborate? And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate both presenters. They are both, in a way, right and wrong, as usual in medicine, because the group uh, of people with diabetes type 1 and kidney failure is very heterogeneous. So what is right for one patient is not okay for ne uh, the other patients. So uh, we try to find the ideal patient and then try to find almost perfect pancreatic graft, which is very hard. And as they both said, the pancreas transplantation, as kidney transplantation is not uh, life uh, preserving transplantation, it's life uh, quality improving transplantation. So in liver, the patient will die if he uh, will not receive organ. So there is, how should I say, allowed to transplant, transplant even a marginal quality liver because in other way, he will die. But in pancreas, the patient can live on insulin or uh, diet. So we must pick up the right pancreas for right patient. If the operation is not successful, we have a lot of problems with patient and family and, you know. So if anyone have any question, please, but do have in mind that I'm a surgeon. I do not know anything about internal medicine, <laughs> molecular biology, or... Um, I have three questions, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, since they haven't mentioned this, I guess it doesn't happen, but I'll be stupid and ask it anyway. Um, since diabetes one is autoimmune, um, I mean, how come um, nobody talks about islet cell antibodies in the transplanted liver? I know it's not the same, it's different, but it's similar. In, so do you ever have a case of autoimmune antibodies attacking it? Uh, then another question is, what is the longest liver, uh, pancreas transplant you, that has lasted, the longest it has ever lasted? And um, if the reason that the antibodies autoimmune antibodies uh, don't appear is the uh, immunosuppression after the transplantation. How come diabetes type 1 can't be treated by some sort of immunosuppressive treatment? Uh, so the <laughs> for the first question, uh, the patients who are receiving pancreas are treated with uh, very strong immunosuppression drugs. Because of that, they are usually combined with kidneys. They are uh, they are not receiving one drug, uh, but the drugs are two or three because of the side effects are lower uh, if you combine different types of immunosuppression. So uh, autoimmune pancreatitis, or, uh, which is probably cause of uh, non-functioning pancreas and development of diabetes type 1, is probably suppressed, or it can be also the cause of pancreatitis in graft. So they are uh, treated with uh, very strong immunosuppression, and this is one side effect of this operation. So, and the other question, how long does it take to transplant pancreas? No. No, I mean, uh, what is the longest transplant you, the longest the transplant has lasted? Uh huh. Uh, you must realize that the first is uh, graft retrieval. So the team go, goes to hospital where is Dane bread donor. Because in Slovenia, we just took organs from uh, donors who are dead, dead, that have confirmed brain death. We do not take uh, don uh, organs from cardiac uh, arrest donors. So this usually takes about four hours to retrieve all the organs. Then we go back to university medical center. We prepare organs. This is about one hour and a half. And then transplantation is around three hours because uh, 
the only thing that is problematic is like they say where to put uh, enteric exocrine anastomosis on blader or on the small bowel and how to connect vessels, portal or system, systemic drainage. And the last question was... I'm sorry, what I actually meant is, <laughs> what is the longest a patient has lived with a ah, transplanted uh, pancreas, how long it has lasted inside the patient? 10 years survival is around 67%. Mm -hmm. So how long is the older, oldest patient? I, well, I really the know. graft usually survives from 15 to 20, can survive 15 to 20 years, the transplanted pancreas, <laughs> that's what, yeah. Okay, and the last, uh, sorry, the last question was uh, whether uh, there have been any cases, probably have, of uh, diabetes 1 that has been tried to be treated by immunosuppressants. So uh, if somebody has siblings and they discover their diabetes really early, has, have they ever been treated by immunosuppressants? And does it work? So I, I cannot tell you that because, uh, as I told you, I'm a surgeon, <laughs> but I think uh, that... Uh, giving immunosuppression to or otherwise healthy person is, you know, I don't, I didn't, uh, I don't know if they are using, but I think not. Well, as far as I know, they started, they were thinking about it, but it's not cost effective yet to go through all the teenagers or young people and trying to find out if they have diabetes in the early stages. And once you find out when they have symptoms, it's already a bit too late and it's just very little of pancreas left that you would preserve with, uh, with immunosuppressive treatment. Thank you, <laughs> sorry. No okay. okay, I have a short question. Uh, I've heard talks about uh, employing uh, stem cell therapy to uh, transplant only the Langerhans uh, yeah, this uh, is I'm wondering if you know if there are any advances made in this area and when can we expect <laughs> a broader application? This is now in research. Uh, they uh, perform isolated transplantation. Uh, they say that around uh, every person has have around two million Langerhans isolate cells. So if you uh, you need only ten percent, but they. Uh, find out that they must transplant around 600 to 700 uh, cells uh, to a patient to, uh, to achieve uh, enough insulin to make patient euglycemic. This is probably because of the most of the cells are, the cells are injected in the portal vein and they are hoped to be trapped in the liver where they will be start functioning, but there is problem how to achieve that the cells are uh, accepted in the body, uh, the cell, how the cells are uh, trapped in the tissue. So it is, now it is uh, on researching, but the results are uh, interesting they are compared or they said it could be compared in the future with better uh, technique. The problem is for one transplantation of stem cells you need three to four pancreas normal but uh, as they to told the near perfect pancreas is hard to find. In the last six seven years the time with the retrieval team, we took six, seven pancreas and, I don't know, 50 livers. So it's hard to find the whole organ, but not three organs, four organs. So. And, and is there any experience all over the world with treatment, with transplant of pancreas, with another type of uh, diabetes, with also uh, autoimmune uh, component, uh, LADA, is there any option we've treated? Uh, so they, does somebody try it? There, uh, there are reports of transplanting pancreas to uh, patients with diabetes type 2, type two and uh, they were successful, but the indication are more strict than in type 1 because 
you know, in type 2 diabetes, there's insulin resistance. So the pancreas. Yeah, if I may add, they have, in USA, they have 2% of, 2% uh, of four pancreas transplantations were done on patients with diabetes type 2. Thank you. Maybe just a short question. Um, uh, are there any reports about the diabetes as a, as a side effect that develops because of the immunosuppression? Or is there a, a different immunosuppression that is used that doesn't lead to diabetes? Uh, but if you have functioning graft, then the rate of diabetes, uh, the chance of diabetes is small because we have, like Tina say, eight patients, two are, uh, were again operated and removed, and the six are now euglycemic, okay. despite that they are using very strong immunosuppression, and they, are, uh, they, are, they had simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplantation, and they are now without uh, insulin and without dialysis. So they are very, uh, they are happy with their life, because before they were three, four times dialysis and every day with injections. So. If the graft is functioning okay, then probably not. Probably the uh, glucose levels are normal. Okay. And maybe this is the first sign of pancreas uh, graft failure, if the glucose is not under control. And that there is one thing why is a kidney and simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplantation uh, better because they found out that if the pancreatic graft is failing, also the kidney graft is showing some signs of failure with elevated creatinine and ura. So. Thank you for the discussion and the debate. Now we will finish our um, debate Friday with the fun part. This is the lucky award student. And I would... I would kindly ask of, oh, don't leave yet, don't leave yet, close the door. <laughs> no. uh, I would kindly ask all the students who haven't voted yet to, for the best debater and to uh, give also the yellow pieces of paper in order to win Merck manual.
Okay, so I would need a volunteer. Okay, so coming up. Okay, so you should look away and... <laughs> okay, so pick one. Jalap uh, Asma. Halap Asma? Okay, Asma. Is Asma with us? Paris? Oh! <laughs> Okay, now we have the final mark to give of two marks, actually, yeah, for the best debate. And the best debate goes to Veronica Martin for the debate in HIV infected patients, early treatment is better than deferred treatment. Okay, so the first day is over. Um, see you tomorrow. We are starting at 9 o'clock with more interesting debates. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening. Thank you. For those of you who are going by bus tomorrow,